All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's city council meeting. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Rogers? Oh, Council Member Rogers will be absent today. Council Member McDonald? Here. Council Member Fleming? Here. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. And then I will also do the roll call for the planning commissioners. Commissioner Carter? Commissioner Cisco? Here. Commissioner Dugan? Commissioner Hol Holton? Commissioner Okrepke? Here. Vice Chair Peterson? Here. And Chair Weeks? Here. Okay, let me just circle back really quick. Commissioner Carter, have you joined us? Commissioner Holton, have you joined us? Commis Commissioner Duggan, have you joined us? Okay, let the record show that all council members are present and um, all commissioners, planning commissioners are present with the exception of Commissioner Carter, Commissioner Duggan, and Commissioner Holton. Great, thank you so much. Madam City Manager, if you wanna take it away with item 3.1. Thank you, Mayor. So good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Mayor Rogers and members of council. Item 3.1, Santa Rosa forward land use and cir circulation alternatives. I would like to introduce Amy Lau, our supervising planner who will lead the discussion. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Chair Weeks, the council and commission. We really appreciate being with you today. And so we're gonna be talking about our general plan update for Santa Rosa Forward. And um, so presenting with me today, uh, we also have Amy Nicholson, who's a senior planner on our advanced planning team, and then Beatrice Guerrero Amuna, who is our equity and public health planner. And then also on the call are our consultant team. So we have Andrea Howard and Charlie Knox from PlaceWorks. And then we also have Noe Neola and Dan Amston from MIG. So just wanted to note those few things. Um, so for today's presentation, we're gonna try to move pretty quickly, but we do want to first go over uh, what the general plan update is and give a review for our community members that are joining us for the first time today. And then also give you an overview of our alternatives, so our land use and circulation alternatives for you to consume those and be able to provide us some feedback on your thoughts. And then we are gonna tell you what we've heard from the community. We've been out for the last few months speaking with the community at a variety of different forums. So we wanna make sure to report out to you all what we've heard. And then we will close by um, getting as much input as possible from you all and those community members that are on the call today. Um, so with that, if you don't mind going to the next slide. So to start to give you a little bit of a preview of what we're talking about today and the general plan update, uh, but is the basically we're creating a blueprint for the city. We're updating our existing general plan in almost a wholesale way. So this is an opportunity to revisit, rethink how we've done things. How has the development gone over these past few years? Um, what has changed? It's obvious we've had a lot of significant things happen as far as the wildfires, um, pandemic, um, a lot of changes in our, our local landscape that need to be addressed. Next slide, please. So the general plan really touches all aspects of our community. A lot of people think of it as simply land use. So really looking at our built environment but the general plan actually touches a lot of the intangibles and how we create community, how we experience and um, how we connect with one another. So it really does provide a, a regional or, or broad scale of different issues and topics. Next slide, please. 
So we're just gonna go over a little bit of the schedule and where we've been. I think this is our third or fourth joint item before you, and we will have a few more. Um, but you may remember we kicked off our general plan update um, summer and fall of 2020 and started with creating that community involvement strategy and uh, creating our community advisory committee. And that really just set the landscape for how we wanted to engage the community. Of course, we fell into pandemic land and have not been able to do as much in person as we had hoped. Um, but these last few months have really been incredible to be able to meet with people one-on-one -on -one and to go to where people were meeting already. So then after that step, we really started working on the backbone of data that was gonna be used for the whole remainder of the project. So we are blessed to have great consultant team, great sub consultants who really took a deep dive on data. So all of these reports are available on our website and I'll, I'll go through that a little bit later, um, but we did have a full existing conditions analysis done. Um, so that was a major step in this process. And then we went and asked the community, what is the vision for Santa Rosa? What do people want to achieve? You're looking out to 2050. Um, what is our vision for how the community operates? What does land use look like, housing, transportation, all of those things. And so we arrived at a vision statement or a set of statements. And that's really gonna be our guiding principles as we move forward and start, start actually drafting the policy work itself. And then can you advance one more time, Dina? There should be a little pop up here. So now in this alternatives phase, we are looking at different land use and circulation alternatives. So Amy Nicholson will kind of walk through all of these um, with you, uh, but we did produce an alternatives workbook and we did do a full set of events um, that Beatrice is gonna walk through with you as well. And so today we want to be able to present all of that and to get your feedback. We are not gonna move forward to the preferred alternative and flesh that out until we hear from you because um, you are a key part of how this gets drafted. Um, we are doing our best to be uh, community driven, but um, we want you all to have a front seat and be able to provide input um, at all of these different steps in the process. I will also remind everyone that this update does include an update to our housing element. That is on a faster track and the housing element will actually be released in draft form for the public uh, next week is our goal. So that adoption process will be a very fast pace because we do have to submit that to the state for review um, before adopting. So um, that will be coming back uh, in, at meetings with both the Planning Commission, Housing Authority, and your council in next month in June. All right, let's move to the next slide, please. So as part of our general plan update, um, one more slide, sorry, Dina. We do have a couple different teams that are working behind the scenes. Um, not so much behind the scenes, but uh, our technical advisory committee are all, basically all of those departments that we work with internally here at the city. So they have been making sure that the data we're using is correct, uh, that our assumptions we're using is, are correct, and that their department is well represented as far as um, what's included in our analyses. And then um, our next few phases, we are gonna be expanding this team to include more of our other jurisdictions, resource agencies, uh, entities such as SMART or um, um, other, other entities that really need to have a seat at the table to be able to inform our general plan update. Next slide, please. And then as you're probably familiar, we do have a very robust community advisory committee. This is a set of 25 uh, individuals, um, some of which are appointed by the council, and they are really acting as our liaisons to the greater community. We, oh, our, our hope is that these folks um, will continue to stay involved and connect us with the community organizations that they're a part of and really allow us to get deeper into the community to give us uh, more engagement, feedback, um, and it's been a really um, wonderful process so far. And so we'll continue to work with this group and um, expand if necessary. Next slide, please. So as I noted, we do have a lot of reports on our website. 
So if you wanted to take a deep dive, this is exactly where you should go. It's srforward.com. <clears throat> so we do have that existing conditions report. We also have a briefing book, which is somewhat like an executive summary. So it gives a high level overview of some of the major findings of that larger report. And then on our website, you can also find our vision statement and then our alternatives workbook, which we will be presenting to you today. Next slide, please. So with that, I will pass it over to, to Amy to walk you through the alternatives workbook. And if I may make a quick announcement, um, today our host of the meeting is Sandy Bliss, not Dina Manis. So if you could um, direct your um, comments to advance your slides to Sandy, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, members of the council and Chair Weeks and members of the commission. As Amy mentioned, the general plan update process has included a number of milestone reports, and these help to serve as the foundation for the three land use and circulation alternatives or scenarios presented in the workbook. Um, as Amy mentioned, we've um, really been using our project website to push out information. So this workbook is available on that website. Uh, it's also included as a link to the staff report and we have it available also in hard copy and used it during our community workshops and pop-up events. Uh, each, of the, each of the alternatives covered in this workbook provide a different option for how the city can grow and change to address identified challenges and opportunities. The purpose of these alternatives is to solicit community feedback on where future growth and change should occur and what circulation improvements are needed to support people's ability to easily and safely move around our city. There are additional important issues, including equity and adequate public services, access to childcare and housing availability and climate change, um, which will be addressed through policy and program development later in the process this year. I'd like to quickly walk through some background on the alternatives before we dive into each of them. Um, and so each of these alternatives is responding to and building upon the concepts that were identified in the vision statement which Amy mentioned, and that was created last summer. Each of the alternatives also anticipates uh, 36,000 new homes to be built by uh, 2050. Each alternatives does differ, each of the alternatives differs on where new housing and new uh, non-residential growth would be focused. And an economic analysis identified the future demands from those 36,000 homes. So it assumes that 1 million square feet of retail space, 2 million square feet of office space, and 1.5 million square feet of industrial space would be needed to support the 36,000 new homes. Uh, in addition, each of these alternatives was analyzed through a traffic model to anticipate future travel patterns for residents and employees based on the uh, various locations of growth throughout the city. And each alternative was also assessed for how it addresses community safety and resilience from both natural and human-made disasters and hazards. Uh, Sandy, if you could please move on to the next slide. Okay, so this slide shows alternative one, which is our central corridors alternative. Uh, this really focuses our future commercial and residential growth near the city's downtown and along central, central thoroughfares that are connected to our transit facilities. Um, so this map here shows um, tra the transit mall and also various transit hubs and also the two smart stations. And it shows the major corridors connecting these spaces into the downtown. The yellow kind of shaded area shows where that um, additional housing growth and non-residential growth would be concentrated. And this alternative assumes about 55% of the 36,000 housing units would be located uh, within the identified area on the map. 
uh, in this scenario or alternative, most of the community needs, including access to jobs and retail could be met near or in the center of the city. And this form of development is efficient and is consistent with the recently adopted downtown station area specific plan. Transportation um, improvements would help to connect people to the downtown in a hub and spoke pattern, improving access by transit and bike. Uh, next slide, please. This slide here is alternative two, also called neighborhood main streets. And in this scenario, there's um, a concentration of housing, jobs, and community destinations along some key corridors and at community centers. So this map shows both shopping centers, which are larger uh, centers, which are shown in the kind of darker maroon color, and then also neighborhood centers, which are shown in the red color, and anticipates that uh, housing growth would be concentrated around these um, new centers or existing centers um, and would allow for most people's daily needs to be met by way of walking or biking. So essentially it's uh, neighborhoods located throughout the city. In this alternative, about 55% of the new housing would be um, located within the yellow shaded area. And then the, the transportation improvement envisioned for this alternative um, include closing sidewalk gaps and expanding bikeways to connect residents to their nearest key corridor or neighborhood center. Next slide, please. This slide shows alternative three, also called distributed housing. And this is sort of the most like how Santa Rosa is currently developed. So in this alternative, um, much of the housing units would be comprised of uh, less dense developments, including duplexes and triplexes and courtyard developments. And they are spread really throughout the city. There isn't as much of a relationship with our, our transit network. Since housing would be more spread out, people may need to rely more heavily on uh, vehicles or bus trips to access daily goods and services. Uh, and the circulation improvements anticipated under this alternative would be to significantly expand the bike network to make cross town travel both safer and easier. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide just shows the three alternatives we talked about and um, it can sort of be helpful to look at the various maps and see where the, the housing and, and non-residential growth, um, where those are concentrated and how those compare to one another. There's also some graphics along the bottom, which shows how um, really an alternative one, much of the intensity is located in the downtown and then directly abutting the downtown. And as we move away from that area, it becomes less dense. In alternative two, um, we still see the focus in the downtown, but then there are larger uh, retail nodes which are surrounded by more high density development. And then the third alternative where um, we, we really see um, various densities of housing spread throughout uh, with, but not quite as, as dense as alternative one or alternative two. Um, so with that, I. I'll pause and I think maybe we can ask if there are any questions. Chair Weeks, do you wanna start with the Planning Commission? Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, commissioners, um, any questions? Seeing, uh, uh, Commissioner Cisco. Uh, you're mu muted, Patty. Um, I hear that the, uh, the central corridors would be consistent with our current downtown station area specific plan, but will there, will there be any kind of modifications or, or differences in that? Or are we pretty much, that would be what's in place? That's a good question. 
at at this time, we're we're really asking the community um, for what changes may need to happen. That plan is so recently adopted that we do feel it is still very current, um, and we really have not implemented it yet to see its success. And so, with these alternatives, it's most likely that we're going to create some kind of blend based on what we hear. So there may be pieces of alternatives one and two and a little bit of three. Um, so we're not married to the downtown plan itself, but what we hear uh, so far is pretty consistent with what we heard from the community two years ago when it was adopted. So there will most likely be changes necessary in all of our specific plans. We do plan to do an update to, our, um, to zoning once the general plan is complete. So there will definitely be some, um, some room to make sure that we, we have what the community wants. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I, I do have one question um, uh, on the slides that we've seen so far, and I know I'll have other questions as we get to the end, but um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the community advisory committee's role and what their role really has been in this process? Sure, and actually, Beatrice, I might ask you to talk about the CAC. Thank you, Amy, and um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Weeks. In relationship to our CAC, uh, most of the uh, work that has been done with them and their role has been uh, having uh, connection with the communities. We selected the CAC, uh, the Community Advisory Committee, in a way to represent the whole community and to have connections with different um, areas, geographical areas of the city, as well as different communities and different uh, races, ethnicities, and other uh, characteristics of the community. And so they have been our connection with different, um, with different members of the community. And till now, most of the, of the uh, work that we have uh, been doing with them have, has been uh, engagement directly with uh, their own um, groups, uh, their own, um, the, the people that they have connections with. And most of the, of the engagement that has been done has been connecting uh, people to come to our workshops having specific meetings with staff as well as, as organizations and attending all the events that they have connected us with directly as well as providing them with uh, materials so that they can also create their own workshops and spread the word about the general plan update, create awareness in the community, as well as explain what is going on right now, specifically for these events that um, we provided them with uh, online uh, toolkits, as well as uh, physical uh, presentations and materials so that they could uh, host their own workshops. And this has been basically the, the task for the whole uh, process, but specifically for this engagement event set. Thank you. Um, that's the, the only question I have right now, but I know I'll have more. Um, and just checking back with uh, my fellow commissioners, any other questions before I turn it back to the mayor? Okay. Mr. Mayor? All right, thank you so much. Council, do we have any questions? Councilmember McDonald? Thank you, Mayor. Um, one of my questions on um, the route number two, alternatives two and three, has to do with the time that might be needed during an emergency for exits. And um, if those were the two alternative routes that were done specifically in District 3, where the fires have come, the last two um, massive fires that have hit Santa Rosa, would are you timing how long it would take if we did build in those areas for us to be able to safely get out of those um, areas. Are, are we doing alternative exit routes? It looks like Highway 12 is not widened on those alternative plans. So my curiosity has to do with um, if that's something that's being considered as we look at the different opportunities for us as we build more housing. Yes, Council Member, great question. And so I can briefly answer that, but I think also if we could promote um, our PlaceWorks team, so Charlie Knox, I think would be the appropriate person who's on the Zoom call. Oh, Andrea's already here. Um, <clears throat> but I will say we've also had very uh, distinct conversations with portions of our community related to that issue and that it will 
continue to be fleshed out based on the input that we get from this process. But we do have a sub consultant who is um, working specifically on emergency planning. So um, Andrea, do you wanna respond to her question specifically? Hi, Amy. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, that's a great question, and it's one that many community members had or similar concerns. Of course, um, fires and other hazards are front of mind for many community members. Um, so on the alternatives workbook, uh, we did do an analysis working with um, subconsultants with expertise in um, hazards and fire in particular um, to assess the the various hazards and which alternative uh, resulted in optimal outcomes for those. And on the workbook, you can see that there are differences between different hazards and um, for evacuation. So it's actually the case that alternative two, the neighborhood main streets resulted in the best outcome overall for all kinds of evacuations. But keep in mind that these are considering uh, the various hazards that Santa Rosa is vulnerable to and is not limited to just looking at uh, wildfire risks. Uh, so in the case of all of these, uh, this presents information on existing conditions and if we were to develop in these patterns. Um, for the preferred scenario and in your updated general plan, uh, we would be taking all of the communities and your feedback into consideration to assemble the, the preferred scenario for the development pattern, and then working with various uh, groups, including city fire department and others to bring in their expertise and identify if there is a need to update the city's evacuation network. Um, so if there were a drastic change to the existing config uh, configuration, then likely there would need to be some changes to the routes that are incorporated. Um, in addition, we might also explore the option to um, optimize existing routes or, or make other kinds of changes. So just as a clarification, do you approve the plan first and then come up with the exit routes or do we come up with exit route planning and then approve housing plans? I just wanna know which one comes first. Um, I don't wanna see that we've planned to build more housing in an area without having proper thought on emergency exit routes. I'm sorry if I'm not, if I'm not catching on quick enough, I apologize. I'll, I'll jump in there, Charlie Knox from PlaceWorks. No, you're correct, they have to go hand in hand. And, and really what it comes down to is how the, how the roadways are treated. So there are competing objectives between things like placemaking and having a great place to hang out at sidewalk cafes or um, you know, gather and whether that road can be used efficiently by um, fire and evacuation personal vehicles. And so in some cases, you may end up needing to make sure the road can be used both lanes or all three lanes or four lanes in the same direction, um, which means curbs might have to be different. The geometry of the street might have to be different. Bike lanes where we might have wanted them, you know, might not be as possible. So those kinds of policy constraints and, and physical constraints on the roadway are coming up now during the development of the preferred alternative. So when we come back to you in a few months, based on your guidance today um, and the community's input with, here's what we think we heard and here's your draft, look at a draft preferred alternative, it will include um, identification of the current and potential future additional evacuation routes and then the things that are necessary from a physical project standpoint to make them work the best they can, which may, which may in some cases mean It'd be nice to have oleanders in a median, but we're not going to be able to do that because we need to save that space for evacuation, for example. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Mayor. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, sir. Uh, mixed use vertical height limits. Were any of those two issues discussed uh, during the process in order to re achieve our housing goals? I would say broadly, yes. So we haven't gotten into the specifics of where or how tall certain places can build. Right now, we're really looking at uh, kind of at 30,000 feet, where would the concentrations of population be located and what services uh, would align with those. And so um, I will say that 
there's been a trend to move away from requiring mixed use. And so you'll see that in the downtown plan where we've really offered extreme flexibility on what gets built as far as which uses. Um, so that will be something when we moved in, into policy uh, about how do we actually create the land uses in the locations in the way that will meet the market demand in a way where things can actually be developed. So we'll be kind of expanding that same philosophy um, for the whole city. Um, but right right now, it, it's, a, it's a little bit larger picture that we're just kind of looking on a, a general basis on how we want to align new population coming in. Thank you. And, and that's a great point that you're making in, in regards to requiring opposed to more customizing the different areas. And, and the reason that I bring up the issue is I know for District 1, with the amount of open space that we still have in, the, in our rural neighborhoods, it's, it's quite important for us to maintain that characteristic. And so that's why I, more than the mixed use, I find important the height limitation or opportunity. Thank you. And Amy, I think this is a question for you, but can you talk a little bit about how uh, these plans interact with our historic district? Sure. Actually, Amy, would you want to answer that question? I knew if I said to Amy, I would get it right <laughs> one way or the other. Sure. Let's see. So the general plan is it covers the entire city, so it, it will include our eight historic districts. Um, the preferred alternative, which has been uh, mentioned a few times today, um, will actually be um, parcel specific. So we'll be looking at the, the land uses allowed on every parcel, which will include our historic districts. Um, and then that will determine you know, what type of development could be allowed and how dense that development can be, what, um, which will eventually dictate what type of development standards um, would apply. So how tall a building might be able to be or what type of design standards might apply. Um, and so I guess I'd also add that as a part of our general plan update, we also will need to do um, quite a few zoning code amendments to make sure that our general plan can be implemented. So if there were any sort of um, changes that, you know, to the process of approving development within our historic districts or around them, that would also be memorialized within our zoning code. So that as projects come in, uh, we ensure that they're they're consistent with, with the vision and the, the policies of the general plan. And I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, it does. I appreciate it. And I know a lot of these discussions happened when we did the downtown specific plan. Uh, but I think three of the historic districts were, were not part of that discussion at the time. Um, and so I know that they'll, they'll be interested to have that conversation. Uh, Council Member Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my question is, at what point or has it already happened that staff considers the, the delta in cost for maintaining infrastructure between the different plans so that we can add that piece of the conversation to the public, specifically around roads and maintenance and bike infrastructure and the difference in these plans. You, you mentioned that some will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but one thing that I think might use some highlighting is that with that reduces the cost on our infrastructure and so we can inform the public and then take that response from them into account as we make a decision moving forward. Yeah, that's a great point. And I will say between the three alternatives, there's a very um, broad brush review of the potential costs of infrastructure for all three. And so that's provided um, in the workbook and we have a technical appendices as well. But again, we really won't know that until we actually get to the preferred alternative. So at this phase, we kind of rank it like high, medium, low. Um, and so it's, it's um, you can see kind of broadly the differences. And then I, I will also say that within the general plan update, we may not get to a real actual cost of the infrastructure 
um, because this is more of an overarching plan that will include programs and will uh, move forward consistency reviews for our um, capital improvement programs ongoing, bike and pedestrian improvements, but there won't be that course number that you're probably used to seeing when we do a specific plan level document. So there, but we will have some estimates. We do have some consultants on the team who work on um, all aspects of our infrastructure to make sure that we have an assessment of um, what the potential costs are as things incrementally develop over time. Thank you. I think it'll be really helpful for us to understand um, what, what kinds of layouts will yield us the best value for our residents, both in quality of life, but also in like pavement indices and, and bike, bike paths. Oh, and you also made it um, a great connection to climate action and greenhouse gas emissions. So we are actually going to be coalescing our climate action plan into this document. So we are doing a greenhouse gas emissions inventory, um, which is actually going to be done pretty quickly here. And so all the policies related to climate action will be woven into the policy framework. So we are looking at um, the balance of those things and how certain policies will impact our, our climate action goals. Wonderful, thank you. All right, seeing no other questions, let's keep moving through the presentation. All right, so we're gonna kick it over to Beatrice to talk about the, the outreach for this engagement set. Thank you, Amy. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, uh, Chair Weeks and uh, City Council and uh, Commissioners. Uh, we did a very uh, broad community engagement events at number two for informing the community about alternatives and uh, we were aware that in, in, in the past two stages of the general plan update, we were not able to do in-person um, events. So we were very mindful that there could have been uh, community members who were not aware of uh, the existence of the general plan and what was going on with it. So we were very mindful to start with uh, just reaching out uh, to the community and, and creating awareness. So. Some of the uh, very first things that we did were pop-up events. So we took all, all our materials and um, our tents and went into community events that were hosted either by uh, city staff, uh, water department, um, community engagement department. We tried to create uh, collaboration with other de uh, departments in the city and as well as, as community members who were hosting events. And we attended uh, nine community events, I think up to the moment where we created this uh, presentation, but we actually attended more than uh, more than 10 community events and um, major gathering areas. And we had the opportunity to bring to the community awareness about the project, as well as to present the alternatives that you were able to hear from Amy Nicholson and uh, the whole um, the whole description of the process that Amy Lyle provided uh, today. And we also encourage people in this event to attend our workshops, um, as well as uh, to take the online survey that we created for people who could have or not um, seen the, the, um, the workbook. And we wanted to have this where people were already gathering. So this was one of our first um, uh, set of events. If we can go to the next slide, please. And then, just after the, the pop-ups uh, and in between the, the workshops, uh, sorry, the, the pop-ups, we had the community workshops. So we had five in-person uh, community um, spaces where we held workshops in March and at different locations of Santa Rosa. And to be more specific, I wanna mention that we were following our community involvement strategy, but we were also focusing on equity priority communities that we presented to you um, in our last, um, in our last uh, city council uh, presentation where we focused on, on census tracts of the city that were low income and that had high concentration of people of color. The reason that we did this was to prioritize, um, to, to bring this information to communities who did not have access to either uh, internet or be aware of what is happening in, in, in the city. So 
uh, we did this with four of the community workshops and held another one in downtown. We were very mindful of having a uh, parking space for community members who were not part of the community and who were able to drive or arrive in a different way to the, to the space, but we wanted to be mindful of community members who were either low income or people of color and who might not have had um, access to, um, to cars and who could walk or bike to the to the events. And um, the workshops were were presented uh, both in English and Spanish. We asked at the beginning of each workshop if people um, spoke English or Spanish or both. And what we did was to have um, two teams or what um, two 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 um, available. Um, staff members or consultant members who spoke Spanish. So we basically had materials in uh, both languages and translated uh, the presentation as well as the questions that the community had. So this way, uh, community members were able to hear even with the language barrier and understand what was going on uh, with other community members who did not speak their language. And uh, as I mentioned, four of these five workshops were hosted in equity priority areas of the city. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, during this um, this timeline, we also had a youth voice contest. Uh, one of the things that we discovered during the workshops and the community events was that our youth was not uh, getting involved into the into the conversation that we were having in, in, into the general plan. So um, the consultants and the, the staff um, worked on, on having uh, specifically um, uh, a space where where some of the youth could participate in a different way, and so um, we had uh, one one question that could be answered with any uh, type of video recording, uh, picture, etc. Uh, what makes Santa Rosa the special place it is today? Just to hear from community members uh, who were younger, and um, participants submitted uh, photos and poems. That's what we uh, received the most, and this is one of the uh, pictures that we actually received. We thought it was a really nice one and we wanted to include it in the in the presentation. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this would be one of the first uh, steps that we have for, for youth uh, engagement, but we actually are mindful that one of the um, of the challenges that we have for informing the general plan is young people. So we are working uh, with uh, Roseland, um, Roseland uh, School District and other districts of, of, of the city to start working on, on more targeted strategies for, for young people and, and kids. Uh, that said, we also uh, had, as I mentioned before, when um, Chair Weeks asked about our CAC um, uh, role, uh, we had meetings and presentations with different organizations that our CAC members connected us to. And we organized more than 15 meetings uh, with organizations throughout the city. We included some of the of the uh, logos of the organizations that actually collaborated with us to have presentations and, and connect us with different community members and uh, as well as as they're uh, attending their their meetings. And these were opportunities that we had to present alternatives, but also to encourage people to take our online survey and visit our vir virtual studio as well as to participate in our uh, in our community workshops. So um, this was a very important space to connect with different um, members of, of the community, also including equity priority uh, communities. And we considered this uh, space where we actually go to where people are already gathering and organizing. So this was a really great uh, part of our community outreach. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. And um, just following up on equity priority communities and how we were targeting specific groups that we didn't um, that didn't feel represented in the rest of the community workshops and the and the uh, online survey that we had going on, we are uh, being very intentional uh, on focusing on Santa Rosa's equity priority populations, and uh, the project team started to coordinate listening uh, or focus group sessions. We actually gave the opportunity to the um, communities to define how they wanted us to to uh, approach them. And um, we started uh, already with uh, residents who have a disability and farm workers. These are the two uh, 
listening sessions that we actually had with with these two groups and this this exercise provides us a safer environment and more comfortable space for people who actually are facing barriers to getting involved in planning exercises and they also let us inform the project team and our update process in, in a more inclusive and equitable way and um just to remind you, on the right side, we have uh, Santa Rosa equity priority populations, and uh, we are planning to continue with this with this uh, list of, of equity priority populations, including them in the in the general plan uh, update outreach, and specifically targeting um, these community members to hear from them directly. If we can go to the next slide, please. And just um, because I mentioned it before, but we want to. Um, also let you know that we created a virtual open house. We know even though the pandemic um, has uh, been doing better uh, till recent times, uh, we knew that we're, there were some uh, community members who did not want it to attend uh, in-person events. So we created a virtual open house that is basically replicating all the materials, questions, and presentations that we did in the in, uh, in-person workshops. And we recorded them and um, our, our consultant team and, and staff uh, created all the materials in a virtual space that actually has uh, the courthouse uh, square space. And um, it lets us provide uh, thoughts and feedback about Santa Rosa's future, included uh, all the uh, drafts of the alternatives, as well as uh, policy choices. So every um, square that you click on in, in the virtual open house, lets you uh, provide input and have this interaction with uh, an online platform that uh, also gave us input from the from the community. If we can go to the next slide, please. And just uh, for for additional um, for having an additional space for those people who uh, who were not willing to watch all the videos where we're still, in, uh, we're still willing to, to participate and provide their input. We had an online survey uh, that had the exact same questions from our virtual open house and our in-person workshops, uh, but in a simpler questionnaire format. And this was in our uh, website during the whole uh, period of time that we're, we were doing the community engagement. This online survey, we had it physically uh, handed in in our workshops. So, all the materials were the same. We just um, made sure that we have, di we, we had different um, spaces where people could participate and use the format that they felt more comfortable with. If we can go to the next slide, please. And for for us, that was um, the the whole uh, process of community engagement for for this uh, set of of um, of, of um, alternatives and. We, uh, we're looking forward to continue with, with um, the engagement process. And you have uh, in, in the materials that were provided an, an annex that uh, provides all the, all the uh, activities that we organized uh, as well as all the uh, feedback that we received through all the different surveys and um, our virtual space. And I just uh, wanna hand in this, uh, this, uh, this presentation to, to Amy so uh, that she can continue with with the uh, summary of our major major themes and feedback. Thank you. Great, so we're just gonna go um, toggle between the three of us to go over um, the slides and, because we really wanted you to see what did we hear from the community? Because there's so many cross sections of uh, other parts of our, our work um, that are valuable. And although these, most of these folks were obviously focused on our general plan effort. Um, <clears throat> so, the, the one of the major themes and feedback and loops that we heard were really about the economic resiliency and housing development. We heard a lot about housing. Um, so we did hear that there was a, a strong focus on orienting the growth to downtown or to those major neighborhood nodes of concentration. And there was a um, general disagreement on focusing the, the new housing and commercial areas proportionally as where they exist today. So we did have people in support, but most people really did not want that kind of distributed growth that the third alternative um, really portrayed. We did hear that uh, our community are very concerned about locating new housing, new density within the WUI, within those wildland urban interface areas, and also a huge desire for walkability and transit 
we heard a lot about bike and pedestrian connections. Um, next slide, please. And I'll take this slide as well. Um, but there, again, was that focus on downtown, but really also a mix of different affordability levels. Um, a lot of people have noted that the, the housing that seems to be underway downtown have, are more high end and they're looking for more um, areas of affordability and that there is a strong desire for housing to be located um, near shopping to be able to access by bike and pedestrian or other means and that there's a uh, also a huge need to start looking at how our demographics are going to change and provide the ability for people to age in place and not have to relocate as they get older. Next slide please. Um, moving into efficient and sustainable development, um, we heard um, very strongly that from the community that there is an interest in repurposing our major streets as multimodal corridors that would allow um, more safe and convenient pedestrian and bicycle transportation. Uh, we also heard a um, strong desire to preserve our natural ecosystems and wildlife within the city limits. More than 50% of those who responded also favored allocating more resources to our communities that are the most vulnerable to climate related hazards. And finally, there were uh, multiple people that indicated on their kind of um, fill in the blank optional part of the survey um, that it was really important to consider um, new new growth with our, our water supply. Next slide, please. I'm gonna jump in into this uh, other part of this efficient and sustainable development. And we heard a lot that people wanted to help uh, their, uh, to, to have their, their uh, households uh, insulated from the effects of climate change. We heard this much more of low income households and um, also maintenance related to, to the same topic. And uh, in general, we, we heard people uh, fa favored improving bus transit services. This was mentioned by Amy, but also uh, in relationship to this topic, they wanted uh, amenities to a low uh, convenient ac access to the neighborhoods, including improving multimodal access to not only smart stations, but also uh, the network of bicycle facilities, connecting neighborhoods to major destinations. This was something that we heard not only in um, high income, but also in low income neighborhoods. I would say this was one of the most general um, topics that we heard about. And people generally disagree with building new streets or adding lanes to existing streets to provide more vehicle capacity. This was something um, that, that people were not excited about, uh, though they had a really strong desire to ensure that neighborhoods had complete and accessible sidewalks. This is something that we also heard in, on every neighborhood and access to bicycle facilities, specifically on the west uh, and south uh, area of, of the city. If we can go to the next slide, please. And then another core area that we heard a lot from our community about was the issue of safety and resiliency. And this came out during our vision statement, um, but really carried forward in a lot of the comments we heard on this alternatives process as well. There is a great concern around the threat of wildfires, earthquake, drought, um, and also the concern about evacuation plans and um, how we move through another major disaster. And I will also add that it's interesting, we didn't hear a lot about the risk of flooding, um, which is something we also will be looking at through our update and creating policies around. But of course, top of mind right now are earthquakes and wildfires. So there was also a desire to address um, the results of the pandemic that we're going through and how that might relate to policy and how can we bolster our, our efforts to move through any future pandemic that would occur. And then there was also, again, a strong uh, agreement around limiting housing in the wildfire prone areas. Next slide, please. Uh, and then just continuing with what we heard related to resilience and safety, 
um, respondents were supportive of considering uh, the city limiting the amount of housing in flood prone areas and also near earthquake faults. There were multiple res uh, respondents that noted the need for the city to balance our housing needs with safety considerations uh, from various hazards. And um, also multiple respondents indicated the necessity to consider the needs of people with disabilities in the safety and evacuation approaches. Next slide, please. We also heard um, a lot of comments in relationship to equity. And um, as probably you remember, this was one of the uh, most uh, mentioned uh, words during our visioning process. And most respondents in Santa Rosa felt that pollution exposure and poor air quality are issues that we have in the city, which is a really interesting uh, thing since uh, pollution is very focused on, on some areas of the city according to Cal Envirus Screen. However, people were very mindful that there's uh, environmental uh, justice issues and, and some areas of the city that actually require our focus in, 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 in pollution and exposure to poor air quality. Uh, also, many, many respondents felt that um, opportunities to be involved in community uh, decision making were really relevant as well as access to public facilities and services and uh, access to public spaces that support physical activity. Um, one of the, of the things that was also really mentioned during this uh, equity conversation was access to health, uh, but healthy and affordable uh, food um, because as, as uh, probably a lot of you are aware, we have uh, some food deserts around the city. and. Uh, also, the, the additional topic that we heard about was access to, to safe and sanitary ho housing, um, because uh, this, these topics are really relevant for the community. Specifically, we heard this, this last one uh, in relationship to people who live in the south and uh, west of the, of the city. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. And then just continuing what Beatrice was talking about, um, we also heard a lot about how equity is weaved into the other decision-making processes in the city. Um, we had a lot of questions about improvements and how things were prioritized. So there was a lot of feedback about developing a prioritized list um, for a, like a neighborhood scale and to really dive into environmental justice and look at our equity priority communities for other decision-making and that um, we have an equitable access to parks, open space, community spaces, and that we're prioritizing the needs of our vulnerable populations um, when looking at development. And then also in general, just really looking at how do we address those underlying socioeconomic factors of segregation that has occurred in our community and how there's a connection to the crime and violence um, in the city. Next slide, please. Okay, and our last slide on equity. Um, we did hear multiple respondents um, that suggested the city should streamline or continue to streamline review and approval um, processes for new projects, which would help to reduce costs and expedite um, good projects. And then finally, participants uh, felt that the largest sources of air quality issues for them and their families um, came from either vehicle emissions uh, or wildfire smoke. Next slide, please. And then I'll, I'll take it over from here and close out our presentation for the next few slides. Um, so we wanted to bring this back to the major themes around the alternatives that we heard. And so as I noted, what our preferred alternative will arrive at is a blend. And so based on the community input that we've heard, um, it looks to be, as far as the blend that we're hearing so far, uh, is between alternatives one and two, alternative two being slightly more favored. And so this is a slide that we can go back to as well as you're um, looking at your feedback for us today as, as well. Next slide, please. And so we will be refining these. Um, so these are the few takeaways that we have based on the community input that we've heard is that people do want to see a focus of housing in our kind of our downtown core, not necessarily in downtown, but near major areas where there is transit. 
and then reducing the amount of new growth within the wildfire prone areas. Um, so really looking at increasing that community safety and reducing our threat to wildfire hazards. <clears throat> and then creating more mixed use neighborhoods uh, along major corridors and within downtown. So hoping to get uh, a mix, meaning if we're putting the housing in these areas, there needs to be a corresponding amount of commercial or retail or grocery stores as Beatrice had mentioned. And then ensuring that any new growth will have access to multimodal transportation. So looking at all of those options and the infrastructure required to really make sure that these areas of new growth are fully multimodal and have all those options available. And then also just that range of housing types and affordability um, throughout the city to really improve equity and not concentrate um, components of affordability in one, one area or another. Next slide, please. So all of the comments that we received are uh, captured and documented, and we want to just make sure you know that all the comments that we receive will be used throughout the general plan process. Um, we're still at a very high level stage of our update and the next few um, moves that we make in this process will be a lot more specific. We will be getting into looking at policy, health and equity, environmental justice, safety and evacuations. Um, so all of the comments that we're hearing now will still be used later. So we want to ensure that the community has the opportunity to provide input at any point, wherever they feel comfortable, and that their comments will not get lost in the shuffle. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our next steps today um, are really to hear from you all so we can take that back and really create a very refined preferred alternative. And as we've noted, this will be a very specific map that will show um, the land use and circulation patterns that um, we've arrived at based on all the input we've received. And then we will be coming back out to the community and you all to say, is this right? Is this of what we've heard? So that will come over the summer and uh, the next few months because um, we really wanna make sure that the refined preferred alternative that we have is the right thing. Uh, and we will continue to make changes to that. Um, and once we get it right, then we start working on our environmental impact report and the actual policy document um, that will carry forward for the rest of the update process. Next slide, please. So with that, today we really hope to hear from you um, on your review of these alternatives and um, we really wanna get your feedback and any other uh, members of the community that are, that are on the call today. And we are available for any questions um, that you have. Thank you so much. All right, thank you team. I'll go ahead and start with council and see if there's any remaining questions or feedback. Council member Fleming. Thank you, mayor. I did have one question about um, the communications around the development of downtown housing, specifically in that it's my understanding that the housing that's um, being developed or being slated to de be developed is affordable by design or a split of, of um, market rate and affordable by law housing. So I'm just curious to know if you got any information from participants about where they, they were getting the impression that the majority of downtown housing is a luxury um, commodity. It's a good question. And I think this is an area that, you know, within the planning department, we're really working on because there, there are a lot of projects that are entitled that do provide that mix. And it's hard to provide that awareness to the public on what's getting developed and how and when. Um, so we are working on a separate project to really create a more transparent dashboard that will show real time um, what's getting developed at what levels of affordability. Because um, as, as I know you know, the downtown plan really includes the opportunity for all levels of affordability and affordable by design. Um, but we did have a lot of questions about um, projects around the city and where the growth is being concentrated. 
Um, but I think there needs to be a greater knowledge base of what's in the pipeline, what's entitled, and um, what the kind of bigger picture on housing and what's happening. Thank you so much. Council Member Spudhelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple of questions on uh, the slides. Uh, slide 28 regarding equity in Santa Rosa. There's a statement, desire to streamline city review and approval process for new projects to reduce costs and expedite good projects. My question is about what defines a good project and who is making that decision? I'm gonna see if Beatrice has anything specific to say, but I, I will say we are providing you the input we received. Um, we did end up doing a lot of, um, we asked a lot of questions. We, we tried to provide a lot of education. So um, expedite good projects was probably just the way that this person described the, the, the type of housing or the type of project they would like to see. Um, but Beatrice, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I heard some of the conversations in relationship to uh, good projects, and I think the description that uh, people were, were making was related to projects that are affordable housing. The community, as was mentioned before, feels that not, the, uh, not all the projects that we approve are actually built, and the ones that are affordable housing take a long time to be developed. And so I think this comment was related to that, even though, as Amy mentioned, it was um, it, it was the phrasing that the, the, the community members use. So this comment is potentially just from one community member. I, I'm just struggling with when we say good, because there have been some projects that you just described, Beatrice, that have come before this council that have not been unanimously supported. And it gets into the, okay, who's deciding what's a good project or not? Is it the majority of the council or is staff that's where I'm struggling with this word and definition yeah, of it. Th this was a comment that was provided, uh, I think, for uh, two or uh, a couple of times in our in in the questionnaire that we received. So the the description of good is not coming from us; it's coming from from community members. So uh, if if you wish that uh, we get deeper into the uh, question, if there's a contact to to the community members who mentioned this, we could um, uh, probably get more information about it. But up to this point, it, it's just, we're just uh, getting you the, the general comments that we received. Yeah. So my feedback would be, it's just a very subjective word when you say good. Um, so, and then kind of tied into that with the um, slide 31, how are community comments being used? How have you explained it when soliciting feedback from community members? Because we hear it frequently saying, you didn't listen to us. Well, no, no, we listened to you. We just chose another direction. How have you been explaining that to community members so if they understand they've provided feedback, but it doesn't end up here? You know, here we're talking about three alternatives. So if someone said, hey, I'm a big fan, alternative three, we chose two. Oh, you didn't listen to me. H how are you explaining that to the community? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's something we're trying to do better um, is if people give us input, we are reporting back what we heard. So we are aggregating the comments there, there were people that really did want alternative three. Um, they really wanted to preserve the way of life that they have now um, and more of a distributed housing model. And um, most of the time we, we end up talking for quite a while to individuals um, about why they have that viewpoint and if there's any other policy areas that touch on that um, to really give them more ability to comment as we go further down the line. So we will be having those conversations when we do the preferred alternative. And I'm sure we will get people that will be unhappy that their, their choice was not chosen. Um, and it is not a ranked rating type of system. It is very qualitative. So um, it'll be important for us to, again, message back out what we heard from the community as a whole, trying to pull out those very specific statements as you've seen in this presentation, um, but really working with those community members to decipher, is there something more specific that we can work with um, as far as what ends up being in policy? But uh, it is, is definitely a, a balance when it comes to this large of a project. 
Yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate the challenge for this. I would just really encourage us to continue to have that dialogue because, as you said, this is a long process, and I would hate for someone to be frustrated because they said something early on, they didn't, we come back soliciting feedback and may have an opinion, what's the point? So every time we explain that, and again, it's not a, just a challenge for this process, it's many city processes that we encounter this, but thanks for all the effort. And if I can piggyback off of Council Member Spudhelm's question a little bit, uh, there was also a comment that, that kind of graded at me a little bit earlier about uh, how we only build luxury homes uh, and high-end homes. To what extent in this process are we also using it to educate folks on what actually is taking place? Because the perception of what's happening and what's actually happening in the, in the chamber in particular uh, doesn't always jive. Absolutely. That is a huge piece of this. Um, we, although we're focused on our general plan update, we're using this as an opportunity to educate and we're using it as an opportunity to gain trust so that people will continue to follow the project and all of our, our work and to make sure that they know someone in government that they can call and get the right information. So we absolutely educated at every step we could and we'll continue to do that through the process. Great. Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to confirm something, and it's piggybacking on Councilmember Schwedhelm's concerns. Um, can I assume that it, when we see these final documents come before us again, or maybe a, a couple different iterations, that words like themes will be removed? Um, because he had a good point. Not only will does the community have some, uh, when well, they have some great ideas on how the city of Santa Rosa evolves over, over the next number of years, but there will also be developers and those that will be building other, either retail brick and mortar um, businesses and housing that need to not have words like themes um, and words like good um, in, in, the, in the document. So I assume, I'm, I'm assuming that this is, this is the process and we're using words like this to help us get through the process to develop the recommendations coming from the community that it's, and the community is very comfortable with themes and, and, um, and some language that we can't use as a planning document. So I'm making that assumption. Is that, uh, is that accurate? Yes, I think that's, that's great feedback. And we will, we will certainly um, work on that and make sure that the next iteration is um, either more specific as to what um, people said or that we are encompassing it in a way that is more holistic. I appreciate that, and, and I know that this is a, this is a living document, and it's, it is evolving itself. And so, um, f for now, w w words that that were used that that will probably not end up in the final document is fine. I have no problem with that process. I just want to make sure that when we finish the process and we finish the document, that there is no ambiguity and that every everyone understands exactly what direction we're trying to move in, both the community and those that will be responsible um, and being the, the one. That, in, in a sense, the risk takers doing business in Santa Rosa um, as it evolves. Thank you. Any other questions from council members? Council member McDonald, and then I'll come to you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I just, I actually have some comments and a few questions, if you'll bear with me, please. So, um, as we look at the alternatives, I noticed that you suggested that there's about 55% of the housing that would be um, needed would be an alternative one, and same with alternative two, but that doesn't get us to 100%. So I, I'm going to suggest that we're going to need a combination of the three different kinds of housing. Um, as far as that goes, I think some of it is a culture of what we've always thought we needed to have as far as a house. You know, when, when I was buying a house and I had three little kids, I certainly can't imagine living in infill housing where I didn't have a yard to go stick those boys while I was trying to cook dinner or do something else. So I'm just curious as to part of this process, are we getting feedback from families so that they have an understanding that as we build more infill, infill housing in the downtown area that we'll have neighborhood parks and places for families to go and play and that parking is also part of the consideration as we move to more commercial buildings and retail that's needed in the downtown area um, as we're doing part of our general plan. So I know that that's um, some of the big concerns in our area had been around the building in the WUI areas or the wildfire 
let's see, what is it? Wildland urban interface areas. So I'm glad that that's part of the consideration and I still see that on alternative two, there's some suggested building in those exact areas. So I'm hopeful that that'll be addressed as you move forward in the planning process. A couple of things on engagement. I know we still have some opportunities for community engagement since some of this started during the pandemic. Um, maybe some suggestions would be to go to the park a month because we do see that there's a lot of families and um, community members that are out there and having our billboards perhaps at the park a month events. Um, also on the list of a very diverse group, I still didn't see schools or school personnel as part of the general plan and I mention this solely because the prior community which I lived in in Sonoma County did not interface with the city when they did their general plan update and as they've developed more housing the schools have not had room in those communities so I'd really like us to have some outreach to our school districts in the city of Santa Rosa and I'm really happy to hear that you already have reached out to Roseland um, however if we're building more houses in the downtown corridor or in in the downtown area specific in those school districts to ensure that as we build um, housing, low income, median uh, family in, uh, housing, that that is being addressed so that we are certain that there is a place for them to go to their neighborhood schools. Um, as far as the online survey goes, I think that's great if there's a way we could get that out on social media so that people know that they don't have to maybe attend an event, but that's something that we can share out as council members would be great. And uh, I think that's pretty much all of my comments and questions and just really want to say thank you. Um, for the process and for making sure that we are doing our due diligence. I still have concerns over current projects that are up for consideration without having those environmental impact reports that are based on a plan that we have not seen yet. And I wondered if that's part of the consideration as we move forward in this and getting the general plan done before the city moves forward on projects to make sure that we are really looking at our environmental impacts. Great, thank you so much, Council Member. Um, I'm just gonna respond to a couple of the questions that I heard and, and be, I'll let Beatrice respond to some of the engagement questions around our work with parks and school districts. Um, to first, you are right that within the alternatives, there's that 55% number associated with the, the different alternatives. And that's really representing that uh, not all housing will go into these areas. We are working with an existing framework uh, of what we have now in the city, and there are existing opportunities for housing um, throughout. So we will not be reducing those opportunities. We will be adding new opportunities. So we are looking at where do we fo focus the new housing, knowing that there will be other housing occurring um, throughout the city. Um, so it's a very intricate uh, piece to really um, try to decipher how do we create land uses and zoning to encourage the housing in a certain way, knowing that it is still allowed in other areas as well. Um, and let's see, Beatrice, do you want to talk about engagement and then also maybe about our use of social media too during this? Sure, Amy. And just following it up on the, on the park, um, uh, mention of, of uh, engagement uh, during engagement there. We had actually, I'm counting one, two, three, three, three pop-ups were hosted in, in, in parks events. We partner with, um, with our parks uh, team at the Rincon Valley Community Park Arbor uh, Day Tree Planning, as well as with the Redwood Empire Food Bank Distribution at Buyer Farm and the um, uh, food bank distribution at Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, Park in South Park. And we tried to focus on the days where we knew there was going to be more um, more people uh, gathering there. And that's why we used uh, the, the collaboration uh, and the partnering with the food bank. But uh, we are aware of those events and we tried to we, we're, we're keeping that agenda on collaborating with the with the parks team. And in relationship to schools, we totally agree. Uh, we have mapped, mapped the uh, 12, uh, 11 districts, uh, school districts that actually collaborate with the city. And uh, we are uh, in conversations with um, 
Santa Rosa uh, City Schools uh, District to so that we can start that conversation because the majority of students uh, are attending um, that school district. So we have that as well as, as uh, Roseland School District and we, we are willing to continue with this with this strategy and thank you for bringing that up. We, we really think it is important not only because of uh, the engagement with students, staff and uh, teachers, but also uh, with the conversation that we have about um, housing and, and, and schools. And in relationship to uh, social media, we actually used social media for the surveys and we worked with our communications team in the city. Uh, but not only with the city, we also partner with different organizations like Latino service providers who helped us uh, spread the word and, and as well as other organizations like Roseland CBI and some other um, organizations that were willing to to let us use their social media to replicate all the messages that the city was was uh, providing to the public. So that's uh, what we have been doing. I hope uh, next time we can also sh uh, share this this social media uh, materials with you so that the city council and the planning commission can help us spread the word. Thank you so much. And then I also wanted to reply to your comment about the existing general plan and the existing uh, environmental impact report. Um, a general plan update takes a long time. We are budgeting a three-year process for this. It is very thorough, it is very iterative, and it's a long process. Um, but our existing general plan is still valid, and the environmental impact report is still valid. So general plans can live quite a long time. Ideally, state law recommends that you do an update every 10 years, um, but most jurisdictions don't have that luxury. So we are very lucky to have the funding to be able to do this update and we're doing it in the way that we um, feel is the best um, because we do have the resources. We have a grant from Kaiser Permanente that's also supporting Beatrice's position to get deeper into health and environmental justice. But while we update all of this work, our, our general plan that's in place now lives on and is still valid and in full force. So I just wanted to reassure you on that point. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Echoing, echoing the, the quality of life uh, statement that Council Member Fleming stated, uh, is there a way to gauge the unintended consequences um, such as, actually I believe it was page 27? The uh, underlying social economic factors and residential social segregation in the community that contribute to crime and violence in the city, aka large city problems. Uh, are we able to gauge those with the difference between the, the different alternative maps being presented? Beatrice, do you want to answer that question? Yes, Amy. Um, thank you, Vice, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, yes, the first. So we, we know how segregation currently looks like in the city. Uh, we actually requested our consultants to um, help us figure out how each of the alternatives would uh, be uh, changing the city um, environment in, in, in terms of segregation. But it was not possible since we didn't have like specific data for, for development yet, but we actually can do that on the preferred alternative. And that's something that um, I specifically uh, I'm working with uh, and the consultant uh, team to do. And uh, that will be um, tailored to preferred alternative. According to what we saw, there were evaluations on, on equity for each of the alternatives during this stage, because there were general um, comments uh, or general assessments in relationship to each of the alternatives. And what we know is that in terms of, of how we approach equity on the three alternatives, we know that the second one would uh, probably um, be the one that actually provides more, more equity to the city in the sense that uh, providing mixed use um, to, to different neighborhoods can, can actually um, increase the access to um, healthy food as well as infrastructure for, for community members. But other than that, we don't have additional data for this stage. But um, I think that's a priority for us to have in the in the preferred alternative. And if, if this is something that you're concerned about and you're willing to work us uh, to work on, we're really happy to to keep doing it. 
I appreciate that. And then the suggestion would be to take a look at the larger cities and see how they've evolved over the years. And specifically, I'll bring up San Francisco, the Mission District. Uh, I see a lot of comparables between the Mission District and my district. So the, its involvement, its 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 identity, and the quality of life that you could see there uh, during the last 20 years compared to what you see now. Thank you. Councilmember Fleming. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one point of clarification from you. Are you looking for questions now or primarily feedback? We'll do questions, we'll do public comment, and then we'll do, well, and questions from the Planning Commission, public comment, and then comment. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, one question I have is, is it possible or has it been considered uh, to use this document in a way to discourage building in the wild and in urban interface and thus avoid putting additional people in risk during firestorms? Yes, so that is a concern. Um, and I wonder if someone from PlaceWorks could help respond to this on best practices, but um, there are existing property rights on those properties within those wildland urban interface areas. So um, there's a little bit of a balance because we can't remove those property rights, but we can make a concerted decision as a community not to put more population into those areas. Um, but I'll, I'll ask the PlaceWorks team to respond on this as well. This is Charlie from PlaceWorks. Yeah, I would echo that. I think we haven't gotten to the point yet in this discussion with the community where people have started talking about retreat or trying to limit entitlements that exist already, but we've certainly heard from the, the, the community uniformly, including from people who live in Fountain Grove and Coffee Park, Rincon Valley, Bennett Valley, saying, you know, we certainly don't want to add to or exacerbate the existing problem or the potential problem. So to this point, in general, I would say there's been good agreement. And this is one of the reasons that I think the majority of people didn't, didn't go for uh, the distributed housing alternative number three, um, there's been a lot of a lot of comment, a lot of effort around making sure that we employ best practices for the homes that are already there or could still be built that are already entitled. So defensible space, native landscaping, um, you know, building materials changes. And, and the city's been very um, future thinking, future forward thinking about this already with updates to the building code and, and grading and, and stormwater requirements and, and all that. So I think to this point, people are pretty uniformly throughout the community saying, we don't wanna make it worse, um, but we, we haven't gotten to the point where people have started talking about what we could do with existing um, entitled development that hasn't been built yet. Thank you, and to that end, you know, could it be used to prevent future entitlements? So, I don't, I'm, I don't wanna sound like I'm repeating myself, but yes, yes it can, uh, you know, the, I think, what what we're, we've heard and you know we're, we're starting as soon as we hear your comments today we start working on the preferred alternative but i think um, in addition to anything we might hear from planning commission council and, and public commenters today from the community at large we have heard if there are vacant properties in the wildland urban interface that haven't been entitled yet um, we should think very seriously about um, how to um, avoid adding new density new residential development new non-residential development in the wildland urban interface. And as you know, there's a pretty big um, gap in what's been mapped so far by CAL FIRE and the city kind of around Montecito Village in that area um, where there's a pretty big concentration of people already, but some fairly large parcels um, that haven't been developed yet. And there's a lot of thinking at the CAL FIRE and I think city fire department level about whether that so-called donut in the, in the WUI is actually gonna continue to be unmapped or will eventually be mapped as, as well as an interface as well. So um, there's a lot of things in process, but I do think including people that live in these areas, there's a lot of um, agreement that we at, at least do not want to try to create new development rights where they don't exist already um, and make the problem worse. Thank you, very helpful. And my last two questions ha are, are echoing questions that have already been asked, but I think are worth um, highlighting, which is one is our consultation with the schools. Council Member McDonald raised the point about making sure that we have adequate schools for new development. And then on the flip side, you know, my experience is that the school in my neighborhood is having to downsize. And so there are, there are shifting demographics across the city. And so a, a careful analysis with our school district ought to yield us some understanding of where our 
infrastructure assets lie and where we could use more families and where we could use more schools. And then <clears throat> uh, Council Member Alvarez brought up uh, park space as did Council Member McDonald and public safety. And I'm just uh, curious to know how we're working with the schools to identify which school districts within the city limits do allow for public uses during non-school hours and which ones do not, thus contributing to um, more open space or less open space. And finally, a question around the nature of our consultation with Sonoma County Transit Authority and in particular safe routes to school to ensure fewer car trips and safer travel for children and families to and from schools. I don't know that each of those things needs a, um, a response, but I thought they were important uh, questions to move forward as you continue to engage with the community. Thank you, council member. I will say that we have been working with the school districts and to this point, it has really been to further our outreach and engagement. And as we move into the next phase, we will be expanding our technical advisory committee to include those district representatives to really get into very um, specific conversations around population and locations um, around their school planning. Because um, as you know, they are, they are pretty much another whole set of government that doesn't necessarily need to align with us, um, but we do wanna make sure that we are in communication and that our planning efforts do do align to the, to the best extent possible. Um, Again, one last thing, um, Ms. Lyle, to that point though, in the city of Santa Rosa, there is the San city of Santa Rosa school district, but then more specifically, I'm talking about the elementary school assets where there's many school districts within the city and they have different policies around their open space. So I'm just hopeful that we continue to engage with them so that we can come up with something that's more uniform and more accessible for residents. I agree, and we have that noted, and uh, we can make sure also to report out on that um, as we get more into those policy discussions. Thank you. And um, then, let's see, Beatrice, was there another piece to that that I'm missing? Consultation with an, another group, and I completely lost which one that was. I think SCTA I mentioned. Oh, yes. Um, so we are working with um, our SETA partners and our other cities as well. Um, right now, our major focus is housing element work because we are all updating our housing elements at the same time. Um, but I will say Beatrice and, and Nancy Adams on our transportation public works team are both um, participating within the Vision Zero work, which will be coming to your council in July. Um, but we are also kept up to date on safe routes to school uh, programs as well. Thank you so much. All right, Madam uh, Planning Commission Chair, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Mayor. Um, any questions um, for staff at this time? It doesn't look like it. I know we'll have some comments after we hear from the public. Oh, Patty, uh, Commissioner Cisco. Uh, you're muted. Patty, you're muted. One of these days I'm gonna to remember to do that right. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying this is a little bit of a combination uh, comment and question, but when we when we start looking at alternative two and going into the corridors and it said they'd be looking at um, increasing density around uh, existing and planned um, uh, centers and so I'm assuming we recently had we recently had a general plan amendment where we uh, eliminated a community um, a shopping center in favor of density based on research about uh, that it was not feasible. So I'm assuming that as you proceed and in, in you're looking at increasing density around potentially planned centers, you're gonna be looking at it with that kind of a view. Uh, will it ultimately be feasible even with the amount of density you put around it? So just that. Yes, that is a great question and great comment. Um, we are working with economic sub consultant to really look uh, in a refined way at each of those uh, nodal activities to make sure that they are actually feasible. And um, you'll probably note on the map that we have a few that are new or not even in existence right now. Yeah. Um, and I think the one you're noting was 
from previous general plan update and was a hope um, that that could occur in that area, but ended up not being feasible. Um, so that is something that will be kind of a fresh rethink on this update to make sure that what we're doing is um, economically feasible and based in um, kind of truth on what these property owners would actually like to see. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carpenter. Yeah, um, <clears throat> as we're talking about uh, development within the WUI, I was just curious that when we were doing the outreach um, and people noted they didn't want any uh, new development within the wildland urban interface, was that clearly defined um, either by definition or with a, a literal defined line of what is and what isn't, or is it more in theory of, I just don't like highly prone wildfire areas to be built in? You know, I, I personally don't remember if there was a specific area of the city that felt like uh, resonated um, specific to like a Rincon Valley or Coffee Park or Fountain Grove. It, and it was a sentiment that we heard from people who weren't even living within those wildland or urban, inter urban interface areas. Um, so it was pretty much a global sentiment that we heard throughout, um, but not focused on one specific community or one neighborhood within the city. Does, does that answer your question? No, actually, I, the, the term wild, wildland urban interface, or wild, yeah, wildland urban interface, um, was that clearly defined? So when people say, I don't want building in the WUI, was that clearly defined as to what the WUI is or where the WUI is when that discussion was had? Or is it more of a sentiment? Actually, no, and we ended up adding that layer to some of our maps later in the process to kind of help that education process. Um, but I think uh, most of our constituency are, are becoming um, aware of where those areas are. And so there, but we did provide those a little bit later in the process. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, anything else from commissioners? Okay, uh, back to you, Mayor Rogers. All right, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Sandy. Sandy, if you can facilitate uh, public comments for us today for both folks in the chamber and on Zoom. Yes, thank you. One moment, please. I'm having click. Okay, we have um, Susan Lamont. Are you able to unmute? Yeah, thank you. I um, want to address the special opportunity zones that I believe were created by Trump that are financed with um, taxpayer dollars and according to a newspaper or a press never got article repeated from you know a national news source um being taken advantage of by primarily rich people and we have one of those right in downtown huge futrell's art house and the purpose of these opportunity zones is to improve an area and i would say to mr schwedhelm that improvement would certainly be a word which we might disagree on. My definition of improvement might differ from his. But now an area that had a 25% um, population under the poverty rate is blessed with a very high-end building with an, with an art gallery in it. I'm sure those poor people are absolutely thrilled. Um, I don't know what the city can do about such things, whether they can approve them or not, uh, or not, in, not approve them. But um, I think the unintended consequences that Councilman um, Alvarez mentioned is that uh, 
you you stick in a high-end building and most likely rents around it will rise and that will certainly not help um, the residents who are under the poverty level so i'm wondering if there are ways to approach um, what i see as a problem of exploitation of both of um, taxpayer dollars and um, the unintended consequence of uh, raised rents. Thank you. Um, Mayor, I don't see any more raised hands and we don't have any, oh, sorry, a new, another one. Um, Jay Berger. Uh, hello, Council. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Go for it. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Joel Berger. I'm a very longtime resident of, of uh, Santa Rosa, uh, basically 35 years, uh, ever since I was two years old. So um, seeing uh, the uh, general plan um, coming up again and, and kind of having a uh, uh, a, a say in the matter at uh, <laughs> my now adult age. Um, it's definitely uh, pleasing to see some of the changes that you guys have already um, yeah, looked into and listened to regarding um, the option one and option two. Um, I definitely wanted to make it well known uh, that a lot of the people that I've talked to, and I'm trying to kind of do my own outreach uh, myself, um, I also just submitted uh, an application to join the CAC if possible. Um, because uh, I'm very much interested in, in being a lot more active in my community, and uh, this general plan is definitely a, a, an important uh, a part of that. Um, so I wanted to, to uh, vocalize my support and my friends' support. Um, uh, hopefully they can join me in meetings later on. Uh, that option one, um, alternative one, is, is definitely more preferred. Um, I think we all agree uh, that building uh, up, not out, uh, is definitely more preferable, uh, not only considering uh, the emerging climate emergency we are actively currently in, uh, but as well it helps to centralize uh, public. Um, it allows for uh, better uh, transit options available, particularly since there's more need, uh, more requests uh, for biking, um, busing, uh, even the smart rail. Um, as much as contention as it has been, uh, there's definitely a lot of opportunity and people want to use all of these services. And uh, there's definitely a much more of a um, request to move away from being a very car-centric society. Uh, and I think that that matches very, very much with the identity of Santa Rosa as a whole. Uh, we've treated this community very much like we want to be small um, and we've kept growing and I really appreciate that we're starting to see um, that uh, change uh, that we understand we are a very growing and very diverse uh, community. Um, but with that we need to understand that um, we cannot consider ourselves a small community but we can still uh, allow for the community locations and areas to feel more at home and more uh, available for human beings rather than uh, cars and uh, making things less hospitable. Um, so uh, I definitely like what I'm seeing here and uh, I uh, hopefully will have a lot more to say um, in the uh, in the coming weeks. All right, is there anybody else who'd like to provide public comment? Mayor, I don't see any right, other hands. Excellent, I'll bring it back and I'll turn it over to Chair Weeks for comments from the Planning Commission. Thank you, Mayor Rogers. Um, we'll go ahead and start with uh, Commissioner Cisco. Do you have any comments? Uh, just that, you know, I appreciate the direction that the city's taking uh, based on the feedback given by the community. And um, and I think um, a marriage of alternatives one and two seems appropriate. Um, I think it's also important to note for the public to be educated that um, as far as alternative three, there are 
existing state mandates and new policies that are going to allow for, you know, growth in that area on those parcels. And so it's, I'm not sure how we could get 55% of our housing needs met that way, but just so that the public does understand that uh, it is still possible to build there. Uh, but I think it, this is a good direction and I look forward to seeing the preferred alternative. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Kripke. Yeah, um, first I just wanna say thanks to staff and the TAC and the CAC, uh, Place Works and the community for all the work they've put in so far. Uh, it's really appreciated. Um, I agree with Commissioner Cisco. marriage between one and two is probably the, the best option for us. Mer uh, uh, I believe, you know, option one is is nice, but as, as I said in, in one of the reports, it requires a robust public transportation system, which we just don't have. And, and to uh, actually get would be um, a, a, a huge undertaking um, in order to do that. So I think that uh, somewhere between one and two is probably is what I would um, like to see. And, um, you know, uh, I appreciate the education um, that staff is taking with, you know, only high-end stuff is getting built. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the entirety of the Planning Commission. I only speak for myself. But we see a lot of projects come through. Um, and it's not generally the, the market rate things that are built first um, for a variety of reasons. So I appreciate you guys taking on the education portion of that. And then my last comment would be, just regarding the question I asked about the WUI earlier, you know, have that map readily available for everybody that's participating, including any boards, commissions, uh, and, and excuse me, and council themselves. Thank you. And um, we'll go to Vice Chair Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chair Weeks. Um, I want to also ex extend my thanks to staff and, and the public that's contributed to this. Um, you know, seeing some of the feedback, it does seem like planning has. Uh, tasked itself with solving every problem that Santa Rosa has. So while I'm optimistic that they can do that, I think for this particular issue, um, you know, the, the narrower scope may win the day. And in that sense, um, you know, I, I like alternative one, obviously it's gonna be, you know, a hybrid of, of the, the alternatives that have been presented. But um, I think, you know, for these as a, as a general matter, we want to be ambitious and big and we've seen that pay off with with santa rosa and other projects um and and kind of goal setting whether it's cannabis or other um, housing related things i think the city and staff has been really at the forefront of of these kinds of things and, and thinking big and i i just want to encourage um everyone to continue doing that i think we're facing a lot of challenges um climate fire economic um and it's only through sort of thinking big and thinking beyond sort of what seems feasible um at this moment that we can kind of get there so public transportation separate bike lanes you know walkable neighborhoods all the stuff we always hear about um you know that'll come about where the uh river meets the road and the specifics um once we we get the preferred alternative so um with that you know thank you again and um I look forward to seeing the preferred alternative. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to express my gratitude to staff for all your hard work on this. Um, I participated in a couple of your pop-up meetings and your online survey, and I really appreciate having that opportunity. Um, I would like a combination of one and two um, it, it, with a, with a um, stressing on various income levels of housing. So I think that's really important. Um, I think, I can't remember what the term was, uh, distributed housing, but I mean, making sure that, um, you know, that you have various income levels in diff different neighborhoods. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and I do wanna thank the members of the public who have participated in uh, the process so far, you know, only together can we build a better community. So thank you. Um, back to you, Mayor Rogers. Excellent. Uh, I'll start with Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. And I will voice my appreciation for the, the community's input. It is, it is not always easy to gain that, and you have done a great job in, uh, of outreach. 
and that will continue, I'm sure, as, as the plans evolve. And the CAC um, and staff and our consultants, I mean, it just this is an, a, a vital and major endeavor, and I appreciate all the work that went into to the to the product so far. Um, I also appreciate um, the blending of one and two. Uh, what I like about two was articulated by uh, Chair Weeks in that it uh, scatters the, the types of housing uh, in d different parts of our city um, and also creates uh, the, an opportunity for business and uh, general business and retail to exist in those, in those areas without people having to drive necessarily. Um, that's the, but I also like the num number one because it has this focus on downtown, and I've always been an advocate of city-centered growth. So um, having a having the the, the concept of concentrating um, uh, a certain amount of that growth to the downtown for a variety of reasons, and then also the scattering of of the of the growth throughout the city and creating um, main streets and the. Um, uh, the retail nodes and the business nodes and actually housing nodes uh, so there there are a lot of reasons to like um, the blending of one and two um, and I'll I think I'll just leave it there thank you again for all the hard work council member Spudhelm thank you mr. mayor uh, echo many of the sentiments about what got us here and Amy I really appreciate you uh, reaffirming this is a three-year process and so getting this amount of feedback in different iterations so I'm a fan of alternative two I'm not quite ready to marry it with alternative one but maybe a close friendship um, but I really like what uh, councilmember Sawyer said about the city center growth but alternative uh, two really resonated a little bit more with me but I recognize we do need to focus as we have in the past with um, our downtown focus, which is spoken well in alternative one. Thanks. Council Member Fleming. Well, uh, starting out, I think many people have thanked the staff, and I know you I know that you know that you have my hearty appreciation, but I also want to really emphasize that you know community members came out and gave us their input, which is fantastic on something like this, which is very difficult for even experienced folks to conceptualize how to do this. So a hearty appreciation to everybody who participated. Again, we're still at the beginning parts of this and I expect and hope for so much more. Um, continuing the, the friends or the romance version of this, I, I'm more on the, the, um, the, the romance bit here. I, I, I really like alternative one and I'll tell you why. I think that it, it leads to better outcomes in terms of the cost. My guess is gonna be it's gonna reduce the cost to maintain the infrastructure across the city. What I really like about alternative two is that it increases access to resources along neighborhoods. And coming from a city that had both a strong downtown as well as strong neighborhoods and main streets, I think both have an essential function in our city. What I hope to be seeing more of is what I heard from the community, which is a strong desire for an improved quality of life. People wanna be able to get to where they're going without having to get in their cars. And if they do get in their cars, they wanna have a not too bumpy ride to get there. And so I think that if we um, maybe not marry, but have a domestic partnership between alternatives one and two, we can achieve an outcome that would be pleasing and equitable to as many residents as possible. So I'll continue to look for which aspects of these improve quality of life for folks across the city and reduce the burden to the taxpayers as well as our infrastructure and public works when it comes to, to roads and streets and upkeep and which things move us towards healthy alternatives like biking, walking, and reduce food deserts. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember uh, McDonald. Thank you so much. I do wanna thank the advisory committee as well as the planning commission and staff for all their hard work on this and their continued work and commitment to making sure that we're um, doing our due diligence to listen to our community. And I agree with the sentiments that have been said by fellow council members that the um, focus on the downtown area, the reduction in our climate um, so that we can make sure that we're not driving into places. I know even for me personally, going to my local grocery store, having the bank right 
right down the road. The convenience of that is is what we like. Um, people like to make sure that they're able to shop and do their business next to their homes. That's where they're comfortable. It's where we gather. It's where we have our neighborhood, um, you know, barbecues. And so making sure that that's that's all available. I think the combination of one and two is is critical. But I do think that we are going to need to look at housing in our outer areas for option three as well. And I'm glad to hear that that's part of what um, the consideration is, is looking at those areas that are not developed um, so that we can have sometimes bigger houses. And certainly not everybody comes with one or two children. Some of us have more than that. And, and some of us have even multiples at a time, like my kids, because I'm a Mimi this week. So um, I just want to say thank you and agree that for the reasons that have been stated, one and two make the most sense for Santa Rosa's growth. And um, I just, again, appreciate all the work that's gone into this. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in Southwest Santa Rosa, we have, or actually I should say, we don't have Anadol Park or Taylor Mountain, but we do have Hogan Creek and Santa Rosa Creek. And it's why I, on behalf of future Santa Rosans, I appreciate the staff's work uh, and I especially appreciate my fellow Santa Rosans for understanding the importance of, of infill, of maintaining open spaces uh, as demonstrated by their preference of alternative one and two. One, for recognizing climate issues and two, for uh, recognizing equitable assets. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, I too want to thank staff for all of their work on this, particularly the uh, interest in digging deep into our community and talking to folks who are not normally rec uh, represented in the decisions that are being made. One of the things that everybody has an opinion on is how they would like the city to feel. And usually we talk about it on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, and that really does inform a lot of how we view uh, the world that's around us. I'm a big fan of alternatives one and two. Uh, pretty much for the same reason, and that's the walkability and the multimodal potential that exists. I'm a big fan of the 15-minute city concept that allows people to live and work and have uh, a small sphere where they can have non-car options to be able to get around. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a big fan of those too, and I want to see them continue to move forward. A lot of the conversation is around infrastructure. It is around how do we expedite our bicycle lanes, how do we protect them and make them usable for people? How do we make it so that we have a walkable community? How do we make sure that some of the past planning mistakes of the city are rectified? Uh, yes, that means the mall. And yes, that means the access uh, for folks to be able to navigate and to get around. Uh, the, the thing that I like the most about option one is it does recognize the importance of keeping people out of the wooey. What I like about option two is it does recognize sort of where we currently sit in terms of where our population balance is. And both of those are important for us to find a way to move forward and to uh, reconcile sort of where we sit with where we want to go. Uh, so I'm anxious to see how staff does that. Uh, I uh, wanna make sure that the bulk of the population is in both of these models is still put uh, in the appropriate place downtown. Uh, but I recognize that the spheres of influence and in having some of our commercial zones accessible by bike and by, by foot for folks who are a little bit further out, that that makes sense too. Uh, with that, I'll see if there's any final comments from the Planning Commission Chair. No, uh, thank you, Mayor Rogers. And thank you for having us here today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll go ahead and say goodbye to our Planning Commission and adjourn our uh, special uh, joint item here, item 3.1. Uh, council, we do have a busy day, so we'll move right into item 3.2, which is our discussion about the Charter Review Committee. Uh, and then we'll take a short break after that and let people stretch their legs. Item 3.2, Charter Review Committee, final report and recommendations. City Attorney Sue Gallagher will lead the discussion. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Rogers and council members. Um, 
Uh, we do have a very full uh, study session calendar today, a lot of uh, very engaging issues and significant issues. So we'll jump right into now um, our, the final report from the Charter Review Committee. Um, I'll present the recommendations. Um, and I, I do acknowledge that the PowerPoint is fairly long. I want to assure you that we'll try to move through it fairly quickly, uh, given the hour. Um, we'll spend a little, just to give you a roadmap of how we're going to do it, we will spend a little more time on the first several items, which are um, a more complex and uh, were uh, subject to some su substantial discussions at the Charter Review uh, Committee meetings. For the items that are just simply updates uh, for the Charter, some clarifications of some ambiguities in the Charter, we'll go th through those uh, toward the end and we'll go through them very quickly. And I will note, I am very happy to see our Chair, uh, Patty Sisko, uh, is here and present and I do invite her to weigh in at any time, um, so much appreciated. Um, uh, a wonderful chair throughout this process, so thank you. Next slide. So as background, as you know, last August, uh, the Council directed the establishment of the Charter Review Committee, and uh, the committee was charged with beginning uh, the city's decennial review of the provisions of its charter. The city has a history and a requirement in its charter that the uh, provisions of the charter be reviewed every 10 years. So this started it out for this, for this, uh, this decade. Um, the committee was appointed by council. Each uh, council member appointed three members. And the committee um, uh, therefore consisted of 21 individuals and really remarkably diverse uh, in age, race, gender, geography, interests, and background. It was really wonderful to work with this group. Um, I so appreciated uh, their col collaborative approach. They were all very highly engaged, uh, very thoughtful. Uh, we really had a great attendance throughout, um, which is not easy. These, these are all folks that have other things going on in their lives, so very much appreciated. Um, the committee worked over the past seven months uh, reviewing and making key recommendations on possible charter amendments, and that's what we will go through today. Next slide. The committee did complete its final report and recommendations. Um, I'll walk through the recommendations, as I said, um, and at the end, uh, once you, uh, you know, answer questions, we hear from the public, uh, you have your comments, I will ask for directions from the council as to next steps. We'll be moving forward fairly quickly. Um, we have our next meeting in June and then the, the final meeting in July, at which point we will, at, by the end of the meeting on July 12th, we are to have uh, language prepared for the ballot. So we're gonna be moving quickly. So as much direction as you can give me and give all of us uh, today would be much appreciated. I understand, though, that some of these issues are complex. You may want additional information. You want, may want me to explore uh, different avenues. And of course, very happy to do that. So next slide. Uh, just a broad overview, um, we'll be looking at council compensation, directly elected mayor, ranked choice voting, voting rights for non-citizens, district-based election of council members, and then a general charter update and modernization. Uh, that last item includes about 10 or 11 items, all of which we believe could be um, uh, uh, included in a single ballot measure. Um, those items that are in the Charter Update and Modernization are generally non-controversial, um, uh, so, so we're hopeful that those will be, those will move forward. Um, next slide. Committee recommendations. I'll identify two, I'll note two, as you I'm sure noted. Um, the list that the committee ended up focusing on uh, varied a little bit from the list that the council gave at the outset, which included 12 specific items. Um, the committee focused its efforts first on those uh, items and issues that would require a charter amendment that couldn't be done by ordinance or resolution or initiative. So they really focused, recognizing they had limited time and resources. Um, 
the, all, the committee also sought to focus on those issues that they felt would have the most impact uh, on the community. So that's uh, how these items uh, came to, to be. Uh, next slide. The first thing that the um, committee took on, and I will say ended up with three, discussing this at three separate meetings, uh, both at the beginning of the process and towards the end, this is council compensation. Give it a little bit background to start with. This was one of the um, items that the council asked the committee to look at. Um, and as I say, it did, did uh, engender a lot of discussion. So council members currently, as you know, uh, receive $800 a month salary and the mayor receives uh, a $1,200 per month. Uh, that's by our charter, um, $800 uh, from the, for the council members and then the mayor gets 150% of that, that, that reaches up to the $1,200. Um, there's been no increase in those salaries since 2005. Um, so really a good time to start looking, looking at that, uh, looking at compensation. The Charter Review Committee um, heard of the workload of the mayor and council members, did see some of the um, calendars, calendar of the mayor, um, and, uh, and, and just heard discussion, including a discussion from um, committee members that are former council members. So. The committee was unanimous in recognizing the difficulties of balancing uh, private employment, child care, your family life uh, with the responsibilities of council membership. Um, the committee also received information on compensation uh, of other cities, both in Sonoma County, in our comparable cities, and uh, in generally in Northern California. Uh, next slide committee unanimously agreed that council compensation should be increased and felt very strongly. Uh, the committee felt um, that an increase in compensation um, had very strong public policy reasons, would enable a greater diversity in council membership, enabling those with young families, those with lower paying jobs, those without independent resources uh, to be able to uh, join the council and work with the council, would ensure continued strong commitment and professionalism. Um, the committee was sensitive to recent resignations uh, from various councils uh, in Sonoma County that was um, uh, noted and discussed. And then simply to reflect the fairness and the respect for the extensive work that uh, you all do. Next slide. The recommendation, the, the, the committee discussed a lot of different options, uh, ended up settling uh, strongly on setting the mayor's salary, setting both council and mayor's salary tied to the area median income. Area median income is set by, is determined uh, by the U.S. Uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, um, and the recommendation was to set the mayor's salary, understanding uh, the mayor's workload, at area median income for a three-person household, set the council member's salary at two-thirds of the area median income for a three-person household. That matches the ratio currently uh, used for council compensation. And then recommended that it, uh, council compensation be permanently tied to the AMI so that the council compensation, both the mayor and the council members, would be adjusted every year as uh, the area median income uh, is updated. Uh, the, council, the committee also recommended that the council uh, consider establishing a penalty or a reduction in salary for missed unexcused absences, uh, or if we were in a situation where the city was cutting, did it was doing a citywide reduction in uh, employee salaries, that it would only be appropriate to uh, consider a reduction in council member salaries as well or you know, any other uh, basis that the council found appropriate. Um, the committee did consider a number of uh, alternatives. Next slide. Um, there was a strong minority that recommended a higher level of compensation still tied to the AMI, um, but to be set at 140% of AMI for the mayor, 100% of AMI for council members, 
uh, that motion uh, did fail on a eight in favor, 11 opposed, and two absent. Uh, at least two committee members recommended council utilize existing authority under the charter and state law to increase their compensation, and we'll talk about that, and I'll kind of lay that out on the next slide. And then discussed, at least briefly, some of the other options which were uh, tying council salaries uh, to the salary of county supervisors, a lot of discussion about uh, comparison of council member responsibilities and supervisor responsibilities. Uh, also looked at uh, considering tying it to the average uh, city employee salary or maybe the lowest paid city employee. Uh, also looked at, there's a suggestion to look at um, the average of council compensation in Santa Rosa's comparable cities. The comparable cities is a list of 11 cities that Santa Rosa currently uses uh, for comparison when setting employee salaries. So the thought was if we use that to set employee salaries, maybe we should be using that to uh, set council uh, compensation as well. Next slide. Um, I do want to take uh, just a minute to walk through um, the council's existing authority, I think both for, a per for the purpose of having the background of where you are now, uh, but also uh, at least a couple of members were interested in, in pursuing that. So um, the existing authority is set forth in Charter Section 4, uh, and it ties a council compensation to state law. State law provides a schedule of compensation um, that's based on population. Um, for a city the size of Santa Rosa, that is between 150,000 and 250,000 population. Compensation, again, under state law is set at $800 a month. Um, and state law specifically states that the voters can approve higher rates uh, if, uh, if they so desire. State law also provides that $800 a month isn't fixed. Um, the council by ordinance uh, can increase that compensation by 5% a year, not compounded, and the increases may accumulate. So where are we now? We've had no change in the compensation since 2005, so we have a 17-year accumulation at 5%, which would equal $40 per month times 17 years, equals you could, uh, by ordinance, provide for an increase in council compensation of $680 uh, allowable increase, and then, uh, of course, a larger increase uh, for the mayor. Next slide. Um, in talking about compensation, the committee really focused on what is the most appropriate measurement of compensation. How, what's the formula that should be used? Um, the, count, the committee really did not focus strongly on dollar amounts, but rather what is the appropriate measurement for compensation. Um, that being said, I also know that ultimately the council and the public will want to know what these uh, various formulas mean in dollars and cents. I won't go through the list, but I do have it there for you, and um, I will note that the recommendation from the committee at 100% AMI for the mayor and two-thirds of that for the council member, uh, that falls right in the mid-range of this list. Next slide. So that was kind of the brief uh, summary of three meetings of discussions on council compensation. Um, moving next to directly elected mayor, we had two separate meetings to discuss directly elected mayor. Uh, it was also a topic of very lively discussion. Um, as you know, uh, section 15 of the charter provides for selection of the mayor and the vice mayor by the council itself. Um, the council, this is another item that the council asked um, the committee to look at, and the committee did find it an important uh, proposal. Um, asked the committee to consider whether to amend the charter to provide for a directly elected mayor, that is, a mayor that is elected by a citywide vote. Um, after presentations and a full discussion, again, at two separate meetings, the committee voted to recommend against placing a measure on the ballot for a transition to a directly elected mayor. The vote was uh, 10 uh, against placing the measure and four still urging uh, uh, that a measure be placed on the ballot and there were four members absent that, that, at that meeting. Next slide. 
So those um, committee members that were opposed to the proposal vo voiced um, a number of different concerns. Equity concerns were really um, probably the most significant. That's what came up most often. There were concerns that the high cost of citywide election would preclude those who are less wealthy and would really work against the city's goals uh, of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, they expressed concern that the traditionally higher turnout in Northeast Santa Rosa uh, might refocus election efforts to what historically has been a powerful area. I will note that in the recent elections, we also had a good turnout in, uh, in uh, uh, western parts of town, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. But traditionally, Northeast uh, has been the strongest politically. Um, the committee members also voiced that, you know, the city, the district-based elections have brought uh, positive change uh, to the community, have brought greater uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging, both on the council and for members, um, for residents in the various areas of our community. Um, the feeling of, of those that were opposed to directly elected mayor uh, felt that moving to an at-large mayor would, re would be a step backward from that process. They also expressed that they felt that uh, it was a solution in search of a problem, that the mayors thus far, we've only had a few years, um, but the mayors thus far have been able to properly balance their role both as a district representative and as uh, a mayor for the entire city. Um, so a number of people recommended not putting a ballot measure on now, but left open the possibility that let's, let's let this play out for a little bit and maybe reconsider it in a few years when we have a better sense of how this is all playing out. Um, and again, related to that kind of problematic timing, uh, both um, in terms of the district elections, we just got through in 2020, we started in 2018 with half of the council, finished up in 2020, let's let it sit and mature for a bit and then re-examine. Um, there was also a concern in terms of timing um, that redistricting, we've redistricted in 2018, <coughs> excuse me, we are redistricted now. Although there are a number of different versions of having a directly elected mayor that, do, that would not necessarily require redistricting, but the proposal that's most often put forward is to reduce uh, council down to six council districts and an at-large mayor that would require us to do redistricting. So again, just a, an issue of timing. Next slide. I do wanna note though again that the vote was fairly close. Um, 10, uh, 10 against uh, putting a ballot measure on and seven in support and four people absent. Um, so those uh, who supported the proposal voiced advantages, and I will also comment that the committee, when hearing from two at-large mayors, one from Petaluma and one from San Rafael, uh, both of those at-large mayors really spoke very glowingly of the benefits of an at-large mayor. So those who support the proposal um, you know, noted that a directly elected mayor would be a powerful symbol and a, and a, uh, a focal point for the community. Uh, that a directly elected mayor would speak for the entirety of the community without any uh, sense of needing to also tie to their own district. Um, suggestion that a di directly elected mayor would encourage greater voter engagement. Um, and then there was a suggestion that a directly elected mayor would be better regarded um, by state and federal officials and at conferences of mayors. That was questioned a little bit by the two former mayors that were on the committee, but um, that was an issue that was raised. Um, and then um, those that supported the proposal, you know, also very strongly emphasized this would allow voters to vote for two representatives on the council. You get to vote for your district uh, council member and you would get to vote for the at-large mayor. Next slide. Um, Many of those committee members who supported a directly elected mayor, though, um, did voice concerns about the potential impacts on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And uh, several urged that if, if a ballot measure was, um, was to be um, pursued, 
that it be linked with measures uh, to mitigate the impacts on equity. And a couple of the possible mitigations that were discussed was imposing term limits on the mayor. Um, there was a suggestion that may, maybe the mayor's term would be only two years, uh, but you'd have an election every other year that way. It'd be a little bit of a challenge. And the other uh, mitigation that was um, suggested, and we'll talk about this later, um, was um, to expand voting rights to non-citizens. Um, and next slide, and that really wraps up our, that, that one wraps up our discussion on the directly elected mayor. Uh, the committee next considered ranked choice voting. So in our current system, as you know, voters vote for a single candidate. The candidate that gets the most votes wins. Um, in a ranked choice voting, voters rank candidates in order of preference. And cities do it different ways. You could say list your top three. You could say list your top five. You could say list as many as you want. Um, there's flexibility there. When the ballots are first counted, only the first choice votes are counted. If any candidate wins a majority, 50% of the votes plus one, they win the election. If no one wins a majority, the 50% uh, plus one, then the candidate with the fewest votes, th that candidate is eliminated. The registrar of voters then goes back to the ballots for only that, counts, that candidate that was eliminated, looks to who those voters placed as their second choice, takes those votes and adds it to the other candidates. If at that point any of the candidates have won a majority, the election ends at that point. If you still don't have a majority at that point, it continues on until at some point some around you have a majority. I will note that the experience in some of the other cities is if you get far beyond, you start having fewer votes overall. So um, uh, as long as you have, if you, as long as you're kind of in those top three, you're probably still um, pretty close to the original number of votes that you're working with. Next slide. So the committee um, did hear from the Registrar of Voters. Um, D Diva Marie Proto came and uh, did a wonderful presentation, explained how this all worked with charts and diagrams. Uh, and if, we, if, the, if the council decides to move forward, we will bring, uh, if we don't bring her back, we will certainly bring back uh, you know, those, that um, explanation of the process. Um, the committee also heard um, from our office um, as to the results of the ranked choice voting system in four Bay Area cities. Um, the four cities that currently use ranked choice voting are San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, and San Leandro. Um, next slide. The estimated costs, um, and again, Ms. Proto gave us this number. <coughs> Excuse me. Gave us these um, these numbers. There's a there would be a one-time investment in the software of approximately three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and then there would be an annual pro processing cost of approximately seventy thousand dollars per year. So as I said, the four Bay Area cities currently use ranked choice voting. We went through and looked at the results from 2018 and or 2020 in those four cities. We looked at 32 separate elections. Um, and uh, it, out of those 32 elections that we examined, ranked choice voting uh, changed the outcome in one election. That was a San Francisco election, I believe, for city council. And that, um, that uh, election was decided in the sixth round. So in many of the other elections, it did go beyond the first round. It wasn't, it's not that everyone in all the other uh, 31 elections, that someone won first right out, right out of the box, but rather that whoever led in that first round, they may not have had a majority, but that they led throughout and ultimately gained a majority of the votes, except for in that one election. So next slide. 
So due to the costs, the complexity, and the limited impact of ranked choice voting, the committee voted 17 to 3 against uh, pursuing a ballot measure on the issue. For those members that still favored ranked choice voting, um, those members uh, really emphasized that it would ensure broadly accepted winning candidates, that it would encourage voters to look closely at the full slate of candidates, not just their top candidate, and that it could improve it could prove important in the future. Next slide. So now we move on to voting rights for non-citizens. Again, those first three that we looked at were all um, recommendations that came to the committee from the council. They were all issues that needed, would need a charter amendment to implement and all um, had a significant possibility to be impactful. Voting rights for non-citizens came uh, from a suggestion by several committee members and it was very broadly supported um, by the committee as a whole. Um, the strong feeling was that those, that those who live, work, and pay taxes in Santa Rosa should have a voice in how the city is governed. Um, we researched um, the issue. Uh, nothing in federal or state law precludes a local jurisdiction uh, from expanding the right to vote in their own elections. It applies only to city elections, not to anything else. Um, it would require a charter amendment, um, but it, it, is, it is possible. Um, I didn't have the numbers here, but um, I will mention um, in California, San, Fr San Francisco uh, gives voting rights to non-citizens um, for school board. Um, there are a couple of other jurisdictions that are considering uh, expanding voting rights to non-citizens, including San Jose, uh, currently considering it. Um, New York City recently uh, adopted uh, an ordinance that would allow voting rights for non-citizens. And then there, I think there are 11 cities in um, the two states that are allowing it are Maryland and um, Vermont. One has 11 cities and one has two. So it is happening. Um, and it was interesting to look at the history of voting rights for non-citizens, but I won't go into that because it's a, that would be a long discussion. So, um, so next slide. Um, those who support the proposal, and again, that was the, the bulk of the committee, I really emphasize that expansion of voting rights would strengthen the community, would promote engagement, investment, and belonging. Um, they uh, uh, pointed out that absent voting rights, uh, these individuals are uh, being taxed without representation. Uh, there's a feeling that when a segment of the community is ex excluded from voting, there's a heightened risk of discriminatory policies being adopted. And then that given the high costs and long waiting periods for naturalization, prohibiting non-citizen voting is unjust and unnecessary. Really the feeling was it's just fair and right um, to expand voting rights to non-citizens. Next slide. But uh, we then heard uh, some of the logistical and cost considerations. Um, it would require an entirely separate city voter process, voting process, um, including a separate database, voter database, separate ballot, separate procedures. Uh, so we would need to establish a separate voting registration system for non-citizens. Uh, we would need to have a process for separate development, publication and distribution of the ballot containing only city elections. We'd have to have separate voting procedures, separate voting mechanics. Um, and very important to note, um, this was uh, Ms. Proto, uh, Registrar of Voters, came again and uh, very graciously spoke to us. The county cannot assist us in that program um, for some legal and, and practical reasons. They are not able to assist us. So this would all be on the city. Um, and so the costs of setting up that system, that independent city system, are unknown at this time. If the council is interested in pursuing this, we'll dive, we'll give a deeper dive into that. Next slide. What were some of the um, concerns. Um, there is a concern of a risk of potential legal challenge. 
Uh, New York City's uh, ordinance is currently under legal challenge. I haven't checked what the status is um, recently, but it, it, uh, New York City was sued. Um, there are also possible immigration risks to uh, individuals who participate, um, particularly for undocumented uh, individuals. Uh, voter regis registration records are public records. Uh, they would be available um, and accessible by ICE. Um, there's also a question even for uh, documented immigrants for individuals who are legally here there is some question um, as to whether, as to how voting in local elections might Im impact your application for naturalization. Um, in the past, and I don't know, I'm sorry, if it's still uh, in the naturalization application, um, but there is a question of have you ever voted in a federal, state, or local election. Um, what I saw in some of the other jurisdictions was just a lot of warnings to people, the sense of we're going to let individuals decide whether they want to take that risk, but a lot of uh, a notification of be aware these are some of the risks that you might uh, be undertaking. Um, we also um, looked at um, numbers of participants. Just w That was a very um, narrow focus. Um, the, there were only a couple of members of the committee that were interested uh, in that. Uh, so we did look at uh, recent San Francisco elections. Again, San Francisco allows non-citizens non who have children in San Francisco City Schools can vote in school board elections. So it's a pretty limited scope. Um, in 2018, I think it was adopted in 2016 maybe, um, I'll have to, I'll have to uh, uh, pull that out. Uh, but in 2018, so still, still fairly new, there were 81 uh, individuals who registered and only 30 who voted. Um, my recollection in looking and trying to track down some more recent numbers, those numbers did increase. Um, so the sense is that if you, when you first start the process, people may be very hesitant to participate, but perhaps um, participation grows over time. Next slide. As I mentioned, um, the committee, there was a strong support um, throughout the committee uh, for pursuing this, uh, uh, pursuing the option of expanding voting rights for non-citizens. Um, and the recommendation was to move forward with the consideration um, and really kind of handing it to council, take the next step. Um, they recommended having a study session where you'd get down into some of the details regarding what infrastructure is needed, what procedures, what eligibility requirements, uh, and what are the real costs and logistics of setting up that system. Also very much uh, encourage the council to uh, engage in a really a robust community outreach and engagement. Um, what is the interest, what is the di desires of the community. Um, and then I just note that half of those present uh, at that meeting would have preferred to have set a deadline of 2026 to place something on the ballot. So the only difference between the two groups was one, uh, about half of the committee, not quite a majority, but one half of those present said let's, let's give council a deadline of 2026. Uh, the other half said no. Um, uh, we don't know how complicated this will be. We don't know whether 2026 is reasonable. Let's leave that to council. Uh, next slide. We then moved on to um, more, uh, more of kind of the cleanup items. Um, District-based elections, um, we do recommend uh, uh, we do recommend placing this on the ballot, and we do recommend at this point at least of it being its own ballot measure. Um, we of course have transitioned fully to district-based elections, uh, but our charter still mentions at-large elections. So this is just the background. The slide, California Voting Rights Act prohibits at-large election of council members if a city experiences racially polarized voting. Racially polarized voting simply means not, uh, it's not animosity, it's simply that uh, 
a minority protected group tends to vote differently than the rest of the electorate, but because the rest of the electorate is larger, is able to over, always outweigh the protected group um, and uh, impair th that group's ability to elect candidates of their choice or to influence uh, an election. So in 2018, um, we did, uh, we were under threat of litigation, as those of you who were here in 2018 will remember. Um, we were under threat of litigation. We engaged an independent a an analyst uh, to take a look at our prior city elections. They did find that there was racially polarized voting. Um, and therefore, under threat of litigation, the council adopted an ordinance uh, to begin the transition to district-based elections. As I say, we've, we've completed that transition. We're fully district-based elections at this point. Um, next slide. So the recommendation is to revise section four of the charter um, to provide for district-based election, really to recognize and ratify the district-based election of council members, um, to provide that the district boundaries will be set by ordinance, um, that we will be required, as required by state and federal law, uh, have a decennial review of district boundaries uh, following the federal census, um, and then we'll also provide in an additional review of district boundaries is allowable uh, if the structure of council is revised. Um, and that provision is really in recognition of the idea that although the committee didn't support a direct elected mayor at this time, maybe in the future it would, um, we would need a charter amendment at that time to allow a restructuring so we might build it in uh, this time around. And uh, so this revision, um, again, will ratify what we did in 2018 and it will ensure compliance um, with the California Voting Rights Act. Next slide. Um, this is the general charter update and modernization. There's, I think, 10 or 11 items. Um, I'll have, talk a little bit more about the first two um, and then uh, go really quickly through the last few. Um, next slide. Council vacancy. I know um, there have been some discussion that we need to um, kind of clean up our appointment process. Um, and, um, but in, the, in current, our current uh, charter provision, simply provides that in the, in the event of a council vacancy, council gets to decide, are you gonna call a special election or are you going to appoint a replacement? And if appointed, uh, the appointee serves temporarily until the next election is held. Um, and uh, again, that's a council's prerogative. Um, so the committee, next slide. The committee uh, considered that, had a fair amount of discussion about the council vacancy procedures. Um, and determined to retain the current language, gives the council the flexibility uh, to address circumstances at the time of vacancy. There's an understanding that this can often, appointment can often be the quickest and least expensive means of filling the vacancy. It's temporary, it ensures that the district has representation while important decisions are being made and it minimizes the risks of deadlock in a six person council. Next slide. The primary concerns were that the appointment, an appointment can result um, in an appointment of a district representative by six individuals who don't live in that district. Uh, that if the appointment is made, it gives the appointee the advantage of running as an incumbent um, and uh, it doesn't address the perceived difficulties in the appointment process. But the committee also recognized at the end of the day that that process is set by council policy, not by the charter. So unless you want to eliminate entirely the possibility of, uh, of proceeding by way of appointment, you don't need to change the charter. You can change that policy however you want. Right now it's a, you know, it's a whole series of, 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 election, of votes, elimination votes, which can get a little bit uh, awkward. Uh, and there may be just to simply a, you know, revise that policy to provide a different voting system. Um, next slide. Frequency of charter amendments, um, 
Currently it says it's going to be reviewed in 20, 2002 and not less than every 10 years. We wanted to kind of clean that up. That it's going to be reviewed in 2002 and every 10 years thereafter. So it just really sets it as 10 years. Um, and then we would add a sentence that says, nothing in this section precludes additional amendments uh, that are be placed on the ballot by either voter initiative or by council ordinance uh, as deemed necessary. Um, I actually think that the charter provision currently impliedly allows that, um, but because there's some questions, we might as well clarify that and say, yes, we're gonna do the comprehensive review every 10 years, but in the interim, we're still free to move forward if there are charter um, provisions um, that are appropriate. And this particularly came out for the committee in terms of, you know, in the future, do we want to look at a directly elected mayor? Might we look at, again, at ranked choice voting, other elements, so. Uh, next slide. Responsibility for emergency management. Um, Currently, the charter gives the mayor a certain amount of authority during emergencies to take over. And the sense really is that's not how we work. Um, we've been through some very significant emergencies in the last five, six years. And so um, currently the city code designates the city manager as the director of emergency services. So to avoid any confusion, we would clean that all up. We'll specifically call out in the charter that the uh, city manager and uh, has lead responsibility. Um, and it will also clarify some language in the, for the police chief and the fire chief um, and for the mayor. Next slide. So these I've grouped together. The next two slides are grouping things together. I guess the next three slides. Um, these are all just elements that we're, we're looking at for, to give the city a little more flexibility in their operations. Um, the BPU to expand Board of Public Utilities, expand um, their uh, authority uh, to include stormwater and dry utilities, including electricity, broadband, and others. Again, Charter probably allows that already, but let's make it clear, uh, uh, clear that it does. Uh, in the budget, um, this was actually a recommendation from council to allow for a two-year budget. Um, so what we're proposing is a very simple change in that section that would allow the city manager to propose either a one-year budget or a multi-year budget staying with all the current procedures. So no change to procedures, it's just that the city manager can go to a multi-year budget uh, if they so desire. And then contract procurement, um, uh, looking again at just changing some language to allow greater flexibility. Next slide. Uh, clarification of three ambiguities. These are really simple. Um, city attorney just had to do with whether the three years of California practice had to be immediately preceding appointment. This would give you flex the council flexibility. If someone had three years of California practice, but Last year, they or last couple of years, they were working in another state. You could still appoint them if you so desired. Council member recall: um, there was a separate provision in the chart currently in the charter for uh, uh, filling a vacancy caused by a recall. We couldn't figure out any reason to treat that differently than any other vacancies, so we would um, change it so it'll just be filled in accordance with Section 31. And then the deputy officials. Um, of course, you appoint, you the council appoint both the city manager and the city attorney. Um, the charter says that if we decide to appoint a deputy, it's subject to your confirmation. Um, I don't think we've ever practiced that way, and so we would take out that provision. Next slide. And then also very um, important to the committee was to revise the charter um, to ensure gender uh, neutrality and also citizenship neutrality. So we'll re revise the charter throughout to ensure gender neutral language and we would also revise the charter to substitute resident for citizen throughout. That um, citizen language generally came up in connection with um, uh, with committees uh, and commissions. So that's where that comes up. Um, next slide. And we're just about done. Uh, just to mention some of the other issues that were considered. 
Um, I've mentioned before that the committee prioritized items that would require a charter amendment um, and uh, set aside those that could be accomplished by ordinance, resolution, or city initiative. So that includes a number of the items, of the 12 items that were referred over by council. One of those you're gonna hear next, um, which is the police oversight, so. Um, but then due to constraints of time and resources, um, the committee was not able to pursue discussion of the community advisory board. Um, there were some suggestions that maybe that community advisory board could be um, uh, revised to be a, a council of neighborhoods, neighborhood council, talk about uh, quorum, maybe changing quorum issues for CAB or also revising the districts, um, district boundaries. District boundaries can be done by uh, council resolution. Um, but again, the feeling on community advisory board was if we're gonna dive into that, um, we need to have a really robust uh, engagement with the community. We need to engage the, com the community advisory board. That was, that was really beyond the time and resources of the committee. Um, there was at least one individual from the public and a couple of uh, members of the committee that suggested um, maybe we should look at having a strong mayor system. Uh, that did not gain traction with the committee, so not pursued in that. And then also a member of the public suggested a lower threshold for ballot initiatives. And again, that did not, um, that would make it easier for citizens to put things onto the ballot. And that also did not gain traction. And next slide, that's it. All right, thank you so much, Sue. I'm gonna turn it over to Patty Cisco to see, uh, first of all, Madam Chair, thank you so much for all of your time and your effort in trying to corral folks. I have a hard enough time corralling six people, so I can't even imagine a, a group that large with that many ideas and such a broad mandate. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add to the presentation? Um, not really anything to add to the presentation. I'm here to support Sue. If you have any questions as to our process that I can answer, um, I'm happy to do that. I also wanna point out that Vice Chair Oliveris is there in the chambers somewhere. So um, he could also be called on if there's a, a question. Um, I do wanna say, uh, well, basically just what you said, uh, Mayor, that um, first of all, it was an honor and a privilege for me to to uh, chair this really um, just uh, a very engaged committee. And um, one of the best things about chairing this committee or any board or commission is the opportunity to see up close firsthand the excellence of our staff and uh, watching sue gallagher rob jackson jeff burke they had very very short turnaround times to give us the information we were asking for to uh you know set up uh, guest speakers to give us information and they just they just did an amazing job we have an amazing staff and likewise, Stephanie Williams, uh, Dina Manis, and Sandy Bliss just kept everything going. And uh, city staff can't be appreciated enough as to just how amazing they are and how excellent they are. Uh, we did hear from city staff members of uh, Socorro Shields and Alan Alton to, uh, as guest educators, and they were really great. Um, and, and very appreciative of the fact that uh, we had other guest speakers. Diva Marie Proto came twice, which is like really great. I mean, she's a busy lady. And um, and hearing from uh, our, our uh, directly elected mayors, uh, Mayor Colin uh, from San Rafael and Teresa Barrett from Petaluma. So um, it's just a wonderful opportunity. The staff has done an amazing job and uh, the committee, uh, took up everything you asked us to take up in some form or another and uh, prioritized what we could and um, stayed in our lane, which was to look at everything you asked us to look at. And we realize, uh, the committee realizes in handing it off to you, your lane is a bit different, that um, you have considerations as to how many ba ballot measures uh, to place on the ballot, expenses, voter sentiment, voter fatigue. So um, we welcome hearing what you do next. So thank you. All right, thank you so much, Patty. Questions from council, who wants to start? Let's start with council member Sawyer. 
I think that was Sawyer, was it not? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, just, just first, um, I'm curious about in the uh, council remuneration whether or not the rather lucrative um, benefits were discussed, the medical in insurance. What, how much discussion was there around that? And secondly, um, if we were to uh, be able to identify the, the, the full load on the, as far as the remuneration, as far as, as, far as the medical benefits, I'm curious if the, what kind of conversation was had, if any, about that reality. Uh, certainly, and, and very good question. Um, yes, we were, uh, we did discuss um, the benefits um, that councils provided. Um, as you know, that includes health benefits, dental, vision, um, retirement, mm, Life insurance, um, I, I have the list here, but quite a list of benefits. Um, we did look at the value of those benefits. The value, the dollar value varies um, from council member to council member, depending on the size of the family and so forth. Um, uh, the value ranged from about 17,000 to up to almost 33,000 uh, in terms of the benefits. Um, so yes, we did, uh, let the committee know of that. There was discussion about that. There was a recognition that yes, that's on top of uh, any compensation that, that might be decided. That was my question. Thank you for now. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Member uh, uh, oh, Go ahead, Sue. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I also realized I, I hadn't noted that, um, we did note it in the report, but not in the presentation, that the AMI, that model, um, was adopted in Berkeley um, just a few years ago, passed by the voters, um, tied the council um, member salaries to uh, AMI for a three-person household with the mayor at 100%, and for some reason, the uh, council members at 63%. Actually, apparently that was the ratio that previously had existed, so it's a little bit of an odd number, but they kept that. So just so that you're aware that that model is not, uh, you know, it wasn't just taken from thin air. So. All right, thank you. Council Member Sweatham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, I will have some comments once we hear from members of the public, but the two questions I have um, regarding council compensation, was there any discussion about boards and commission compensations, stipend or anything else like that, or was it just focused on the seven members of the council? Just focused on the seven members of the council. There may have been, uh, and either Chair Cisco or Vice Chair Oliveras, who, since he was behind me, I didn't realize he was here, but thank you very much. And, um, you, there may have been some some comments and mentions, but there was no uh, no detailed discussion of compensation for boards and commissions. And he was not in his head with everything you were saying, so he's agreeing <laughs> with you. So you couldn't see. Thank you, Patty. Was that your recollection also? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. And then a uh, question I have for the district-based election of council members uh, for our city attorney, since obviously the last charter review, they went to the voters and voters said no. What happens that we are now in district-based elections with the voters say, didn't you hear us last time? We don't think it should go in that direction. Uh, yes, and we did talk about that at the committee level as well. Um, we are, of course, hopeful that it will be ratified and we will move forward. If not, um, we will be uh, likely going to court um, seeking declaratory relief. Uh, court will then decide what a court would be looking at is the standards under the California Voting Rights Act are pretty straightforward. If you have racially polarized voting and an at-large, you can't do that. Um, but the question is, is our evidence strong enough you know, what, what was the evidence and, and did that meet the threshold for, for um, transitioning to, to district-based elections? So that's what a court would be looking at, would be in a declaratory relief um, procedure. So, and, and then if, if a court, you know, a court could go, either, you know, I mean, I, I would, I believe that our evidence was strong, that we really had very little choice. Uh, if a court was to say no, um, then we would have to look at uh, re undoing what we've done and how we undo it. Uh, that's a that that's a question. Let's hope we don't go there. Thank you, Councilmember Fleming. 
Thank you. Wow, what a big scope of work. Um, much thanks to, to you and your team, Sue, as well as your team, Patty. I'm constantly impressed by the service that people commit to our city, the uncompensated service at the board and commission level, and I think you really exemplify it. Um, I have a question about if there was any discussion around what the role of the city council is and what we represent in terms of the public's voice, how it was conceptualized amongst the committee members. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question in terms of your role. I mean, your role at this point is that you'll you'll take take this on. You'll make the decisions as to what uh, what you want us to pursue, what you want us to draft up for ballot measures. Obviously, you won't be making any final decisions today. You'll be giving dire general direction. No no formal action taken today. Um, and then, how you want to engage the public? Um, we did. You know, notice all of our meetings. Our meetings were open to the public. They were in the e evening. Uh, we we uh, did some community outreach, um, but we did not do the kind of outreach engagement, for example, that you heard um, in connection with the general plan. Um, you'll have to decide to what extent do you want to um, bolster what we had done at the committee committee level. Thank you. Um and uh, I do appreciate all that. My question was a little different, um, but I didn't do a very good job of explaining it. Um, what I'm trying to get at is, in regards to council compensation responsibilities and roles, was it really talked about what the purpose of the city council is, why we're here, and what it is that we do, and how we represent the public? That's very interesting. Um, that's an interesting question, and we really didn't. We um, we talked about, kind of, we, we talked in general terms, um, but we did not delve into that. We kind of took that as a given, mm -hmm. um, and and I, that's a very interesting uh, question, and maybe that would have been, been helpful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question I have along those lines is, was it discussed that different districts for, uh, command different levels of engagement from their representatives, and that in some cases, um, some districts have much higher needs than, per se, even the demands upon the mayor, whereas other districts have significantly lower demands for time and engagement. Um, and then the second part of that question is, was it noted, because a lot of folks, some folks on the, the char Charter Review Committee were previous mayors and council members, was it noted that the city has grown and that with the advent of social media and email, and council members carrying phones that there is a, a significant change in workload that is that has occurred over the past couple of decades. Uh, yes, uh, to both questions. Um, yes, there was certainly a recognition that the workload has increased uh, over time. Um, in terms of, and now I, I understand a little bit more about the roles and responsibilities. We talked a lot about uh, everyone agreed. Excuse me. Everyone agreed. Uh, including the mayors uh, that were former mayors that were on the committee, that being mayor is essentially a full-time job. It may not be an eight-to-five job, but it's certainly a 40-hour-a-week job. Um, the sense uh, with respect to other council members um, was a quote that was repeated a couple of times, I think a quote maybe from one of you, that, uh, or, or maybe a former council member, is that it depends on what kind of council member you want to be. So that um, some council members will be very engaged, will be uh, you know, attending uh, a committee, um, community events, really reaching out, being very responsive to their constituents. Others m might not be as engaged, and that might have to do with also what their other responsibilities are, what jobs they have, what family obligations they have, and so forth. So I'm not disparaging anyone, but there's going to be a difference in, in how much people are able to or willing to put into, into the job. So there was a recognition that setting aside the mayor, council members, um, I, I think the general estimate was probably 30 to 40 hours a week um, that, that people spend, but a recognition that that's going to vary. And I think your point of that it may vary somewhat by district as well is probably well um, well stated. Okay, and uh, I have so many questions, but I'll try to, I'll, I'll limit myself to one more, which is, 
Did the committee at all consider an hourly compensation rate so that perhaps the public could feel that they were getting the value out of their individual council members that perhaps at the end of every two week period we, we submit a time card or something of that nature rather than just a blanket pay? Um, there, there was not any discussion um, of that uh, other than to the very limited extent that one of the proposals was the uh, to tie it to the lowest salary of a city employee and the lowest paid city employee is is paid hourly fifteen dollars and eighty five cents an hour so um, but there was no real discussion of of trying to set an hourly rate for council member or mayor okay thank you I'll hold my questions okay. council member McDonald Thank you. I know I'm not sure how we're doing this if we're saving all our comments for later on and these are just um, limited to questions because I have several pages and I know you're not surprised by that, Mayor. Yeah, um, let's do questions now. We'll let the public weigh in and then we'll do comments. Great, thank you. Um, so one of the, the bullets that I saw was around unexcused absences for council, and I was wondering if that's delineated of what is considered an unexcused absence versus an absence, if there's something or language around um, council being allowed to go on a vacation, and um, if there's anything that needed to be in there around how um, we would do a reduction as far as council pay if there was a reduction by city staff such as you know we needed to do something as far as budget cuts and then how we would reinstate that if we do go through the similar process or if there's an ordinance or something that we can add language so that if you do reduce we can go back without having to go back out with the charter so that's my first question then I'll flip through and see what else I've got for you okay thank you um, in terms of unexcused absences uh, that would be to be determined by the council either within the charter or I would recommend actually to have that be you know either by ordinance or by resolution uh, in generally that in general I think the sense was that that would mean you didn't just didn't show up to a meeting you didn't have a good reason um, you haven't been excused uh, by the council as a whole um, but that could take any shape that the council um, desired in terms of reduction in council pay um, for to parallel a reduction in city um, in city pay um, again the details would have to be worked out um, you'd have to the council would have to take some form of action I would recommend that it not be embedded in the charter in order to give you flexibility and that that would be implemented by a council policy or by an ordinance as to how that would play out and then as far as the service of the mayor and um, was there any consideration over the length of the term of the mayor that was selected by council which I believe right now is a two-year term but was there any consideration around having a mayor that would be selected for perhaps a one-year term with the ability to increase that to maybe up to three years or any consideration around doing things a little bit differently if we were um, there was a concern after a year. I'm just curious if that was ever brought up or if it was just to keep it as current status quo. There wasn't, um, well, I'll answer both ways. There wasn't a specific discussion of keeping the existing system and changing it in terms of how many years of service for what the term is for a mayor. There was a suggestion that, again, didn't get traction of um, uh, eliminating the two that you can't serve exec consecutive terms <clears throat> excuse me uh, so that it would allow a mayor to to serve a second two-year term when we talked about the directly elected mayor there was discussion of having a two-year term for for a directly elected mayor thank you and then around voting rights for non-citizens um, was there any discussion around the like our legal obligations to ensure the protection of non-citizens if we were to move forward on voting. I know that that was something that you suggested that we needed to do a study session or was there anything brought up that council should be aware of for us to move forward. I know there was conversations with the registrar of voters and how that would work with them but just ensuring to all of our residents that we would be able to protect them in some way or, or that we were aware of perhaps some unintended consequences around 
around, I think you said, around nat naturalization. And so I want to make sure that before we would move forward or for consideration of something like that, that the council would be, you know, very aware of what we could be potentially doing to our residents and making sure that they feel protected and safe if we move forward on that. Yes, and and the the ex we did talk about that in the committee, um, and again, what I saw in other just jurisdictions was really about giving people notice, a sense of we'll let you decide your own risk, but be aware that there are some risks. Okay, and my last question is around um, council member recall or removal of a council member if there's been um, some type of egregious act or something that's been noted. Is that something that was discussed during the charter review process that we would be able to remove somebody by vote of the council or does that need to go back out to voters? Um, it was it was not discussed in any uh, length. It was on the list that came from the council, um, and uh, it just didn't it didn't rise to the prior, to a priority. So the, the committee did not take it up. But it would actually require a charter amendment uh, to uh, to give council members the right to remove a fellow council member or mayor. Right now, you have the ability to remove someone from the mayorship or the vice mayorship, but not to remove them from the council itself. Um, there are a lot of due process um, requirements that would have to go into removal from, um, from the council itself. So it's not an easy process, and it would need to be embedded into the charter. Any other questions? Mr. Vice Mayor. Piggybacking on, on some of the questions that have been asked in regards to the, uh, the San Francisco issue with, with immigration, has any of those concerns been brought to fruition for any of the residents of San Francisco that we know of? It, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, I did not do extensive research. Um, if we move forward and bring back mm -hmm. a study session, that is something that we would look at. And not just in San Francisco, but in some of the other communities as well. That, that they're uh, allowing that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Let's go ahead and go to public. Uh, go ahead, He's, Council Member Fleming. One last quick question about uh, non-citizen voting. What was the nature of the legal challenges or a couple of the top legal challenges in other jurisdictions where they had uh, allowed for non-citizen voting? Um, I'm not familiar with the details. Um, there was an allegation of constitutional violation in giving non-citizens a right to vote, um, but uh, my own research indicated that there isn't anything in federal or state law that would preclude a local jurisdiction, um, but I'm, we will certainly be tracking uh, that litigation and see where it goes. I'm not familiar with any other litigation that has happened, but um, we'll do a deeper dive in, into that as well. Thank you so much. And, and Mr. Mayor, before we go to public comment, may I um, just expand on my response to Councilmember Schredhelm's um, question about what happens if the voters turn down um, a district elections? I think I left it out that the we would be transitioning back, and I think probably what the most likely way that the court would tell us to do that would be as people's terms expired their replacements would be at large. So very similar to how we did the transition to districts, we would be transitioning uh, back as people's um, terms expired. Again, hopefully we don't get there, but that is a possibility. No, I appreciate that. And I think uh, myself and anybody who'd been through those discussions in 2018 feel highly confident that we would uh, be told by, by judges uh, that we had made the right move. With that, yes, see if the there's any and I was just going to say, uh, I was going to say, judges um, across the state have generally um, ruled that way. So, yeah, I, I believe uh, I believe you're being generous. I think the track record of people fighting a CBRA allegation is 100% uh, uh, lost and 0% won. Correct, I believe. All right, let's go to public comment. And Sandy, if you wouldn't mind uh, facilitating. Sure, thank you. Um, we're now taking public comments on item 3.2. If you wish to make a comment in person, please put your name in the administrator um, at the top of the well or via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. 
You'll have three minutes for your comment and a countdown timer alert at the conclusion of that period. Um, and our first speaker is um, Eric Frazier, followed by Alan Worstel. And Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and City Council. <clears throat> Boy, that was really, I mean, today's action packed with the stuff that you have to do, and I can really respect that. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Sawyer, for bringing up the council compensation to include health care. And I have to say I'm a little bit offended that that was uh, omitted from the presentation because I think that is a pretty big chunk of compensation and shows how friendly, family friendly, the current plan is. It leads me to believe that actually there should be an amendment to the charter that requires information that's used in the process of making policy and offered up by staff or elected officials it needs to be factual and complete under penalty of perjury. Information that is not verified as factual can be labeled as speculative opinion and so on. Furthermore, reports should be reviewable with updates, counterpoints, and revisions attached to the digital document uh, when stored on the city's hard drives. And the reason for this is that really when we talk about things being done in the city, typically we're battling back against misinformation, lack of information, even politically inspired propaganda and stuff that's really ideological. I think voters really insist that their elected officials traffic in facts whenever possible and have positions that are just defensible by facts. This begins with the information being known. And that leads me back to my offense over the, this presentation lacking some information. Let me also say that <clears throat> some other issues here. We ask whether the city council should be a full-time profession. Maybe they just need more staff support. If comparable cities have, uh, you know, sort of uh, average fee that's already equal to the city when given the adjustments that should have been sought over the years, I don't know why they weren't. Why would we want to go to a higher level that just sort of encourages full-time employment? Uh, furthermore, I'm, there doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion about the influence of political money in elections. So right now, a lot of political money is used to elect people that are, don't earn very much. Would that political money be less or more if the person being elected was paid more? I'm all for a directly elected mayor. Uh, for one reason, it's because of recall. For instance, with a ceremonial mayor, uh, that person can be recalled for less than $15,000 because they only need 20% of the vote in their district, whereas an at-large uh, mayor would be subject to a, um, it, that, that campaign would be much more expensive. And by the way, I think a recall effort names the uh, person to replace the recalled party. So, but I think a lot more work is done in outreach and development. Thank you. Alan Worstall, please. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name's Alan. I'm calling from Santa Rosa. And uh, I live in Roseland. And so I'm someone that has benefited from going to district elections um, because before that, we never had anyone from our community or not even usually our side of Highway 101 uh, to represent us. Uh, everyone who represented us was from Benna Valley or Rankin Valley or somewhere way to the east and, you know, from way wealthier communities than us. Uh, so I'm I'm really hoping that we uh, keep the district-based elections. And, I mean, I just have to wonder with, um, you know, who's uh, scared about us having district-based elections. Someone must obviously be because the Santa Rosa Police Department has – uh, harassed our representative from our district, and now there's talk about um, removing district elections entirely. So uh, I guess whatever you're doing, Eddie, keep it up because it's scaring people. Thank you. I relinquish my time. OK, 
Okay, I see uh, Logan Pitts. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, just want to thank the city council uh, and the mayor for appointing a great charter review committee. I also want to thank our chair and vice chair. And I think one of the things that was noted about the committee was how uh, diverse and representative it was of the city. Um, I think that that showed all the different neighborhoods, all the different uh, demographics, and it was it was a great thing to see in Santa Rosa city government. It's something that we don't always see um, and we should strive towards. And I think that when you look, especially at the vote for increased council compensation, you saw that diversity represented. Um, some people thought it was too low. Some people thought it was too high, uh, but a majority thought it was the right amount. And I'm hoping that's what we'll see if you do decide to take that to the voters in November. Um, so again, just wanna thank uh, the mayor thanked the council for embarking on this process. Uh, it was a lot of fun and uh, good luck uh, with figuring out what to place on the ballot. All right, thank you, Sandy. Oh, it looks like we've got one more hand. Okay, um, Michael Titone. Sorry. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Just really brief. Um, I'm someone who was deeply in favor of district elections because it does allow parts of the community that generally don't get represented to have representation. And we need to just keep it that way. I know that there's an effort to turn away from district elections, and that is taking us away from equity, and it's taking us in a direction that concentrates power in the white and the wealthy uh, citizens of Santa Rosa, and we absolutely can't afford to do that anymore. So please keep district elections, please. Uh, fairly compensate representatives so that we can get better members and members who are, um, you know, who actually represent the community um, and ha don't, you know, aren't independently wealthy. Um, we need their voices because that's the kind of people that make up the city. Thank you. see uh, one more hand uh, Alexa hi there my name is Alexa Forrester and I just was calling in support of continuing district-based elections and also paying our city council a lot more I think that you have really hard jobs and it's really trying times and I would like um, you to be able to be fairly compensated for your work and I'd like um, whenever you all decide to move on, I'd like to be able to attract top talent um, and not have it be restricted to people who have, um, you know, independent wealth or something like that. So um, just wanted to support those two aspects of this. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Sandy, do we have any people uh, looking to make comment in the chambers, perhaps uh, the vice chair. Um, he's he's rising and going to the podium. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just here to answer any questions if there were any, but again, I want to reiterate the comments made by our, our chair uh, about the wonderful process. Uh, you know, I've been associated with the city since 1979, uh, and I have seen a lot of changes in our community, but I tell you by far, uh, as far as a process and community engagement in something that is uh, very important and critical to our community, uh, the work that you put together, all of you, in appointing this, uh, this body to review the charter was amazing. Uh, you know, sometimes we look at uh, 
recruiting people that have some uh, overall knowledge, I guess I would say people that are within the bubble of local government, uh, but what happened this time around is that there was such diversity, uh, including the, the strong voice of youth who came together, and I think that allowed us to really look at uh, new ideas. Uh, and maybe even sometimes to take a risk at exploring something new. And I think you saw that already with some of the recommendations that have, that have come forward. Uh, so I, I wish you well in the process. You have some very important decisions to make, uh, but it's not over. We'll have other opportunities as well. And I think one critical piece of that was that clarification in not having to wait 10 years to do this again. So hopefully that will be something that you will consider uh, to leave the door open to be able to continue with this process and to continue with the uh, engagement engagement of our community, so thank you. Um, Mayor, I don't see anybody else rising in the chamber and we have no uh, voicemail public comment. Perfect, I'll bring it back then to the council. Councilmember McDonald, I'll start with, uh, actually before we go to comments, uh, Sue, if it'd be helpful, can you please frame for us what type of feedback you are looking for? Sure. Um, what we are looking for is really some direction from the council as to which of the elements you would like us to move forward with. Um, we will then start putting together a package uh, to bring to you in June. I apologize, I don't remember the exact date, uh, but we'll bring that package to you. You'll then be able to evaluate and, and make your you know, make more decisions then, and of course then at, on uh, July 12th would be your final decision as to what goes on the ballot. But what I'm looking for now is of this, of this list, what would you like us to move forward with? All right, thank you so much. We'll start with Council Member McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. So um, council pay was one of the first items you asked for us to consider, and um, certainly this is something that needs to be well thought out. Um, I do believe that it is an equity issue for us to address. That's certainly if you are independently wealthy or you have a means of a secondary income, um, it certainly makes it much easier to serve in a role that takes 40 to 50 hours a week. So I think that looking at salary needs to be um, part of our conversation. I do want to ensure that when you talked about benefits, when you looked at the medium um, price of what our employees get, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that well, but what their, their median salary is, did you include benefits in that 95,000 with the lowest around 62,000? And no, we didn't include benefits in any of those uh, numbers that were on that slide. So, so you're saying that, a, on top of that the median for a city employee is 92,000 plus health benefits. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. So while my main concern is that if we move to that sort of pay, we're doing such a massive jump for council that it could preclude us from being able to do some of the programs. And while it's such a small percentage of the overall city budget, budget I'm not sure if that's been included in next year's budget, and that was a question I had sent forward. And so my concern would be that we'd have to do a mid-year adjustment if that was actually voted on. So I'd like to see us have a conversation around some different prices of what it would be perhaps from the lowest paid employee in between the median price range. Uh, I'm comfortable with us just doing what the charter says where it's $800 plus adding that 5%. Um, but, but I do see this as a major equity issue. It's a former single mom in this community as a former person who was raising three small children. There would be no way that I could have served in this role with the amount of hours it takes to do the job well and be able to be, um, to afford to do it. And we don't want to make a decision based upon my current situation or any of the council members' current situation. We really want to think about this in terms of future and who we can attract for the these roles. So that, that would be some of my feedback. As far as the mayor's position, I would like to look at the opportunity for council to have a term of one to three years for a mayor's position. So currently I know the charter has a language that we have somebody that can be in there for two years, but no more than two years at a time. But I think that um, from a council's perspective, we should have the opportunity to 
put in a mayor that could be there maybe perhaps another year if they so chose to serve in that role and in fact not have them serve past a year if, if perhaps um, it wasn't the right fit for them. As far as the ranked choice voting, um, that was a secondary item or a third item on my list. Um, with one change for ranked choice voting, my concern would be around the cost to taxpayers and implementing a system. So I would not be in favor of ranked cho choice voting at this time, but think that it's something we should keep an eye on. Um, I am highly interested in ensuring that we hear the voices of voting from non-citizens. Um, specifically when it comes to school board elections or city council elections, but I do want to make sure that our community members feel safe in doing so. And so I think that your idea of having a study session and an in-depth look at perhaps any legal repercussions that could be brought to our, our, our residents would be very important to me. I'm fine with the timeline of 2026, but that's only after seeking feedback from our current community members so that they do not feel disenfranchised from here until 2026. I want to ensure that they do feel that they have a voice and a sense of belonging in our community. They are buying things, their children go to our schools, and so that's very important to me that they feel that they have a voice in our community. So, um, but, but that said, I want to make sure that we do it with the protection of that. Um, I would like to also look at DACA and seeing if DACA um, residents would be able to vote. I know currently they can go to school, they can receive grants for that, but is there any language around that if we have any DACA residents um, so that they maybe perhaps could vote and even if we had to invest in that. District-based elections, 100% in favor of, that is the law, that's what we should be doing, that's what we need to confirm in um, our charter and that needs to be clarified to community members and I don't believe that any of the council has any um, plans to repeal that of moving uh, the work that we've done to move forward and so I really hope that our residents feel confident that we are leaning towards making sure that's just affirmed in the charter for the process that we're currently using. Um, for council vacancy, what I'd like to just see is how the voting is done, the process of filling vacancy when we're in chambers as being a victim of that this last time. I would say that clarification needs to be done of how the voting works. It feels a little bit like ranked choice voting, but it's not clear for the person that's applied for the position, and I don't know that it's as clear for the council. So I think having that, if it needs to not be in the charter, I'm fine with that, but perhaps an ordinance or language that supports what's in the charter would be um, important. All the other cleanup language that you mentioned, the BPU, the budget, the contract procurement, emergency management of uh, our city manager, I'm, I think cleaning up the charter language, this is a great opportunity and then to keep track of those things that we see as problematic and being able to bring that back to voters and not waiting the 10 years in between that would also be of interest. I see our charter as the bylaws that govern the city, and so limiting us to a 10-year process is not healthy, I think, for a city. So being able to bring that back as needed would be um, of interest to me. I do want to say thank you for making sure that the language is gender and citizenship neutral throughout the entire document and making sure that that's done. In fact, in every ordinance that we bring forward from here out would be um, important to me and important, I believe, to the council as well. And um, with that, I think that covered most of my notes. I had some, but I, I got them all down. But thank you so much. A huge shout out to the Charter Review Committee for their intense work and, and really to you and your team, Sue, for all of the staff that brought together all the attachments. Um, for those that are at home, if you look at the attachments that the Charter Review Committee looked at, it was several pages of examples. And so I just want to say thank you so much for such an in-depth process. It was a great learning process for me and hopefully for our community members as well. Thank you, Council Member. Let's go to Council Member Fleming. Thank you very much, Mayor. So 
What I wish is that we could do a study session on each of these specific items because I think rolling them all into one conversation here is, is a big lift for both staff and the council. However, with that and um, with a mind toward the fact that we have to get something done by July 12th, I will be proceeding with my comments here. Um, I'll start with, I'll go in order that I see them here. For council compensation, I think we certainly need to, to look at this. Um, it's pretty unanimous that, um, that we do need to change something about this. I think that we need to be mindful in how we do it in that um, without a directly elected mayor, you know, some council members may be spending as much time as the mayor doing their jobs. And so I'm um, not sure that we want to undervalue the work that council members do and, or create a two-tiered system unless the mayor is direct elect. And that we need to be mindful that the role of the city council is to express the public's voice here at the table. And that if we decline to compensate the council at, at area median income, we're really sending a message to the community that their voice is not as valuable as say other city employees. And furthermore, um, at the end of the day, it will be the community that makes this decision. So I think that we ought to put out there something that's reasonable um, without fear and then allow the, the community to make a decision that reflects their desires. As far as a directly elected mayor, I tend to lean toward a directly elected mayor. And the reason why is that we're starting to see with the advent of fully districted, a fully districted city, that there are um, more increasing uh, prevalence of, of provincial concerns, which is only normal and natural. And as a city council member, I would love to be able to turn to a mayor and ask them to lead us in a direction that reflects the entire well-being of the city without concern for um, a, a specific subset of people and allow the work of the protection of the specific subset of people to fall to their council member. So to that end, I, I would like to see a four-year term for perhaps with accompanying term limits as we see in other cities across the Bay Area. For, for a directly elected mayor. For ranked choice voting, I, I do see its limitations. Um, I also, I really like ranked choice voting. I think it gives people more options. I'm, I'm on the fence about it just because of the examples given during the presentation today. I could go either way. I do think that it would produce more equitable outcomes. And so if, you know, really pressed, I would say we should go with ranked choice voting. Um, I'm completely in support of voting rights for non-citizens um, with the warnings and um, disclaimers provided to potential voters. And then with district-based elections for council members, I think that there's really no question that we're already there and that if we were to return to how things were before, we would end up um, in legal trouble. So um, the one thing actually that I think didn't get a lot of attention and that I'm really not ready to make a decision on now is a charter update and modernization. There were quite a number of specific detail changes, some of which on their face sound great, like gender neutrality. Of course, that's really important. Um, and, and the potential to have uh, more frequent revisions to the, the charter. But then there's other things that I found really concerning, like the fact that the city council had the right to approve uh, deputies, but we haven't been doing that practice. So I think we need to review the delta between the operational realities of the city as set forth in the charter and the practice and, and not just willy nilly just sweep up a whole bunch of things that need to be cleaned up today. And that when we, if we do have an opportunity to bring that back and look at it, that we also do some of the stuff that didn't get addressed during the, the charter review process that have to be done by um, charter review, particularly quorums um, around boards and commissions that in my mind sometimes deprive um, petitioners of their, their rights to have say a change made in a historic property because of lack of quorums or the community advisory board having a different requirement than say 
the Cultural Heritage Board. And so I think we ought to really take a strong look at how those function before just, you know, foregoing our, our once in a 10 year opportunity to make those adjustments. Um, I have plenty more to say, but I will not take up more of your time. Once again, thank you so much to the community, to the staff, and to the Charter Review Committee. Thank you, Council Member. Let's go to Council Member Swedhelm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Again, I want to echo the compliments of this process, and I really do appreciate uh, the thoroughness of your presentation. And I've had several conversations during this process with not only my appointees, but others on the committee, and they're very complimentary of all the information that they're processing. So, uh, job well done. So, <clears throat> I also want to give my overall impression that, um, and I said this from the get go, we established this 21 person committee to dive into this, and if I were to ask you, Sue, you didn't give us an hour, you know, how many hours did you, your staff, and the committee member collectively come use to come up with these recommendations? So I'm supportive of all the recommendations as a council member, because that's the process we set up. I may have some differences of opinion what the council chooses uh, to put on the ballot as a voter of Santa Rosa, but from the process perspective, I'm supportive of all the recommendations, and I'll go through some of my pros and cons um, but with that overall category, like um, I will be supportive of moving forward as recommended by the committee. Regarding the council uh, compensation, the first item, there's two areas that um, raise concern for me. One was transparency, the other one was equity. Transparency, I, I, no one knows how much each of us put in towards our duties as a council person. You know, some of us are on regional boards, some of us aren't. Um, so I'd be a proponent, let's change the system. If we're gonna start compensating, do time cards, right? So the voters can know. If we're talking about transparency, let's not make assumptions. I've heard we've said uh, several times during this meeting, 30 to 40 hours, I've heard 40 to 50 hours. One way to confirm that, and again, having been a manager within this organization, that's why we have time cards. And that is when someone signs that time card, you're saying this is the amount of time and energy and hours I put towards the accomplishing the city's goals. So I would like, if we do go in that direction, I would like that you know, for future con uh, conversations. And then w with the equity, it really strikes me as um, being different. Why are we just applying this to the city council? We look at our planning commissioners and you know, uh, former chair Cisco and chair of this committee, Cisco. How many hours does she put in either on planning commission, charter review, and they're not even getting medical benefits? And you look at you know, the BPU, planning commission, design review, cultural heritage, I just think it, it, that's not being very equitable if we say, nope, council, we should be getting compensated for what we're doing for the city. Well, what about the dozens of others on boards and commission to do it? And again, for me, that's not a recommendation for uh, from this charter review committee, but for me, I'd really want to entertain, let's do stipends. I know the county has done that. I think they did that with their redistricting. For every meeting, you got 100 bucks to help compensate for some of those other areas that made it challenging for some people to get to those meetings. So I'd really be interested in entertaining that, again, from the equitable uh, equity perspective. Uh, then direct elected mayor, uh, I agree with the, sub, or with the um, Charter Review Committee's suggestion that we don't need one. I think it's a, uh, having been in a variety of roles, both as a council member and as a mayor, I think the current process works. And I really think it's most appropriate given a two year term because we get a new council every two years. So each of the seven members of each council get to elect who they wanna have as their mayor and vice mayor. I, I think it's a wonderful system that works and I think it served the city well. So I agree with the uh, committee suggestion. Same thing with ranked choice voting. I don't think the city of Santa Rosa is ready for that. Regarding voting rights for non-citizens, um, I, I would I like their recommendations. Let's explore more about this. What are the practical implementations of it? The one caveat I would say, and I'm guessing this would probably fall within the 2023 uh, list of priorities. I'm not sure how the city manager or who, how much staff time would it take for a study session on this topic? Um, and I would just encourage the next council, if that's gonna be a council priority to schedule that, Let's do that so we can balance it amongst the other priorities that we are tasking city staff with. And then with some of the uh, charter update and modernization, um, I, I agree with everything that the subcommittee or charter review committee is putting forward. Regarding the general neutrality, and I also add my voice, if that could be on every document that we have, including presentations, because I know later today we'll have somewhere we're not using the general uh, gender 
neutral language. So I would say if we're going to start with the charter, let's try to implement it so we're all talking the same sort of language. Once again, thank thanks to the committee, Sue, to your staff. Uh, this is a great job. I'm looking forward to the d next discussions we're deciding what actually, if anything, will go on the ballot. Thank you, Council Member. Let's go to Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. And I also want to thank um, our city attorney and everyone who worked on the presentation, very comprehensive. Uh, it's, it's a, and the, the committee, I mean, it just, it goes without saying. It's, this was a, um, an enormous amount of work and something that um, only happens right now every 10 years, but uh, if things come up, I think it's, um, I, I think it's uh, worthy of, of uh, considering that having the council consider um, other issues that could come forward that shouldn't wait 10 years. So I agree with virtually everything, uh, all of the recommendations that came out of the committee. Um, but I do have a process question about the council compensation. And although I am in favor of increasing the council compensation, it's, it's very clear that our current rate of remuneration is um, not uh, reflective of the amount of work that council members do, especially the mayor. Um, but I'm curious about how it would be, I'm not in favor of a $92,000. I'm not in favor of a half a million dollars going to the council every year. I'm just not, I'm just, I think that there's a, 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 a sweet spot in there that I would be in favor of, but I would be uncomfortable um, with that half million dollars going to council um, pay. I don't think it should be an occupation. Um, we, it's very easy to see in Washington the results of, of, of politicos or politicians having a, an occupation. Um, the, I think it's, it's not in the spirit of, of what we do as a council. But back to the remuneration. If, if it's on the ballot, is it going, if, you know, assuming that we move forward with all of the recommendations for the, for the council, or that that becomes the vote of the council, is this the, the, the taxpayers who are paying the bill um, would see, or are they going to see um, these numbers, the 92,950 for the mayor and the 61,347 for the council members plus benefits? How will it be articulated on the ballot? Or if, and that may be a question for the future, you may not know right now how that would happen, but not giving the taxpayer or the voters, RE taxpayers, the options, they may out of hand just say no. And we would be right back where we started, wondering why it is that the, the, the community is so resistant to paying council members more money. It is, a, it is it has shown to be a difficult lift by the, by the voters. So do you have a sense of, of, of uh, whether or not it could show options or is it just going to be a recommended, what, just a single number for the mayor and a single number for the, for the council members? How, how would it go forward? Thank you, council member. Um, it would go forward on the ballot um, by the, the ballot measure itself would simply state kind of the formula I've been saying. So it would state if you went with the committee's recommendation, it would be that the mayor will be paid 100% of AMI for a three person household and council members will be paid uh, two thirds of AMI for a three person household and then whatever other provisions you want to include in there. That would be what the ballot language would provide. Um, the actual language in the charter would be also part of the ballot measure. Um, in terms of the actual dollar amounts and the um, and the uh, issue of the benefits, um, that's going to be in the materials. Um, I don't know sitting here today. I don't know how that gets incorporated in, into the ballot materials. But even if the city didn't put it in, that's all going to be made public. Um, and I would recommend that we be upfront. This is what this means. This is what the ballot measure means. Uh, if it were passed. Um, in terms of giving options, we're not able to give options on a ballot measure because the ballot measure is either yay or nay. It doesn't, yeah, I mean, yeah. 
I figured there was probably no place yeah. for options. Yeah, there um, is a there is a way, but it, I don't recommend it, which is that you have a couple of ballot measures on there, and the voters can can vote yes for the one they like. Then you have to include in each ballot measure that whichever one gets the most votes is the one that prevails. Uh, it l can lead to voter confusion. Why are these different options on there? Uh, so I, um, it's po it's possible you could do that. You could decide to do that, but it does raise some just practical problems. Yeah, I think the the length of our ballots these days. Um, I the last thing I would want to do is create um, ballot confusion or voter confusion. Um, so I do have a difficult. I have difficulty with this with this recommendation because of the amount. Um, I just think it's it's a it's a it is a big reach, and I I fear especially. And I think it should be shown exactly how much that amount would be. I think that if we don't, I mean, we show how much the city manager makes. We show how much the city attorney makes. I mean, it's all public knowledge. Um, but on a but on a ballot. Um, I think that but by not showing that amount, I think it is um, not giving a complete and accurate and truthful um, picture of exactly what we're talking about, which is these numbers. So, um, or whatever they might be when it hits the bat, when it hits the ballot, or the it, you know when it, it goes it, before the voters. Sure, and if I may, um, on any ballot measure, the city attorney's office needs to prepare an impartial analysis. Um, and that is one uh, place where we could add in, and I think we would add in what the dollar amounts are and what the other benefits are. So it would not show on the, the uh, well, actually, the, the, it, the space is limited for the, it wouldn't it's, be limited. It's very limited. Yeah, that's right. It yeah. would just be yay or nay on going forward with the, with the, with, with the, with the um, package, I guess. Um, so that's the only place that I really have um, anxiety about is the is the compensation. Um, I want it increased, and I probably would go with the average of comparable cities, um, maybe a little more. Um, I know the work it takes to be mayor. It is it is a full time job, um, but I again I would be concerned with turning that position into an occupation, um, and I think that's what we would be ending up with um, if we went for the full vote. Um, and that's, this doesn't even reflect the, the um, benefits. So it's not just five, it's not just a half a million dollars, it's a half a million dollars plus benefits. So I, I would be concerned what programs you might have to reduce or eliminate, even though it is only a small part of, the, of our overall budget, it is not a small amount of money. And um, it could indeed, uh, during budget times, force uh, councils in the future uh, to make uh, decisions um, in, in programs that they might not otherwise have to make had we not gone so, had we not made it so lucrative. So thank you, I'll stop there, thanks. All right, thank you, council member. We'll go to the vice mayor. Thank you, mayor. Uh, I'll start with ranked voting. Uh, I believe it's only changed one out of 32 elections. So I can't see myself justifying uh, supporting. Uh, in regards to the charter update and moderniz modernization, I agree with the suggestions. In fact, I, I, I think we did a great job on our last on our last go about it. Uh, in regards to uh, mayor at large, I don't think we're ready for it. I think people are barely learning what our district elections look like, our district lines look like. So I, I, will, I wouldn't like to confuse people even more. And as Council Member Schwellheim stated, I think we've done a good job about electing our, our mayor. I know we've done a great job uh, on this round. And hopefully you, you guys did a good mayor, uh, job with the vice mayor as well. Uh, in regards to, to equity, um, we are the leaders of the North Bay. I'd like to see this issue studied further and, and in regards to, to our citizens. Uh, having the right to vote. Uh, in regards to district-based elections, I'd like to say thank you. Hopefully I've done uh, the people that voted for me and those that didn't vote for me uh, right. Um, I assure you that regardless of the negative experiences, the, great, the good ones have been much greater and I would gladly do this job for free. Uh, having said that, I know that there are plenty of people in my community who are better equipped, more capable than I, to sit here in this chair that I take up currently. 
uh, but they might be restricted for financial reasons. I don't know what that what that concept con, uh, what's the word we've been using all day and I said compensation. How can I forget such an important word? Uh, what that concept <laughs> and I just forgot the word again. <laughs> non nonetheless, though, the, the 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 compensation that people deserve for the for representing their community, it has no bounds. What it looks like if it's fifteen eighty five an hour, and as as Councilman Shoham stated, we get a we get a clock. Uh, that's great, and and stipends for for the other council for the other uh, boards as he stated, that would be great. I mean, at least for the gas, as we know, it's so expensive for people to make it up from point A to point B. I guess my only question with that one is, is would there be a limitation of hours of operation? Uh, I'm known to to reside with my constituents out in public. Uh, so hopefully it's not a nine to five job, right? Uh, and I believe I've already mentioned the, the, the charter update and modernization. Uh, lastly, Sue, Stephanie, uh, former Mayor Olivares, and uh, Patty, hopefully my appointees weren't too much trouble, uh, maybe just a little bit, but hopefully not too much. Uh, with that, I, I say thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Vice Mayor. And again, I wanna echo the thank yous to our team, uh, everybody who participated. Uh, huge thank you to the city attorney's office for all of the work, but also I wanna make sure we give a, a round of applause for our city clerk team as well who we know how understaffed they are and how big of an undertaking this is so thank you so much stephanie and dina and sandy and everybody else who's, who's participated uh, thank you to our very good and very dedicated charter review committee it's not easy for folks who don't do government speak day in and day out to to grapple with a lot of these topics and uh chair cisco your team that that you had was 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 on it and i got a chance to watch most of the meetings uh, that you were having it was a highly engaged group who was very intellectually curious about the topics that were at hand and i think did the the public justice in having the discussions and making recommendations uh, that they sent towards us and one of my favorite things too was watching people disagree and, it, and just acknowledging when they didn't actually know uh, how they felt about an issue. And there were some, some difficult issues that you brought forward. I'm gonna start by actually calling out uh, one of the, the charter recommendations that I think is the low key, uh, most influential one that we have in here. And that's gonna be uh, clarifying that you can make charter amendments more frequently than every 10 years through the charter review process. And I think that that gives us some leeway to acknowledge that uh, our city charter is evolving uh, as we grow into a bigger city and as we decide how our governance needs to best meet the needs of the public that we serve. Uh, I think that's a really critical one, Sue, and, and so I wanna thank you and your team. I know you guys combed through the charter and I know how much work it was working with our department heads and with our leadership team to identify areas of need. Uh, so I'll be very supportive of, of pretty much all of these that you put together, though I'm waiting to see obviously some of the the, the discussion and some of the language and some of the conversation with the public about them. Uh, ranked choice voting, uh, I'm a huge fan of. Uh, I was really uh, excited to ask the charter review to review this one. Uh, I did watch the, the meeting and it became apparent very quickly that there's gotta be a bigger educational campaign around it uh, to make sure that folks understand the why as well as the how uh, before we would make that move. So I get the, the recommendation from the, the charter committee uh, not to move forward at this point with it. Uh, that made sense to me, particularly after watching the discussion, though I do love ranked choice voting overall. I think it's a good system. Uh, district elections, nobody's coming for district elections from the dais. We all, I think, have moved into them seamlessly. We all appreciate the benefits that they have, but I do uh, support having the, the cleanup language that's on there uh, just to, to continue to protect the city. Uh, but I think that we have a good case to be able to sell to the public on the importance of district elections. Uh, I am uh, where I will disagree with the charter committee, uh, some of the charter committee, most of the charter committee is on the uh, at-large mayor discussion. Uh, I think that having an at-large mayor would benefit the community in ways that, uh, in ways that weren't really discussed. Uh, first and foremost, I think particularly if you have a two-year at-large at uh, mayorship that you end up having 
um, you have a reason for people to show up and vote every single time. And I think w when we did our district elections, I think that you saw uh, a huge disparity based on which election cycle people uh, were, were asked to vote. And in fact, we structured our districts and the sequencing of our districts specifically around maximizing participation in districts that were underrepresented or had folks that saw a significant drop out drop off from one ballot to another. The drop off on people who, who return a ballot between a gubernatorial and a presidential election in Oakmont is about 3%. It, it goes from about 100% to about 97%. Uh, almost everybody votes almost every election. But if you look at the drop off in Roseland between a gubernatorial election and a presidential election, it is severe. I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I think it was almost 30% of the electorate. By giving people a reason to be excited, to show up and to not just vote for who's going to do the work in their neighborhood, but who is going to have the overall vision for the city, I think is a really important thing in a city of Santa Rosa's size. size. It, it's part of how we can continue to have conversations about the need for developing additional housing while also still giving neighbors an opportunity to make housing projects better by talking about the impact that they'll have for them on the, on the, the street. Uh, to me, it's two sides of the, the same coin. So I'm very supportive of an at-large mayor program, uh, particularly if it's two years uh, directly elected. Council pay, uh, this was the obvious one for all of us when charter review came up. Uh, I joke with people all the time that it had become uh, the half written portion of the goodbye speech from council members when they are leaving the dais for the last time, uh, talking about how important council pay would be in the future. Uh, the future is now. I think that the challenge that we run into is how do we make sure that we talk about the impact that uh, the current compensation has on the ability of people to serve without clouding the discussion around uh, the specific decisions that are currently being made from the dais. And I think because uh, what I'd like to do is continue to talk about how council pay benefits the community long term, uh, 10, 20 years down the road, uh, and not tie it to individual council members. I think that part of the discussion needs to be the sequencing of when council members get paid as well. Uh, and I know that it creates equity issues and it creates a disparity amongst council members, but I think that existing council members should not get the council pay until they've had a chance to go back to the public and say, this is the job that I've done for you. This is what you are now going to be paying for, which is different than what you originally elected me to do, and let them make a decision about who their best representative is. I think that if you had it so that council members immediately received the pay upon the, the, the public uh, being asked to do so, uh, I think that you create a uh, – I think that it is a – uh, insurmountable uh, opposition from the public who will conflate the individual work that council members are currently doing with what is in the best interest of the city long term. I also hear concerns from, from council member Sawyer about not making this position a uh, profession. Uh, I hate term limits, absolutely hate term limits. I think that you have term, term limits that are called elections. But I can see the benefit of having a discussion around term limits uh, on these positions in exchange for telling the public uh, that, that you're going to pay council members more. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that right now we're going to be asking people to basically pay more for a service that they've already been getting for free. And so when we go to the, the public and we tell them what they'll get in exchange for this, the answer is going to be you will get uh, high-quality public service as you currently are and you'll get people who won't do this as a, as a, as a profession uh, long term. So I would offer up that we should include in the council pay discussion uh, a term limit for council members. Uh, perhaps setting it at three terms seems to be a, a fair amount. It gets people a chance to get in the city, learn the ropes, uh, advocate for their district, and get into a leadership position uh, before they go stale or before they make it a profession. Uh, so happy to, to see if uh, Sue, if some of the some of this discussion can be brought back in our next discussion uh, for council members to weigh in on. Uh, yes, we can we can bring we'll bring back a broad discussion. Great. 
Uh, with that, I'll see if there's any additional feedback from council members or any additional questions from staff. All right, seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and end this item. Uh, it is four o'clock. We've been going at it for four hours here and I appreciate the council for, for sticking with it. We'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back with our last study session item.
All right, Madam Clerk, let's go ahead and recall the, the roll and reestablish our quorum. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Rogers will be absent from the meeting today. Council Member McDonald? Here. Council Member Fleming has left the meeting also. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Here. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council members Fleming and Rogers. Okay. Uh, we, council will be pulling item, let me make sure I've got the number right. I believe it's 15.2 from tonight's agenda. Uh, yes, 15.2 from tonight's agenda. We'll see that at a later date. And with that, let's move on to item 13.3. Item 3.3, police oversight, independent op police auditor and civilian review models. Uh, would like to introduce interim chief Cregan. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers and Vice Mayor Alvarez and members of council. We're gonna go through a team effort today presenting uh, a review of some of the NACOL best practices for civilian oversight, the review of some different models that we've located across the state, and then really diving deep into our current independent police auditor's scope of work through OIR group. So I'll start out today uh, going through the slide presentation. And if we can go to our next slide, please. I'll give you a brief overview. So we're gonna dive deep into the, for NACOL as most people in our community know it, but for the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. And we're gonna examine their effective practices for law enforcement oversight. And we're gonna hear from a true subject matter expert on this area, who's one of the past presidents of NACOL and works as an equity consultant with OAR Group. And we'll go into his resume in just a second. We're also going to spend some time reviewing the current scope of work. And there's 11 specific items currently in our scope of work with our contracted independent police auditor through Mike uh, Gnocco and uh, OIR group as the organization. And then we're going to examine some of the civilian oversight models that are uh, examples that we can look at from across the state of California. Next slide, please. So uh, we'll go into, and we'll have our next presenter go a little bit more into this, but for NACOL, most people understand is a local nonprofit that brings together individuals and uh, organizations across the country to examine some of the best practices for civilian oversight. And you can go to the website at nacol.org. I've spent some extensive time examining that website and looking at a breakdown of the different models. There's a fascinating uh, hour and a half YouTube video they have there that really like breaks down from some of their subject matter experts. But who I wanna introduce is Brian Core. And Brian Core uh, has been served as the past president of NACOL, so he has tremendous uh, expertise into what the organization has done as being one of the leaders of that organization. He uh, currently serves as the executive director of police review and the advisory board for the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and has over 30 years of experience with civilian oversight. And he also is a consultant with OIR, our own independent police auditor. So let me turn it over to uh, Brian Kaur, and then he will start presenting our next uh, few slides specifically on the different uh, models of civilian oversight across the country. All right. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you through uh, you, Mr. Mayor, to the council. Uh, I'm very honored to be here with you tonight. Uh, working on civilian oversight is a labor of love, and it's something I'm very passionate about, so I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this team and present to you. Um, as Chief said, I am a long-time person involved in NACOL, the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. And I am here to talk about sort of the overview of the work of oversight and also a bit about why um, it's so important to look at the different models as you think about how you may want to continue to evolve the oversight work that you are doing here in Santa Rosa. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Excuse me, and, and I will make it a blanket apology. Uh, like so many people, fully vaccinated, fully boosted. The end of April, I came down with COVID, so I still have a little coughing now and again, but I'm feeling pretty fine, but it affects my uh, presentation, so I'm sorry for that. But what I wanna start with here is the 13 principles of effective oversight. And you'll notice that we say effective oversight. People often say, what are best practices? What are the communities that do the best work on civilian oversight doing? And what we always say at NACOL is 
you really have to look at what is effective. Um, we have communities of all sizes, from towns with 15, 20,000 people to you know, Los Angeles and New York City that have civilian oversight. There are over 200 communities around the United States that have oversight. Now, again, that's looking at a nation where we have about 18,000 law enforcement policing agencies. So it's not most communities, but most major communities do have it. Many, many communities are looking at creating it. And so when we look at what makes civilian oversight effective, we have to think about what are the principles? Because we are in many different ways, and I'll talk about the different models in a bit, working to make policing better, more effective, and more responsive to community needs. It can be addressing specific problems. It can be addressing broad patterns. But whatever that is, you have to look at these principles. I will also say that they're not a checklist. So I'm not going to run through and talk about why each one is so very important. But what I do want to say is that successful civilian oversight really examines these principles in the local context and is working to identify how they can make policing better and more effective and more responsive to the needs of your community. One thing I want to point out is you'll see in these things that seem obvious, things like independence, clearly defined and adequate jurisdictional authority, adequate funding, but they are not all absolutely evenly distributed in oversight agencies, and they vary quite a bit. But one thing in particular that Santa Rosa has done in its contract with OIR Group is granted unfettered access to records and facilities. Now, that is not something you find in most communities for all sorts of reasons. And it's one of the things that really stands out to me as part of why I was excited to be part of this team and this project. But these are very important things when I think about the work in Santa Rosa, community outreach and community involvement, looking at how to make sure that the reporting that goes to the public is robust and transparent, but also helps the community understand what's happening. And to be able to look at the principles of what we call 21st century policing. Uh, the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing under President Obama did an amazing report. It really is a touchstone for uh, police departments and communities across the country that are working to improve policing, uh, looking at how to be as progressive as possible, how to meet the needs of all stakeholders in the community, and procedural justice and legitimacy is very important to that. Uh, I would love to go into more detail because it's one of my passions, but I will say that they center on how people are treated and ensuring that people believe that they're treated fairly, that they have a voice, that the police department is doing its work in the way it does because that's what the community wants and needs as opposed to that's what the law allows or what, that's what someone in power determines. So these are all interlocking principles. And um, as previously mentioned, it's very important that a community looks at what is effective in your context. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So as you consider what are effective practices and as the City Council of Santa Rosa thinks about making potential changes, looking to the future. You know, I just listened to the charter um, conversation and clearly people are thinking very deeply about both where you've come from, but also where you're going as a community. You have to do the same thing with civilian oversight. Um, you have to think about is a particular practice an appropriate fit for your local context? Part of that is the history of your community, the diversity, the economic status of different communities, the incidents that have happened before in Santa Rosa and in Sonoma County that people are aware of, that have an impact on how people think, but also state law, local ordinances. All of these things are part of what is going to help you determine what's an effective fit. Thinking about how a particular practice will strengthen oversight in relation to those other principles. Sometimes there are balances. Sometimes more transparency um, can inhibit the ability to do certain things. Sometimes having an adequate budget may impact how people feel about, is this, are we getting our value for the money? Um, and so you really need to examine those sorts of things. And of course, as it says on the slide, what are the potential unintended consequences? Um, one example I often give is uh, a few years ago, I was testifying before the New York City 
Charter Review Commission. And there was, there's a set of people who felt very strongly that a civilian oversight board should be elected, just like the council, so it represents the people. And one of the concerns that, that I brought up to people was, you have to think about what happens when you turn that body into an elected body. There are many advantages of elected bodies, but there are also challenges. People are representing different interests and they are brought in in different ways. So as you think about what you want to put in place, you have to think about what's the right balance? How does that fit into your particular community? And uh, as you think about this, the last thing I'll say before we go to the next slide is you really want to be thoughtful. Um, again, my experience with the city council is you are a very thoughtful group and you really work to engage the community. So if you are thinking of making serious changes in an oversight model or even just adopting civilian oversight in communities where they're new, it's important to really reach out and listen to all stakeholders, um, community members in the way people often traditionally mean, residents and activists, but also the law enforcement agency, the elected officials, the city administration, all of the people who are stakeholders. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please, I'll keep going. So I did want to say a bit more about best practices versus effective practices, because that is the first thing people usually ask me. What's the best practice? How do we do that? And as I sort of said, but I just want to go into a little more detail. You have to follow a framework, in my opinion, and in Nichols' opinion, that really is based on what is effective and successful. It's easy to look at other communities, and it's important to look at other communities and learn from them. But you also need to make sure that you are doing something that will really exist in the long term, that will be sustainable, and that will make a measurable possible impact. So again, thinking about what the form of oversight is in the context of what is happening, what the history is, and also what the current situation is, how things are working um, with the police department, how relationships are being built between and among different stakeholders in the community around policing and law enforcement, and ultimately really around public safety. And so the end of this is just to say again, the best form of oversight will depend on your local circumstances. And it's something that has to be co-created by all of the stakeholders. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, I will now move into common models of oversight because this is something that comes up a lot and there will be more in this presentation as we go through to talk about the different models and how they have worked in different places. But just to kind of lay a common um, framework out there for people, the traditional models that people have talked about are review-focused models, investigation-focused models, and auditor monitor focus models. Uh, these general terms don't necessarily fit with specific names of oversight agencies. For various reasons, communities have uh, given different names to different kinds of agencies that may fall into a different category. So again, I, I try not to read slides out loud and I know these are available to people. So what I wanna say is that there is no one best model, just like there are not best practices. People will say, what's the strongest form of oversight or the most effective or what's the, the gold standard? It really depends on what you need, the local situation and all the things I've said about three times. So when you look at review focus models, those are kind of what people traditionally have thought about civilian review boards, a group of community members who receive training, who understand that you have to kind of check your biases at the door while also ensuring that you work from your lived experience and you're reviewing completed investigations. The people with that training are sitting down together, usually sometimes separately because it varies quite a bit, going through the reports, going through the investigation, uh, looking at video, body-worn camera footage, things of that sort if it's available, and then making some sort of recommendation perhaps about what should happen Maybe not, it really depends on the model. Sometimes it's really feedback for the police department. Other times it can be something that is really a recommendation to city um, management, whether that's a mayor, city manager, or city council. But the key point of this is you have people who are outside of the department, who are not part of the law enforcement agency, who are looking at these investigations and making um, 
recommendations, making determinations, making, you know, giving advice. Very important. In some places, that's exactly what you need. In some places, that is insufficient. So the model that has been more typical uh, for many years is the investigative model, where you have people who may or may not have a background in law enforcement. Uh, they will have some background in investigations or auditing, um, something that really gives them a grounding in how to do an effective investigation. Human resources people often have that background. And so these are people who have specialized training. Uh, NACOL and many other places provide training in um, how to do investigations around the work of civilian oversight and they will then do those reports instead of internal affairs or perhaps in parallel with internal affairs in a few communities, although that's challenging. Generally, they are the ones who are reviewing the complaint, doing the investigation and making findings. And that often can improve trust in community members. And I will say that, again, in the model that you currently have in, in Santa Rosa with the OIR group, there is that investigative function. Uh, the OIR group can investigate specific complaints or patterns, and that that is a really strong piece of this model. And again, part of why I was excited to be part of it. The third model, which you hear more and more about, is an auditor or monitor or inspector general type of model. This, and again, you hear that word auditor, this is at its heart a model that's looking more broadly at patterns and practices, looking at what sort of procedures exist, what sort of training, how those things are affecting the big picture, things that may lead to uh, misconduct, misunderstandings, or even just not a good feeling between community members and law enforcement officers. And so that's um, the kind of model that you see in many places. It's very important when there are broad systemic issues, but it's also a way that you can um, do kind of high level work. So this is, again, increasingly common, and you'll see cities that have been creating this along with other models. And that's when I get into the last column here, hybrid models. And these are increasingly common because different communities, as I said, you look at your specific needs, you look at the history, and you figure out what are the pieces that we need in our community to achieve better outcomes, or simply just to continue to improve what's going on. Um, it, we also increasingly see communities creating civilian oversight that don't have a particular set of problems, but understand the historic issues, understand that no community is perfect and every community can do things better. And so I would say to all of you that what Santa Rosa currently has really is a hybrid model. It's doing things including review, it's doing investigations, it has this auditor functionality. And so it is really, uh, I, it's hard to say a classic hybrid because they are all different. But from my point of view, it's really what I'm seeing increasingly around the country. People are really figuring out what works in your specific context. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. I want to just say quickly a couple of things about some of the resources out there. Um, as you've heard, I'm a past president of NACOL. I served on the board for nine years, elected as a board member, and then elected three years as president. And during five of those years, we were working on this report. Uh, we got funding from the federal government, the Department of Justice, through the COPS office, the Community Oriented Policing Services, to look at the state of the field and effective practices. One of the things that came out of the 21st century policing uh, task force was to really look at what is effective in the world of civilian oversight of law enforcement. And so, again, without reading the slide, uh, this is available on both the NACOL website and the Department of Justice website. But we did a report with nine case studies, a range of communities from Cambridge with about 120,000 people and under 300 police to uh, Los Angeles with uh, I think about, I should know this off the top of my head, I think about 13,000 law enforcement officers and uh, 4 million people. So, and all different models, as I just talked about. So based on that, we put together um, the report. We have a decision-making guidebook on establishing and strengthening models of oversight, which I depend on in my work. And um, there's also an interactive online toolkit so people can look at what's going on around the country with different models. And um, if we go to the Next slide, please. 
I don't want to take up too much time. Um, part of that were part of that work was to come up with these basic findings. I won't read them all. I've referred to them, but one thing I really want to point out is that. Um, again, access to department records and information varies greatly. So one of the things, again, that's a real highlight has been the unfettered access here in Santa Rosa. Uh, there is an increasing focus on front end accountability versus back end accountability. And what I mean by that is that rather than just looking at a problem, a complaint, an incident and figuring out what went wrong, it is that work to figure out how do we create the best types of policies and procedures? How do we use critical incidents to not just examine those, but set out where does a community want to go so that it can create the types of systems, training, et cetera, that will result in the best possible outcomes for everyone. And again, as I said, centering procedural justice and legitimacy with all stakeholders is essential for effective oversight. Um, I, I can't stress that enough. So I believe with that, I am done with my set of slides for the presentation and uh, look forward to uh, watching the rest and participating in the rest of the discussion. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Kaur. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'm gonna now go over just a review of our scope of work with OIR Group. And I also have joining with me here today, Teresa Magula, who's on the staff of OIR. So we wanted to make sure that we had really a lot of depth with this presentation. With Mr. Core, with his overwhelming expertise with civilian oversight across the nation, and then for us to educate the, our council and our community on what we're doing with OIR, and I'll talk about the scope of work. And then uh, Teresa will be here if there's specific questions about OIR and how they're implementing that scope of work. So it's important to lay the base foundation, and that is some community members uh, still don't understand that we have an independent police auditor in contract in place. And that's through Brian had talked about extensively with OIR Group. So in November 30th of last year in 2021, our council uh, heard a presentation uh, regarding the independent police auditor and was selected and put OIR Group into contract. So it's a three-year contract with two one-year extensions in the contract of council and the city manager continue to be pleased with the work that OIR is doing to our community. So I think it's important for everyone to understand that we have an, a civilian independent police auditor in place and that we're locked into the three-year up to a five-year contract. So that gives us some of the stability that our city council, our city manager and our community has uh, certainly made a priority for our organization. And then in that uh, contract with OIR, we have seven specific scope of work items that really detail some of the mandates that they're to carry out uh, at the uh, ultimately at the responsibility of our city manager to hold them accountable of, of, of meeting those scope of works and that's who they report to. So if we go to our next slide, please. So the first one, and we'll go one by one of these scope of works and just do a brief review of uh, each one of these. So the first one that we have is OIR uh, participating in every single one of our internal uh, investigations. So those are internal investigations that we launch, our investigations that come in from community members about misconduct of any of our staff members. And this is something that really does set us apart because I looked at some of the different scope of works from across the country and we're even gonna talk about Anaheim later. And Anaheim has a contract with an independent police auditor but only has them do a certain select amount of the uh, complaints that come in and they do like random audits and they do a certain percentage. For us, it's important that OIR and that independent lens looks at every investigation that comes in to the Santa Rosa Police Department to ensure that they're being done objectively, fairly, thoroughly, and that they're complete investigations that meet the needs of our community. So that's an important thing to understand. Another thing, and uh, uh, Brian Corp mentioned on this, but it's the unfettered access, and that unfettered access is on multiple layers. And this is one of the really the important ones here, is that OIR has the ability to actually respond to the Santa Rosa Police Department and actually be a part of the interview with the officers. So we have a professional uh, standard staff of a lieutenant and a sergeant, and they complete the investigations of our staff members. But OAR can be present in the room, and they have been present in the room, where they've come down here, they directly ask officers questions, they participate in the interview, and that's somewhere that doesn't exist here in Sonoma County and is actually a rarity across the state. So I'm not aware of any other agency in Sonoma County that allows their independent auditor or civilian to be able to step into that interview process and be able to participate in it. But that was important for us to be able to understand, and that came from our community, of our community being able to say that 
uh, the independent police auditor gets to watch those interviews, be a part of those interviews, and ask any questions that they feel that our professional standard staff is not asking. Our next thing for the scope of work is the receipt of citizen complaints, and that's where all citizen complaints go to OIR for them to be analyzed and understand. Our staff even meets with our professional standard staff, meets with OIR, and the initial part when a complaint comes in, we discuss what the allegations of the complaint are gonna be, which the officer or staff member uh, is served with, and we come to an agreement on those before we uh, even meet with the officer or staff member that's being accused of misconduct and they get to play a key role from moment one in that uh, organization. Um, we meet with them whenever a complaint comes up or no matter what, every two weeks that our professional standard staff, uh, so Lieutenant Brenda Harrington runs that uh, unit with Sergeant Matt North uh, working uh, under her leadership. They meet with Mike Kanako and Steve Connolly, primarily from uh, OIR group, go over complaints, address issues. And then OIR group also brings up if they've received any complaints. And then we're able to send those to our professional standard staff to uh, uh, administer and do the investigations of. And that's one of the updates we made. We had made a presentation to our city council public safety subcommittee. And that was some feedback about improving the the connection to the OIR group. So if we go to the Santa Rosa Police Department Change for the Better website, it lists the full contact information for OIR group. It lists uh, our, the Mike Kanako's email address and phone number, Steve Connolly's email address and phone number, how to get a hold directly, and citizens can confidentially uh, be able to reach out to OIR group to express frustrations, to lodge complaints, and to uh, make sure that the Santa Rosa Police Department is adhering to the standards of our city manager and our city council. Uh, we also, on every single complaint that we receive here to the police department, we want to have closure with the community member who brought that to us. So the chief of police creates a letter. I individually send that letter to each one of those community members talking about what the final disposition of that complaint is, whether it was uh, sustained against our, our uh, officer, whether it was exonerated, unfounded, whatever the finding may be. But also we added an extensive paragraph that explains what OIR is, how you can contact an individual. So if a community member still feels like they need more closure, they need more follow-up, they have more questions, they can also now have another resource of directly reaching out to OIR group uh, through that. And every single complaint receives that notification uh, sent to the individual who brought that complaint to our attention. Next slide, please. So another uh, number three in our scope of work is that OIR is to be notified on every uh, incident where a community member is uh, injured, uh, certainly if we have an in-custody death or any other critical incident. So we've only had one this year that falls under Senate Bill 1421, which is when someone has some type of a significant injury and OIR was notified of that. And then following the parameters of Senate Bill 1421, that report, the body-worn camera, and everything was listed on our Change for the Better website. And that's something that Santa Rosa Police Department, again, with our focus on transparency, we don't wait for individual groups to do a, a public records request and then be able to send it just to that individual. We post it on our Change for the Better website. It's available to any community member. You can go there today and we have year after all the ones that fit in that criteria. You don't have to spend through the money or have the expertise to file a PRA. You go to our website, it's available for all, and you have access to the videos, the reports, and all of the uh, legally mandated documents that are there on the website. For number four in our for, uh, scope of work is OIR has uh, complete and unfettered access to our complaint database. This is, again, very unusual. Many times you're seeing the civilian review models across the country where they send and say, hey, we'll send you this, oftentimes redacted reports and individuals that the OIR has the same access to our complaint database that I do as the chief of police. They can read any report that's in there in our complaint database. They can do audits to make sure that our professional standard staff is giving them, is notifying them of any complaint that's coming in. They have that access. And I think that's really important for us for building that true community trust that the independent police auditor truly has the ability to audit all items that are coming in and areas that allegations that are being made against the Santa Rosa Police Department. And I think that's helped really even build trust with the OIR group of them seeing that there, there's no nothing that our professional standard staff or our administration is trying to hide. We're very open with them and continue to give them access to this information. Next slide, please. So number five talks about the audit 
of not now going out of the area of complaints, but really looking at how we can more broadly use some of the expertise from the OIR group. And this is where they're examining our policies, our procedures, and our training here in the organization. So these are some of the reviews for the acronyms on here. The RIPA is for the Racial Identity Profiling Act. That was a law passed by the beginning of, for the city of our size by this year, by January of 2022, that our officers would begin uh, contacting uh, uh, a group of different aggregate data that they informate, they receive for any type of stop they do of detaining someone proactively in our community, whether it be a traffic stop, a bicycle stop, a pedestrian stop, and we're gathering that data. Chief Navarro was very uh, focused on being able to gather this data and be able to report back to our community. So we actually voluntarily started collecting that data six months early. So we started actually in July of 2021, and we wanted to make sure that we were working through any of the technical issues that needed to be worked out uh, with as we built that into our mobile data computers and our computer data dispatching system and that our officers and staff were trained how to use it. So we started that six months early and are capturing that data and we voluntarily submitted that first six months of data to the Department of Justice. We haven't received that full report out, but that'll be coming out this year when we're looking at 2021 and then into 2022. But OIR group is gonna be examining that data and looking if there's any anomalies or changes that need to be made in our enforcement efforts. They're gonna be doing annual audits of our training, of our use of force data, of our body-worn camera UTIS system to make sure that our officers are properly using their body-worn cameras. We mandate by policy that officers are to turn on their body-worn cameras anytime they're uh, contacting community members out in the field. And we're working toward this year of using some of our Measure O dollars to also add camera system to our patrol vehicle. So it's gonna have three different cameras in the patrol vehicle, because sometimes the body-worn camera can be limiting with, uh, especially when they close contact uh, with a community member. And so the vehicle camera system is gonna give a broader view and certainly be uh, helpful for pursuits, collisions, and, uh, and other contacts that we may have out in the community. Next slide, please. So number six is we're gonna be taking some of those audit reviews they've done of our policies, procedures, and they're going to uh, ensure that they're meeting the best with our equitable policing environment. And this is where they're gonna be looking at these through that extra lens. And we certainly, our community is aware of that we've had the equitable policing task force through our seed collaborative effort. We've uh, spent many hours talking to OIR group about the efforts we're making that, but that's gonna be important for OIR to be one more lens to making sure that our policies, our procedures, our interactions in the community uh, are led by that we're equitably treating all members of our community. Next uh, slide, please. The uh, presentations to city council. So OIR will be doing a uh, annual report that will be publicly uh, presented to our city council. So we'll get what we're estimating is gonna take uh, once the final data comes in at the end of the year, the end of 2022. So in that first quarter of that year, be gathering that data and be presenting to council no later than March of 2023, getting the first annual report and being able to present to uh, our city council and our community uh, leaders. Conducting um, independent investigations. This is another important one. So our, uh, and Mr. Court talked about the different models. So we have our professional standard staff being the lead of conducting the investigations, but partnering with OIR group, including with OIR group, being part of the investigation and coming down and completing the interviews. But we also have in our scope of work, if uh, directed by the city as uh, manager, that OIR group has the ability to conduct their own independent investigations as directed by the city manager. If there were to be some type of unique investigation where uh, city manager Smith felt that that was appropriate. Uh, next slide, please. So the community outreach, and that's gonna be a big part of the presentation today is, um, uh, what OIR, and we've already met with uh, our equity consultant, Brian Core from our group and the wealth of experience that he brings to this arena. But we're going to some of the community outreach that's been done is in April, Mike Anako and our OIR group presented to the uh, Ch Chief's community ambassador team. Um, we're also going to have OIR group uh, is going to be down here this summer, and we're looking for at least twice a year in the scope of work. And this is to be facilitated ultimately by the mayor, uh, or his or her designee that will be hosting these community meetings. So right now there's already some progress in this through our com community engagement office and through our uh, city communications team 
about selecting this date and working with what works with the city manager and the mayor's uh, schedule for the summer to be able to set that first meeting up. And we're still looking at whether it's best to do it here in person or we're seeing that we're getting higher numbers that are doing it virtually through Zoom. So we're gonna work to be able to see what best meets the needs of our community and is able to get the most people in our community who are able to participate in those meetings. So there's work being done on that. And uh, we hope to have coming out through our uh, city's communication team in the coming weeks a date and then start uh, facilitating of how our community could be able to participate in that um, public outreach meeting. Next slide, please. So the reporting responsibility. So this is very uh, important for everyone to understand that OIR group does not present uh, our, our fall under the police department and it's not under the management of the police department. OIR group reports directly to our city manager is under the operating authority of city manager Smith. Uh, Mike Kanako has met with the city manager uh, several times, even in her time here since uh, January, and will continue to meet and can directly bring issues directly to our city manager of concerns with the police department administration, police department investigations. And I think that uh, that access to the city manager is so important to be able to make sure that we're clearly understanding any issues that may be popping up at the police department. And, um, and I think that's important for the community to understand because there are sometimes some questions about that of who does OIR group report to. Uh, so another one or our last scope of work here is having a dedicated equity consultant. And that came from feedback from our community about making sure that our uh, OIR group is able to do outreach in our community, but really has that focus on the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And uh, that's where OIR group was able to bring in Brian Core with his extensive uh, level of expertise, not only with civilian oversight, but with working uh, with our community with that lens on the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So that's important. And uh, Mr. Core will continue to be a key part of our community presentations and outreach uh, in the future. Next slide, please. So I discussed this briefly, but we really want to use this opportunity to make sure that all everyone in council and especially our community is aware of our dedicated professional standards team. And this is something that came out of a recommendation uh, in the past to make sure that in the past we had different supervisors who would do these, but we really wanted to work on the consistency and the expertise and handling these delicate investigations. So uh, over five years ago, we created a dedicated professional standards team that their full-time job is to do nothing but to make sure that we're following our policies and our procedures with every single one of the calls that we go out. If we receive any complaint that comes into the police department, that we have a dedicated team that has the expertise to be able to carry out these investigations and if we launch any internal investigations. So the professional standards team can be reached directly at the 707-543-3559 or emailing at the srpdinfo at srcity.org or you can, uh, anyone can easily come into the police department and either hand fill out or ask to speak to a professional, uh, sta or professional standards team member and we'll certainly make that contact. And then we really wanna focus on people having direct access, community members to OIR group. If they don't feel comfortable making a complaint with the police department, then we have right here. And here's the contact information here for uh, Mike Anako and Steve Connolly and Teresa Magula of all their email addresses on the Change for the Better webpage. It has each one of their phone numbers and dedicated uh, other outreach efforts that we can make directly to OIR group if that's more comfortable for our community members. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna finish that segment of it. And that was the dedicated part of our scope of work. And we wanted to do just a summary of some of these uh, different models that exist for civilian oversight models. And these are more focused, not on the independent police auditor model, but actually of having like civilian review boards. And we looked at several of costs and there, there, were, there was no perfect city that we could find like, hey, this is the exact one to emulate here for our community. So we picked several that we're able to find, but we really wanna use this as a starter for some of the conversation with our city council and our community members. So we'll start with a, a, a brief review. We're gonna go through Anaheim, Novato, San Leandro, and then the Iolero model that we have here in Sonoma County that so many are very familiar with. So next slide, please. So Anaheim has uh, an independent police auditor, but also has a community advisory board. And that, uh, in, the, in this unique office right here, the city manager's office oversees the community advisory board. And then you also see across the state, a wide uh, array of how the community members are selected for this. So what Anaheim went with was a lottery system. So that way it, it's purely, uh, purely 
fair and impartial uh, of who's selecting uh, the individuals, and there's no bias in that selection. So they have the lottery system there. They went, uh, Anaheim is similar to us with different uh, council districts. So they had one person from each one of the council districts and then one at-large uh, member from the city. So a total of seven on their community review board. They do uh, background checks that are outside of conducted by uh, through the city manager's office and hiring uh, a background firm to be able to do that and have some standards about those with uh, criminal histories and felony convictions of being on theirs. And that's Anaheim standard for that. They received some limited training on some legal standards with the police officer uh, Bill of Rights and with some department policies. And they also participated mandate that they're doing uh, monthly ride alongs and understanding the lens of an officer and that perspective. They're briefed on major incidents, so in custody deaths and other significant uh, uses of force uh, and complaints uh, that are received by the Anaheim Police Department. Next slide. Continuing with Anaheim. So in the long run, what the Anaheim community group uh, gets is actually just what's accessible to the public. So they get what's allowed by Senate Bill 1421 and Assembly Bill 748. And those talk about you, uh, has four different prongs for Assembly Bill uh, 1421. And it's talking about if uh, any time an officer involved in a shooting, it talks about incidents involving uh, an officer you, uh, that results in death or great bodily injury, incidents involving a sustained finding of sexual assault and uh, involves a sustained finding of dishonesty in the course of their work. So those are four prongs by that. And it says then the reports, the body worn cameras, and the written documentations from the police department will be presented. And that's what uh, the Anaheim uh, Civilian Review Board gets is those documents. They get them, it sounds like, from talking to the staff there in Anaheim slightly before, so a week or so before they go out to the public and get kind of like early access to that information. They review and provide input on policies and training. They don't make the decisions or determination. They make general recommendations to the chief of police and city manager. They do write an annual report, the, the Civilian Review Board, uh, that discusses some of their findings and some of their recommendations. And they can refer complaints to the city manager or the independent police auditor. They have no investigative authority or ability. They just can receive complaints and basically be the conduit to send those to the independent police auditor uh, and the city manager for them to be investigated ultimately by Anaheim's uh, professional uh, standards team. Next slide. So another one to look at as we look across the cross, uh, cross section of the state is Nevada, right here in Marin County, our adjoining county. So Nevada has uh, a process. They have a total of seven members on their team. They're selected by the city council. They don't have a, an applicant per district there. One thing anomaly there, they have a reporting to the human resource director as opposed to the city manager there. They receive some training, some limited training, really focused only on the Brown Act because it's considered a public meeting there in Nevada because they're selected by council and they do some uh, general to city uh, rules and sexual harassment that would go to city, any city board member or employee. They meet there quarterly in the city of Nevada as opposed to once a month that the city of Anaheim uh, met for their team. Next slide, please. So uh, now we'll look at San Leandro. And San Leandro actually, we've had some discussions with their chief. They're in the process of just launching their community review board right now and actually I was looking just at their uh, web page this week and it closes on June 4th. So they're actually in the process of recruiting for their first ever community advisory board. So we're kind of looking at the structure they've built, but we haven't actually seen them implement it yet there in San Leandro yet. So they have uh, similar to the Anaheim that each are to, sorry, Novato, each one of the council member chooses one applicant uh, from their district. They have one thing that's kind of unique here is trying to introduce some of our younger uh, community members and they have two, two student members on that panel between the ages of 16, so high school or uh, college age students. They have no background check or requirements with a criminal history. They do a little bit more in-depth training that they're providing, uh, about a total of 30 hours of training. Again, have that requirement of going on ride-alongs. They provide input, so it's not decisions, but they provide input on the budget process for the police department, uh, even on the chief's hiring process, policies, procedures, and training. They also write an annual report, as does Anaheim do, does, and they refer all complaints to the police auditor. So they don't have the ability to do investigations themselves. They can just be a conduit for receiving those complaints for the community and forwarding them on to the investigator. Next slide, please. So most everyone in our community is very aware of the sheriff's departments and the county of Sonoma's 
uh, IOLERA, which stands for the Independent Office of Law Enforcement Review and Outreach. So this is presentation is kind of broken into two. So IOLERO as a whole has is more serving as the independent police auditor. So these are some of the things that the auditor function of that team has. Uh, be able to provide uh, objective and independent review of all complaints that are coming against uh, sheriff's deputies. Um, they advise if investigations appear to be incomplete and can propose and make recommendations about further uh, investigations. They again propose policy changes so they're, they're not a decision maker but can certainly make recommendations and policies that they're able to uh, recommend to the sheriffs and, and to the board of supervisors for a review they uh, focus on committing some community outreach if we go to the next slide please and this is still focused on the actual auditor function of that they provide a public report uh, regarding which is usually quite lengthy i've read several of their reports over the years and they do have the ability uh, with the opinion of the iolera director uh, that a sheriff uh, uh, investigation is incomplete, that they can utilize their, their community advisory council. So really what I wanna focus here is the community advisory council, because that's the equivalent of what we're looking at, which makes their kind of their civilian review. So um, IOLERO doesn't make decisions, uh, can't change this, the ultimate decisions on discipline or the outcome of investigations, doesn't decide policies, certainly can't impose any discipline and uh, isn't able to interfere with what the sheriff's ultimate decisions are. And that's the IOLERO model that it goes. Our next slide, please, talks about the community advisory council that they have, which is basically an element of IOLERO, which kind of meets where we're talking about today. So for their selection, the board of supervisors each selects uh, a member uh, each. So, there, so it comes up with a total between the five uh, county board of supervisors. And then the IOLERO director selects one. So a total of 11 members that are community advisory council. No background check or any requirements there. They do make a review of the policies and make the recommendations. They're not directly reviewing the complaints. No access to body worn camera or reports through their community advisory council and no formal training that we were able to see in their process that they have there specifically for their community advisory council. Next slide, please. So I know we were going through that very quickly and it was intended just to be a summary to kind of start some conversation of the different models, but we wanted to kind of bring that all together in one chart here so you could uh, look at these and the community can evaluate some of the differences between these different models. So you see right here in Anaheim with, they do have the independent police auditor in place, the lottery system, yes on the background check, make some recommendations about policy, uh, complaint review, they're just getting what's available to the general public. They're getting the redacted SB 1421 and AB 748 uh, documents, and they do receive some training. Novato, they actually do not have an independent police auditor. So their only review is the civilian review panel that they have there chosen by the council with a minimal background check, making some recommendations uh, uh, regarding policies and review, have no access to the body worn camera reports, and uh, do receive some minimal training more in overall city policies, not necessarily with the police department. San Leandro just launched their community advisory group and is in the process of also selecting an independent police auditor. They're selected by council, no background checks, do the policy review and get some redacted uh, footage of body worn cameras and reports and we receive some training. And then the IOLERO's community advisory committee uh, is uh, uh, falls under the IOLERO auditor. And then they're selected by the board of supervisors, no background check or criminal history, uh, stipulations, do make some recommendations, and uh, don't get the community advisory council doesn't get access to the body worn camera and reports and uh, no formal training for those community advisory uh, council members. Next slide, please. So we went through a lot of information. We wanted to summarize this at the end with the focus of OIR and their scope of work of looking these and this is we're not going to go through each one of these since I have, but we wanted to make sure that our council had this all in one page to be able to see the highlight of the different scope of work that we have here. And it's really important for us for the community education on this piece. And one of the, the goals for our city manager and our city leaders this year is really focusing on some of the community outreach with OIR group and making our community more understand what their work is, what their scope of work that they're doing every day and how they can, uh, community members can have direct access to the OIR group staff. So uh, next slide, please. So we have, for us, it's really important as uh, our chief of police and stepping in this role on the interim basis 
is we work with our different labor groups and we understand how important of having an independent police auditor is, but it's also important working with our labor groups and understanding the incredible work that the men and women of the Santa Rosa Police Department do it on a daily basis and going to over 109,000 calls last year and we received 54 complaints. Actually, there were 34 community complaints and 20 internally generated complaints that we received out of over 109,000 calls for service. So overwhelmingly, our staff is doing an incredible job, but we do understand that mistakes are made and sometimes people need to be held accountable for those mistakes. But we have a good working relationship with our police officer association and our uh, police officer association president, Jeff Woods, is gonna have to be a key part of some of these conversations as we work to build the trust of our own staff here uh, in this process. So I'll turn it over to our POA president, Jeff Woods. Thank you, Chief. Um, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yep. All right. Um, so I just want to introduce myself. Uh, like Chief said, uh, I'm Jeff Woods. I'm our POA president. I'm also a detective. I've been with Santa Rosa Police Department for a little over 17 years. Um, I'm a lifelong Santa Rosa resident, actually fifth generation. My family dates back to 1890s in Santa Rosa. Um, more importantly, I'm a husband, father, uh, coach, and a member of our community. Um, I'd like to start off and by saying, as a law enforcement officer, nothing brings more anger and disappointment than seeing an officer violate the oath that we all took. Officers need to be held accountable when they tarnish the badge and create mistrust in the community we serve. Um, I understand that oversight is necessary and to ensure the, this accountability happens and this message is conveyed to our community. Uh, police oversight, like Mr. Kors stated, comes in many forms. Um, some models work better than others. The success of oversight uh, model depends on many factors, including the culture within our department, the culture within our city leadership, uh, previous interactions with our community and law enforcement, as well as national trends surrounding law enforcement and policing today. At Santa Rosa PD, we have welcomed increased transparency and oversight over the recent years. The POA has worked with and will continue to work with our city leaders, um, our police department management and our community to continue to evolve this independent oversight process. The ORI group, as Chief said, was selected by city leadership late last year as the most recent current model of oversight. Under this current plan, the ORI group has been given unprecedented access and insight into the police department. The ORI, ORI, sorry, ORI works with the city and our community. ORI was brought on board to audit the police department in many facets that include reviewing and establishing best and effective policies and procedures, as well as investigating violations to those established policies and procedures. The ORI group brings insight and expertise into the profession unlike anyone else. We need to work with ORIR as a resource to bring meaningful changes where necessary. The POA will support working with OIR to accomplish this goal. Over the past several months, I had the experience uh, to be able to participate in the Equitable, Equitable Policing Task Force. This task force was established by the city and department to bring members of the department and the community to, to, together to work and discuss on policing in Santa Rosa. This was a, remark mark sorry, a remarkable process that brought issues and concerns to light. These issues and concerns were discussed with great candor. One of my takeaways from this process was the lack of communication between the department, the community, and the city. Many of the concerns revolved around the lack of everyone feeling like they had a voice to be heard. We are implementing steps um, to have those voices heard. So when I hear the desire to set up a civilian oversight committee, I'm reminded of the takeaways from the Equitable Policing Task Force. I hear, I hear the community needs to have the access to be heard and, what's and know what's happening within the department. Our current oversight model is already set up to hear those concerns and be the lens into the department for our community. Our current, uh, sorry, we all, the city council, the city manager's office, community outreach in the department and the POA need to work together to ensure the community has the access and to provide a voice in that lens. The ORI group is that conduit. Let's work together and bring all this meaningful process forward. 
Adding an additional layer of civilian oversight will only slow the implementation of meaningful change. As we heard today, we have a robust, rebu <laughs> robust, sorry, it's really hot in here. Our air conditioning went out at the police department. I'm having a hard time in here. Uh, but we have a robust system in place. Let's focus on how to get our community more involved in this process. The ORI group works with the city manager and community, not the department works for. As POA president, a concern I hear on a regular basis is the feeling of lack of support from city leaders and our community. Let's take this opportunity to build back the trust between the department, the city, and our community. We can build back the trust by fully utilizing the experience and expertise of the independent auditors. If after time our community is not being heard by collaborating with OIR, that could be the time to have this discussion. We should not we should at least wait until an annual report from ORIR before we can begin to assess its effectiveness. Now is not the time to establish another layer of oversight that will undoubtedly continue feelings of mistrust from both sides of this discussion. I know that members of the POA, we all put on our uniforms each day wanting to serve our community and make it a safe place to live. Let's work together to enhance our current model so we can all see it succeed. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Mr. Woods, and thank you, Chief and Mr. Core. Really appreciate the, the conversation here today and the information. I'm gonna start by seeing if there are any questions from council members. Uh, once we answer questions, we'll go to public comment, and then council members will have a chance to weigh in uh, and ask any additional questions that are uh, spurred from the public. So first, let's see if there are any questions from council members. Councilmember McDonald. Yes, thank you. I noticed that um, as part of the work is going out to hold meetings by um, the for the community members. Can you tell me if that's going to be done by district or where those um, meetings will be held out in the community and if they will be done in Spanish and in English so that we're certain that there's interpretation at those meetings? And then I just had a couple more questions for clarification. Thank you for that question. Um, actually, we're gonna hold two meetings. Uh, we are still working on the process. Uh, I have had a conversation with Michael with OIR and we're trying to determine the format. Of course, our meetings will always be in Spanish. We will have an interpreter there, uh, but we are still finalizing those. But because it, Brian and Michael will need to travel here, there will probably be two community meetings. But we can talk, if that's not to your satisfaction, we can talk about uh, holding more meetings. Great, thank you. I just want to ensure that there's access to all of our community members to be able to go and you know voice their concerns around this and have an active role and really hear actually what we're already currently doing with our police auditor um, because I thought this was really enlightening to know actually what our current auditor does and the access to the information that they currently have by our police department and the transparency that's given to them to ensure that there's a good process in place. I was just wondering if you could tell me about how many complaints there have been to the the independent auditor since we put this in place um, since November. That question. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Chief. Oh, so I have since November, they reviewed two significant incidents and one was an in custody death from last year that they reviewed and the one is the Senate Bill 1421 case. I have, I don't have the exact number that they've reviewed so far this year. I can tell you that they've reviewed every single one we've had. Uh, so far this year. I only have the full 2021 data of the number of complaints we've received. So, so far this year, just like, uh, just on, we've had roughly eight to 10 or so complaints that have come in and they've reviewed every single one of those complaints. I'm aware of one complaint that was directly brought to OIR group. And that's something that we wanted to make sure that the community is aware, has the access, and OIR group was able to bring that complaint to us for us to complete an internal investigation. And that's one of our goals is to get their information, their contact information out there. And so if there's any type of reservations or concern about coming in directly to the police department, that our community understands that there's another way to access and that we'll still fully investigate each one of those complaints. Any additional questions, council member? All right, council member Sledell. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation, <clears throat> Brian. I really appreciate you not being a little bit under the weather, but excellent presentation. And I've got a great level of comfort with your experience and your perspective on what we're trying to accomplish here. And I do appreciate you diming yourself off that you heard our previous conversation about some of the charter reviews. And even with that 21 member um, committee, it, it was hard to find agreement. So I heard in your presentation, uh, specific on slide six, it said the best form of oversight will depend on local circumstances of the jurisdiction. Um, you also made a comment about successful civilian oversight. Um, how do we know if we're there? And again, I, I'm using it as a reference. You just heard the diversity in this community, and it's hard to get everyone to agree on one thing. So are there some other parameters or suggestions you'd have for us to help evaluate whatever model we're ultimately going to choose or continue to use? Yeah. Well, first, thank you for that question. Uh, and I also, I appreciate the kind word. Um, I think really the, the most important thing is to do listening. And I, again, I mean, just not to you know go in circles, but I think as this work happens, as you go out to the community um, and talk to people, as counselors, as city staff, as consultants and auditors, as we all listen to people, we have to be very careful to make sure that we hear what we hope we hear, that we hear people understanding the role, that we hear people saying, yes, I, I feel like I can make a complaint if I have to, or I just can offer feedback. And as that happens, then you start to hear what are the needs. You know, oversight is something that is always evolving. I mean, again, not, you know, sort of the parallel to a, a city charter. It's not something that you want to just take and change dramatically every month, but you have to always be looking at, is it serving our purposes? So as the, those community outreach sessions are set up and happen, as interactions with people happen every day, it's really important to be asking questions about what their experience is and listening to hear whether it's working for them. Now, a lot of people in the community won't really give it much thought. They either don't have interactions with the police or they think the police are doing great, or they may feel like, I don't want to deal with the police. But those are generally smaller segments of the population, and they're very important voices. But you also have to listen to people that sort of, you know, I don't know the police, say, I'm not really sure what they're doing. I haven't talked to anybody in a while. because. I think for law enforcement, but also for oversight to be effective, you really have to make sure that, that people are thinking about how is policing happening in our community? How am I being treated? How are communities that I see, people who are part of the unhoused community, people who are dealing with mental health issues, people who are part of historically and currently um, disadvantaged, oppressed, however you might want to think about it. I mean, they're all true aspects. All of those communities are really important. And then also, you know, we heard from the president of your PLA. We, we also need to listen to police officers. And those are not the only voices. And some people will say they have a big voice and why do we need to listen to them? But I say that you have to listen to everybody. So for me, it is really making sure that that listening, active listening is happening. And then that feedback is part of what you look at when you're thinking six months out, one year out, two years out. How is this going? As we think about another contract with OIR or with anyone to do police auditing, how is that work um, best achieving the needs of the community? So it, it's something that it, it doesn't really ever stop. I'm, I'm sorry, but I hope that answers your question. Well, actually, your last no, sentence, it, it never stops. It's not like, okay, we're there. Work's done. It's it's continuing evolution, and I also really appreciated on slide four the 13 principles of effective civilian oversight. And you said it's been your experience. Uh, number three, the unfettered access to records and facilities. Can you share with us across you know your experience across the nation? How common is that? Uncommon? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, like everything else, it varies quite a bit, but it is something that most communities don't really have for a lot of different reasons. It may be because there are um, laws that prohibit it. It could be a police officer bill of rights, a law enforcement officer bill of rights. It could be public records laws. It depends also on the type of oversight agency and structure you have. Uh, there are states where members of oversight boards are not allowed to look at police records. Um, in New York State, that's, that was a big issue and just recently changed. They had a law called 50A. And so you had members of civilian oversight boards, um, community review boards, various types who were looking 
at complaints, but they couldn't know the names of the officers. They couldn't know the names of the complainants. They might not even know the dates and times that events happened. So it, it can be embedded in state law. It can be embedded in local practice. There are communities where uh, the initial ordinance or um, charter provision that established oversight was not clear about access. And it, it generally then falls to the police department to decide how transparent to be. And then that can vary with leadership. That can vary with particular situations. It can vary case by case. And again, nothing in this work is absolutely set in stone, but you want to ideally have something that gives people that access. So um, it's, you know, I, it's hard for me to pull a number out because the it's such a big variety, but I would say the large majority of oversight agencies have limitations on their access. And so having unfettered access really is something that uh, people aspire to all over the United States. Great. Thank you for that. And then my last question, I'm not sure if it's for the city manager, the chief, um, part of the scope of work for the OIR group, um, number six, I thought it was interesting, written recommendations for the uh, to the chief of police for improvements or changes to SRPD policy procedures and training. A, is that a public document? And B, how would council be aware of the content? Or do we have the privilege of being, uh, be able to see that type of document and what's being suggested? So actually this is a public document and this is something that I can pass along in a council FYI as I do some of the other information. I, I'd strongly encourage that because as we see the progress, let's see what right. our adjustments being made based on the feedback from the OIR group. So thank you. And I will say, I'm just going to piggyback off uh, some of the things that Brian said. I think we all know we're in an age where oversight is important, uh, right? So, but I want to commend SRPD, the former uh, city manager and the council for passing this current model, because this is actually one of the more aggressive models uh, of transparency that I've seen from a, a department that is not forced into oversight, right? So not only does this model have an oversight arm, but I've met with the chief, um, former chief Navarro, I've met with the interim chief, I've met with members of SRPD, and I've met with the union, and I believe everyone in that room understands my expectations. Uh, because I think everyone knows that you have a city manager that believes in accountability and you never know where I might show up at any time and any day because I want this city to understand we want to be part of the solution and we want to get back to where people understand that we are a people's government. Um, so not only that, the department understands um, my vision on being a relationship policing department. And, and what do I mean by that? So other than going out and really having safety first in your mind, our goal is to build relationships when we go out to a call. You will often hear community policing, but we are a relationship police department. We want long lasting relationships and we want authentic relationships. So the model that OIR, OIR I'm like Jeff, OIR offers, it's transparency, it uses data, it ensures fair, equitable, and courteous treatment of all people. It provides access to documents and increases accountability on on the front end. Um, and that's important because a lot of times when we hear of a lot of the civil unrest that happens, when we hear a lot of the injustices, it's because you have a pattern of chronic um, uh, uh, issues with that particular individual. And the more and more we communicate with the police department, with our legal department, and with POA, we can root those bad apples out. And Jeff will, you know, Jeff will tell you as POA president, those are not the individuals that he wants in his department. And the chief will tell you those are not the individuals who we want serving this city every day. So uh, I just want to piggyback on some of the things that Brian said, but I think we have a solid oversight model. Of course, it's ongoing. We will have to transform it as we go. But, you know, I believe that we can serve as a model, and this is a critical time for us to start uh, having not stop having the conversations either or, but just turning turning the model, turning this model so we can get it right. Yeah. Any other questions from council members? All right. Uh, so my question, Chief, and it piggybacks sort of along the same lines that Council Member Sweathelm had. Uh, when recommendations come from OIR group uh, or when in 
when we start to gather data, when we start to talk about the data, there's a couple, it sounds like a couple of avenues we're exploring and we're trying to set up meetings for, but for the general public, how would they give input on potential policies that are being proposed? How would they be able to bring those ideas for, for actual discussion, uh, not just shoot off an email? Uh, how, how do we create buy-in in our public on, uh, on some of our discussions around uh, accountability and transparency to make sure that people feel supported and feel uh, feel like there's an appropriate level of, of trust that's there. Yeah, I think that's critical to us at the, with not only from the city manager's office, but the police department. So there are a lot of avenues. I mean, one great one that we started last year that came out of some of the efforts for more transparency is the city council public safety subcommittee. And so that's been an incredible one where we've looked at different our use of force policies. We've looked at our LRAD system and really the community feedback like helped us create those policies. So I think that public safety subcommittee, which meets every other month on uh I believe it's the third Wednesday of each month, and that's a great one to do, but also that we continue to look like through the community engagement events that OIR is gonna be doing in our community, and then reaching out directly to the police department. We have on the Change for the Better website at the police department, we have every single one of our policies are listed there. You don't have to ask for it, it's there right now. You can look at our pursuit policies, our use of force policies, our uh, First Amendment policies, it's all there. Those are public documents. And I really want that feedback because I want to hear from our community, what changes can we make with our policies? How can we better serve our community? And we're only as strong as us all coming together on some of these issues. So I think some of the biggest avenues, that public safety subcommittee reaching out to me and the police department every time. And then we're really going to focus this year through the city manager's office about the community outreach that OIR is doing this summer and throughout the year, and then evaluate, do we need to do even more of that? Uh, of that, And I think that's an important, and then also always directly contacting OIR themselves with Mike Ganako and Steve Connolly, their email address, or their phone number, make that contact and make sure that you're providing. And especially if you have a, a suggestion that you want OIR to look at a specific policy, then reach out to Mike Ganako, say this specific policy, this area I have a concern with, he has literally decades of experience uh, working as a civil rights prosecutor, working as a civilian oversight, and there's not a better individual to be able to kind of use his lens of expertise to dive into that. And then that'll be included in the annual report, which is gonna review every single one of the complaints that they, uh, citizen complaints that they reviewed and give any policy recommendations that will be a public document that's on our website, the city's website, and present it to our city council. I appreciate that, Chief. Uh, one of the things that actually really interests me is is a, a hybrid. I, I, I love the work that the OIR group does. I think that uh, that's going to be really critical for rebuilding that trust within our community. Uh, but I'm, I'm also interested in sort of how Anaheim does it as well. And I'm wondering, Chief, if you can talk a little bit, if you've had a chance to, to talk with the chief down there or anybody about um, what have been the, the, the benefits and what have been the drawbacks of an approach of, more inclusion of some folks from the public. Uh, you mentioned in there critical incidents, uh, briefings around critical incidents or the ability to talk about policies. Uh, have you had any feedback on that or, or Mr. Wood? I don't know if you've spoken with uh, members of their POA down there as well. I'm just wondering if, the, if we know what has the impact been and how long have they been doing it? I didn't speak with anyone with their POA or at the officer level. We did speak to our professional standards teams, uh, spoke with their city manager's office and one of the, uh, I believe it was an assistant chief there in Anaheim. And it's been in practice for uh, years of having an independent police officer, uh, auditor, and then that uh, civilian review. The, the basic feedback is that the auditor model really has the teeth to dive into and has the access to be able to get the full so that they were getting more like substance from the independent police auditor and what they were gonna do, but that it was a way to like educate the community on through the community advisory board. And so that's something that I think that I've been looking at of like, what are areas that we could use some of our existing things we have here in the city, whether it be the city's community advisory board that we have, or whether it be the chief's community ambassador team and look at some of those teams to, to be able to highlight some of the work that's doing and be a way for the community to reach out. So those are some of the things that we're looking at because I, th I think that's the biggest area of growth that we can do with OIR is some of the community outreach. And that's where I'm excited to be able to see some of that launch this summer. And so the community gets to more meet one-on-one -on -one with OIR and provide them direct feedback. All right, thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Woods, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've had a chance to talk with their POA. No, Mayor Rogers, I, ha I have not had a chance to speak with their POA indirectly, but it's absolutely something I will do and uh, would like to find out more about that. So I appreciate that. And we'll, uh, we'll have another opportunity to talk about it as well. And so hopefully we can, uh, can check back in on it. Um, and, and Chief, I think, I think you kind of went to one of the things that I suspect you'll hear in some of the public comments. I, I think the Chief Ambassador team was uh, well received by a lot of folks and then for others, it felt like a, who's the cool kid at the table getting invited by the chief without an opportunity for broader representation. So I think that that's one of the things that I'm looking for too, is how do we continue to broaden that representation so that everyone feels included uh, in the discussions or everybody feels like there's that avenue. Um, but we can talk more about that as well. Let me see if there's any other questions from council members before I go to public comment. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I have I do have a couple of other questions, but I'll ask these in the meantime. Uh, I see that there's a lot of resistance in regards to the background check. What what is the reason for that? I don't know that the police department has any resistance to that if, if it's directed to us. Oh no, no, sir. In regards to other, uh, I'm wondering if 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 you have an idea of of why we're or why. In other places, there's resistance to the lived experience. Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess sometimes there could be concerns coming from members of staff of someone who's had uh, that uh, that could come up of them having a bias toward law enforcement. So I think that's probably some of the areas. I haven't directly spoken to those agencies about who does the background and why they did it, but I could see that coming up as a concern, but I, uh, but I believe you bring up a valid point with sometimes those with lived experience having a more diverse thought. So I think that's something that, like Mr. Kaur said, like each community builds what's best for their unique community. And that's what we look at is like, what meets the needs here of uh, the city of Santa Rosa. But I think it's as important to have that balanced approach that it protects the staff members of our vibrant city here in Santa Rosa, that they feel supported and having an unbiased review of them. But at the same time, that it's important that we have that, uh, equal representation out there in our community to provide the diverse thoughts. And, and this, the question does stem from the report that was presented by both Commission on Human Rights as well as the City of Santa Rosa in regards to the protests uh, in 2018, where we received the report that did not include any interview with, with anyone for the public or even uh, collaboration between both of the entities that I just mentioned, the City of Santa Rosa as well as the, the human rights folks. So that's why I, I see the resistance from from the opposing views, and I'm hoping that that's not the practice that we, we implement in the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, I, I guess my last question, actually my last question, is if, if transparency nurtures trust, what is a strategy to build relationships in the midst of so much secrecy? Yeah, I think that's why Santa Rosa really stands apart from different independent police models across, like we said, nowhere in Sonoma County and really very rarely in the state of California of increasing that transparency, of having the auditor actually sitting in on the interview on interviews, asking direct questions, having absolute access to the body worn camera system and our complaint database, the same as I do as the interim chief of police. So I think that's something that's really important to us and you're, and you're seeing more watered down versions across the state. And that's not something that our city leaders wanted and not something that the chief of police wanted. And that's why it was important to us. And we had broad support from our POA and from our community. And I think that's where we really actually get to be a model to others in the Bay Area about what we're doing here. And I think it honestly does put pressure on other agencies across the state to kind of follow what we're doing here in Santa Rosa. So we're proud of that. I appreciate that. And in the closing of my of my uh, questions, I, I must confess that that I have great confidence in our city manager moving forward uh, and finding that person to to represent both law enforcement and the relationship with our community that's in dire need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I'll go to Council Member Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. One quick question for Mr. Kaur. Um regarding the 13 principles of effective civilian oversight. Um, and whether it be the, uh, the model that we are embracing or, or, an ex or expanded, are there any of the 13 that we are not doing currently? 
Um, you know, that's a great question. And I mean, from my perspective, I would say what I've seen is all of them are operational in Santa Rosa. Can they be enhanced to a certain degree? Certainly. Um, I think looking at sustained stakeholder uh, support is something that is part of the scope of work, right? It's part of the community engagement piece because it really is in engaging those stakeholders, connecting with them, and promoting that sense of procedural justice and legitimacy. My sense uh, from looking at the work that Santa Rosa has done, checking out the website, talking to people, and, and I certainly know people in Sonoma County through my work in oversight. Um, you know, it's something that I really think the city has done, but I also think that communities today are demanding more. People want to be more deeply engaged. So I think that's an area that it's happening and it will continue to need to happen more. Uh, I think that the public reporting and transparency, again, has been good. And the addition of the OIR group, you know, building on the previous um, work of the previous independent auditor, of really making sure that the reporting coming out of what's happening with issues and concerns around potential misconduct, real misconduct, but also more generally how the department is working can help. And as you heard the interim chief say, um, the department is doing something that a lot of departments don't do, putting all of its policies online so people can read them and understand that. So again, I don't want to say that it's not happening, but I think that it can be enhanced and that's part of the work. And then um, the last thing I would say is, I think procedural justice and legitimacy, uh, normally when I talk to people, I go on for a long time about it because it's central to my vision of how we have um, safe and just communities for everybody. But I will say that, that it's one of those things that that also is never done. Um, as we all know, any community is one critical incident away from a breach of trust. And so you have to constantly be um, investing in those relationships. Relation relationship building is key. And so as you work to build that procedural justice approach within the department and that sense of legitimacy, um, it, it takes constant effort. And I'll also, also just mention quickly that it's really important inside the department for there to be procedural justice. Um, where I've seen some communities go wrong, and I think part of the work of OIR with the police department is to keep this from happening, but where some communities go wrong is that there's external oversight and there are other mechanisms, and there's a concern about procedural justice within the broader community, but the officers themselves don't have a sense that they're being treated in a procedurally just way. So as you, you do the work of oversight as you're looking at internal affairs, professional standards, training, all of those things. Um, it, it doesn't mean it's all equivalent, but you have to absolutely ensure that there's internal procedural justice so that there's an internal sense of legitimacy because for leadership at the, you know, leadership in the police department, leadership in the administration and leadership at the effective official level to really be able to continue to make positive change you have to have those who are carrying out the work day to day believe that those who are directing them are doing it in a way that's legitimate. So um, I don't know. I, that's I've probably gone on too long, but hopefully that's an answer to your question. It is. Thank you. I really appreciate your candor. You're welcome. Any other questions from council members? All right, let's go to public comment on this. Uh, Sandy, if I could turn it over to you for public comment, and if you're interested, hit the raise hand feature on Zoom or start to move towards the podium. Okay, I don't see anybody moving towards the podium, so I'll do, um, um, the first person we have is Zoe, followed by Susan L. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Zoe Kessler and I am a longtime Sonoma County resident. I feel very invested in the safety of this community and um, I volunteer for various organizations that support marginalized populations. And as we all know, those populations are increasing by the day due to the most extreme inequity this county has ever faced. I. Um, in speaking on behalf of the inequity, um, I'd like to bring up the personal experience that I've witnessed Santa Rosa Police Department acting with repugnant and abusive behavior towards our unsheltered community. On uh, such occasions of 
being there at encampment sweeps, I witnessed uh, Santa Rosa Police Department completely destroying the property um, of these human beings that they were clean, so, you know, tightly clinging onto for their means of survival uh, under harsh weather conditions at that as well. Um, I need to stress the need, the absolute need for civilian oversight on Santa Rosa Police Department in this community. Um, not only that, um, uh, you know, not only speaking to their behaviors towards unsheltered populations, I'd also like to bring up uh, their behavior during the Santa Rosa protests, during the George Floyd protests in the summer of 2020. And on the topic of that, I will end my public comment with a quote from the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights report, which um, is a nice refresher and reminder to you all that there are no such thing as bad apples in this police department. It should all be reviewed. It should all be uh, looked on with discernment and oversight from our community and not within its own agency. During recent protests of police violence, there have been muted, there have been multiple instances of attempted violent attacks and acts of intimidation against peaceful protesters. These incidents have not been treated seriously by SRPD and have not been adequately investigated. The lack of adequate investigation of such, of such incidents, combined with the violent po policing tactics used by SRPD against peaceful protesters, has created an environment of extreme distrust among community members who believe SRPD has displayed an institution institutional bias against peaceful protest of, of police violence. And in favor of those who would harm protesters, some of those accused of such harm have been exhibited signs of white, supre white supremacist ideology. Thank you. And Susan L, followed by Michael T. Susan Lamont, um, Santa Rosa District 2. Um, following Zoe, the reason that the last auditor lost his job was that the city council, including some members right now, threw an embarrassing hissy fit when the auditor dared to question the city's policies on homelessness and how those policies affected people citizenry and how they affected the morale of police officers. Hopefully there will be nev never be anything that disgusting again. And uh, OIR and Mr. Core particularly will not be subjected to anything like that. Um, I have very extensive experience in um, law enforcement oversight. Since Andy Lopez was killed, I've been at practically every public meeting that has been held and that number is enormous. Um, and I have gone to um, uh, NACL presentations. Uh, for me, the most important, I'm, I'm really impressed with what has been done so far. So I wanna make sure you understand that. And um, I am thrilled to see Mr. Kaur here. Uh, but I really wanna see community involvement. It is phenomenally important. We are at the receiving end of law enforcement and we should have some say in it. And my experience is, is through the county because that's the one that established the first one. And I would like to point out that the county and its handling has been so phenomenally corrupt that it is mind boggling. Um, they tried to undermine the establishment of IOLAIR from the beginning and though community involvement was one of the primary uh, requests of the task force that recommended it. Um, everything has been done particularly, well, I would say since the last director was hired, she was hired 
to destroy public input. And she did a really, really good job of it. And she announced from the very first day that she was going to end as much of it as possible. Uh, so what I want to point out is there will be groups trying to say, don't do this. POA is obviously one of them. And nothing is more important than the community being able to do it. Now, the community is discouraged. The community thinks that public officials don't want to hear from them. And they had totally drifted away in the county because it was like beating your head against a wall. How many bruises can you have? So building it will be hard, but you need to build it. Thank you. And next we have Michael followed by Eric F. Hi there, my name is Michael Detone. I'm with the Sonoma County Tenants Union and um, just making a comment on behalf of myself today. I wanna echo what the last two speakers said. Um, what I wanna say first is the most important thing I think is not so much to build trust between the community and the police department but to make it so that the community doesn't have to trust the police department. That's the point of oversight, right? It's, it's not so that people will drift away and accept that the way things are done is probably justified. It's that we have tools to know that they were justified or not justified. And so I wanna push for making police oversight in Santa Rosa as independent as possible. I would much prefer having a civilian board um, that has some real influence and has some actual independence. So not being in any way controlled by Santa Rosa Police Department. The investigation of the Black Lives Matter protest that was done by OIR group, um, while it had some benefits, the, one of the big problems with it is that the scope of the investigation was determined by the Santa Rosa. So it was not a full investigation. And when we talk about having a civilian oversight board, it needs to be independent so that we can conduct investigations and not necessarily limit ourselves to uh, the, the complaints that were filed with Santa Rosa Police Department, but have the ability to go out and investigate complaints with the permission of the person who is reporting them from other sources. I want to emphasize that the treatment of unsheltered, which we shouldn't really say unsheltered, they're people who live on the streets, um, has been really bad by the police department. It's been abusive and that kind of stuff needs to be investigated. And in order to investigate it, it's gonna take, it's not gonna be easy. There's gonna be a lot of pushback. There's going to be a lot of groups that want to prevent any kind of in, in terms of actually, you know, having someone be challenged um, or having someone possibly lose their job or set a precedent that the police department has to change the way that it does things. So we need to make sure that, um, that we are fighting at every point. Um, I don't want there to be like a measure P where we have a really weak police oversight board because it actually can be really dangerous. It can be more of like a PR tool. If an investigation was done and they didn't find anything because they didn't have the power to see body-worn camera footage, um, then it's, it just makes the police department look like they did nothing wrong when they may have actually done something wrong. And I really like the idea of representation from each district in terms of a public board. So thank you. Eric F. followed by Barbara G. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Eric Frazier and I'm a longtime Santa Rosa resident and I appreciate making some comments today. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent presentation by Brian, John, Jeff, and Teresa. I thought it was really quite informative uh, and enlightening. 
Uh, the previous public comments, uh, I have a lot of sympathy with. I think they're very well thought out. Obviously, there's people in our community that have been affected by uh, policing and have something to say about it. In fact, I would, I would guess that the type of oversight that we have today is, uh, is a response to, uh, you know, several things that have happened in our community over the past few years that showed a dereliction of duty over protecting people's civil rights. So it's sort of with mixed emotion I bring forward this issue because uh, as a longtime civil rights uh, advocate, sometimes I have to get involved in issues that don't have the gravitas of, uh, you know, people that are living on the street or uh, are young people that were innocent victims. Um, but just the same, I wonder why this oversight doesn't also extend to code enforcement. The reason I bring this up is being involved recently in short-term rental uh, regulations. There was a meeting, uh, the report out on the status of that, and I can tell that they're really ginning up the complaint process to make the negative impacts of that community look way out of proportion for what they are. This um, Eric, I need you to bring it back to the topic at hand, please. Yeah, thank you. So the violations here showed this purportedly 100 complaints. But when we dug deep into these 100 complaints, there is a nexus with the Eric, Eric, there's you got to keep your topics. There's Eric, a your, nexus your, with your, your, your topics on the conversation have to be related to our study session item. If you'd like to talk about a separate item, we do have public comment for non-agenda items later. But I think it's really, to, pardon me. We're talking, about, we're talking about <clears throat> community oversight for law enforcement. We can talk about this other issue another time. The, I would think it's very important, Mr. Mayor, when police, is in, police are involved in code enforcement cases, that the officers of code enforcement that are there uh, affecting ordinances and laws have the same oversight. I think this is very important, and I request that my time be returned to the clock so I can finish my comments. You can make your comments about code enforcement and the short-term vacation rental ordinance at the appropriate time, which is the non-agenda item. Thank this you. is a very appropriate time. Thank you. Um, Barbara G, followed by Andrew C. Hi, my name is Barbara Grisecci, and I've been a Sonoma County resident for 22 years and was part of the group that worked to pass uh, Measure P, which provided some additional teeth to the oversight uh, of the Sonoma County Sheriff, which is, of course, currently being uh, appealed uh, and it's going to be on, on appeal after the Deputy Sheriff's Association objected. Um, I'm calling because of how important I feel the civilian oversight of the police department is. Uh, one of the comments that I heard from the POA was that civilian involvement is a, a, a level, adding a level of, level of bureaucracy, which I find hard to understand. These are the people that are being policed. They're the ones that need representation. And often for them, like having a website with everything on it or, you know, being able to lodge a complaint online, there's no trust there. So the idea of, you know, community involvement in that is that each district would have a representation on this committee and that would be done by the council. So each council member could provide their own person that, that then is voted in to this committee. And that person is a trusted member of that community. So things that would never get elevated, problems that would never get resolved, there's a, there's a conduit for it because there are trusted community members that are a part of that process. And so I, I don't, I actually feel like it would reduce bureaucracy because that communication would be so much more open. Um, so that's uh, why I'm calling. I just 
really feel like the only way to make sure that the community feels like they have a trusted voice is to have someone from that community uh, involved in the process. Um, I will commend you on the, the contract with the auditor is very robust and I'm thankful for that, but these aren't people in the community. And if we really want to hear their voices, I think we need much. Okay, we have um, Andrew C. followed by Zoom user. Hey, so, uh, first off, um, First Amendment violation by our very own mayor. That's great, you know, being the gatekeeper of what is appropriate for the community to talk to about related to the uh, enforcement of our laws. Anyway, I'm going to make your jobs a lot easier. I accept your thanks after my comment. First off, you need to defund the police. Every officer you lay off is has perfect oversight, perfect, complete, total oversight. So you could use your emergency powers, given that we have a state of emergency where people are being abused, people are being stolen from, people are being murdered. You could use your emergency powers to lay off half the police force tomorrow. I can't wait to see it happen. Also, you could do the opposite. Here you go, here's solution number two. Give every man, woman, and non-binary person in the city of Santa Rosa city limits a badge. I will personally volunteer to sit at a booth on one of the entrances to our fair city, and I will hand out a free badge and a gun, a firearm. And if you want to put a shooting range behind that, that booth, I will personally give firearms training to all those people coming into the city who have not received it. Now, I am uh, encouraged by the lack of literacy of the local spokesperson uh, for the uh, local police Mafia, the fact that they are not literate means they've got one less tool to use to abuse us, use to shut down our public speeches, use to uh, silence us and murder us. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, time on this, and I look forward to hearing your thanks for my making your job so much easier. And Zoe? The loud? I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, this is Victoria Yanez from Homeless Action Exclamation Point. I am ill with COVID right now, so ex please excuse me if I'm not up to par. But um, I'm calling because, for one thing, I'm very concerned about the city's policy of giving misdemeanors to homeless uh, being swept off of private property. And there's going to be a bunch of cases of those coming up soon. We ask that you ask the district attorney to exercise prosecutorial discretion and dismiss those cases. The other thing is um, we have a problem with the police on the way they deal with individual tents on the street. I'm getting a lot of complaints about police just harassing people that they could not move along. Now, there's a particular officer man. I understand there are two officers man in the Santa Rosa Police Department, but we have had particular complaints about him and we are working on, as soon as I get well, getting those citizen complaints into their personnel files. And I wanna encourage everybody who has a complaint against the police to go through that process. The police department now has them behind the reception window. They should be out for people to just go up and grab. Um, also, um, we ask that the city have a place to put people, uh, um, given that we're at the dawn of a major suite that's going to be happening soon. Thank you very much. 
monitor the police. And um, Alcina, go ahead, please. Hello, my name is Alcina Horstman, and I'd really like to commend you for this presentation. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I've been doing uh, law enforcement oversight for about five years and learning and going to NACOL um, conferences and things like that. So I think actually it looks like a lot's been done that wasn't required to be done. And I'm really grateful about that. And I also agree with uh, what Michael said, uh, you know, about, um, and, and also Susan and Barbara, that we do need people from the community very involved uh, to be helping with this oversight. So I just want to put in a plug, we need civilian oversight, we, we need OIR, and we also need a community panel. I really like the idea of appointing people from uh, for each council member. And I think that's all I have to say, but thank you so much. I know these meetings are brutal for all of us, and I'm grateful to all of you. I can see the rest of my time. Um, Mayor, I don't see any more raised hands and um, nobody's in the chamber, but I do have voicemail public comment. All right, let's go on to the voicemail, please. Hi, my name is Ken Farino. I'm a Santa Rosa resident and taxpayer. I'm calling about agenda item 3.3. I believe that the Santa Rosa Police Department does not need additional civilian oversight or community oversight. So please vote no on this agenda item. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Suzanne Frigio. I am calling regarding um, tomorrow's city council meeting, specifically agenda item number 3.3. Um, we feel it's unnecessary to have the community oversight panel as the OIR, OIR already exists. Um, maybe instead you could put more money towards the police department. Um, thank you. Bye. Hi, my name is Janet McGoldrick and I'm calling about agenda number 3.3 .3. and um, the police uh, do not need public oversight and um, Yeah, my name is Craig Gaylord, and I am commenting on Agenda 3.3. Um, I just wanted to comment that it seems that our police department is really, I've, I've had a number of interactions, and then now, later, I've gotten to know some of the officers, and I've been very impressed with just how, um, I don't know, controlled and uh, and good our police are. As a matter of fact, I wish we had more of a police presence. It seems like we need more police. And I don't think they're doing a bad job. So I don't see why we need to put in more uh, bureaucracy and more oversight. They already have an independent uh, um, uh, auditor and uh, I think they're doing a good job. So I am against this. And to me, it just sounds like it's gonna be something that's gonna be limiting more enforcement and making it where people you know, don't want to, uh, um, we don't need more control, we need just you know, more police and more more of a police presence, and I, I think they're doing a good job. So that's my opinion. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Samantha Wright. I'm calling about uh, an agenda item for the May 24th meeting, um, agenda item number 3.3, .3 about the uh, law enforcement oversight. Um, and I was just calling, I wanted to say that I do not think that it's necessary to have a community oversight panel as well as the OIR group monitoring our police department. Um, I, I think it's just going to be a waste of resources that we really don't need um, and we already have professionals doing it. So, um, you know, I just think that's excessive um, and it's more harmful to have an inexperienced people um, impacting. So, uh, thank you. That's, that's all. Hello, my name is Matt Malosh. I'm calling in regards to agenda item 3.3. .3. I 
would like to say that I've been a center as a resident for over 20 years and that I think the center as a police department is one of the most progressive, professional police agencies in the area, if not the country. I do not believe that a community oversight panel is necessary. I think that the Office of Independent Review uh, does a fantastic job of investigating and holding accountable when necessary uh, the agency and that a community oversight panel uh, would be redundant and not effective, not a good use of resources, uh, limited resources that the city already has, and that the Office of Independent Review, Office of Independent Review uh, is accomplishing that task already. Uh, thank you for your time. Mayor, that concludes voicemail public comment on this item. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam City Manager, if I'm going to bring it back now for Council, can you please help frame for us what type of feedback would be helpful? Give me one second, Mayor. So, so what would be helpful is we currently have an oversight model and it sounds like you want to augment what we currently have. So what is helpful for me is one, do we want to currently, do we want to keep what we currently have, which is the OIR oversight model or do you want to make a recommendation to maybe augment the report out um, of the information or the, um, uh, the investigations that come out of the OIR uh, review? And maybe I think I heard you say uh, maybe use the chief ambassador's team or maybe appoint someone from a district. Um, so. Preferably, it's up to you. So uh, we're going to currently keep the, the current model. But what I'm understanding from you is that you would like to augment the team with a reporting model, whether that's choosing someone from each district or choosing the chief's ambassador team. So what I need to understand from you is how you would like to, to augment our current, current uh, OIR model. Great. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Uh, so I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in first and, and then I can pass it around to other council members. Uh, I think that uh, the chief did a really good job and so did uh, Mr. Core and Mr. Woods and talking about the great things that Santa Rosa is, is doing and is uh, in a lot of ways where we're way ahead of, uh, ahead of other communities, uh, particularly the unfettered access. I think one of the things that I've heard, uh, the biggest concern from the folks who do the work, uh, the men and women who wear the uniform, is being judged on a really difficult job by people who don't have any understanding of what the job actually entails, what the training is, what the policies are. But I think that that's where OIR helps to bridge that gap very effectively. You've got folks who are experts in the field who are also independent from the individual uh, incidents that happen or actions or policies uh, but can both help to translate for the public as well as shed light on for the public uh, how and why things end up happening. Uh, and so I love the OIR, uh, the, the approach that you guys bring and the access that you have. I'm also still interested in having a panel of folks from the community that can ask OIR the, the tough questions, that they can look at it and they can say, I, I understand how you came to, to the conclusion you did, but explain it to me. Uh, talk to me about this. Did you consider this to, to help build that trust with the public that you do have a, a robust oversight model where their voices are heard and their concerns are heard uh, and that they can bring to, to the group and say, we've heard that other communities are doing this policy. How would that work in Santa Rosa? Uh, and so I don't yet know sort of where I, how I would like that constructed, uh, Madam City Manager. Uh, I, I lean towards uh, one person from each district, whether appointed by council member or lottery, what we saw in some communities. I do think that the board needs a representative from the POA if they're willing 
uh, as well as uh, from the police management to be able to have a venue for those discussions about what is the independent work that's being done by the, the auditor, how do we continue to supplement it, how do we answer questions, and how do we then go back and talk to the community about the work that we're doing, uh, because I think it is, is a good model. So that's what I'm interested in. Uh, but let me see, start with Council Member Sawyer, who's got his hand raised, and I'll work my way back down the day. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, there are a number of, of ways to go about this. I for, think, first of all, a lot of the complaints that we heard this evening um, have to do with the past. And I'm sure that there are current issues as well with the police department, um, or at least being uh, you know, mentioned by, by, the, by certain members of the community about the police department. But like I said, the, a lot of these were from the past. Um, it's important to note that OIR reports to the city manager, not to the chief of police. Now, the chief of police may, gives input. Uh, 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 I'm sure that the city manager has every opportunity to, to talk to the chief of police if she has questions about the re about the reports or about about um, any kind of um, communication between herself and um, the OIR. Um, and this, the, you know, there's absolute access to this very open process to, to all segments of our community and their needs. What I, I'm looking for, I'm not looking for change for the sake of change. I think it's important to develop a problem statement. If there are issues that OIR is not handling or not handling well, then the, there, is, there are all sorts of, of ways to access OIR. They're, they have an open door policy. Even Mr. Cora mentioned that he was very complimentary of our current model, um, but we could always do better. We, that, is, that is the case. We can always do better. We can always be more transparent. We can always increase access. So um, it's not perfect. We are not perfect. Um, the, the OIR has been, around, has been with us for six months, and what I would be looking for is a little more time to ascertain what it is that OIR is not doing or not doing well um, and ways to improve that. And if, 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 if it is an, you know, important to have um, citizen oversight, and I'm, I do kind of wonder who they would report to. I mean, the, we know who OIR reports to with, with the citizen oversight report to the city manager. And I'm just so so that that model. I'm not sure what that model looks like. I'm sure there are models out there in in who they report to, but I'm, my guess is that though some of those agencies that have a, civi a civilian oversight um, do not have the comprehensive oversight that we already have. Um, thirteen out of thirteen um, pieces of this recommended um, effective civilian oversight we're handling with OIR. Um, at least to a very high degree. So I would want the I would want to know what the problem statement is. You you don't operate on a patient until you know what the, what the, what you're going after. Um, so I would want a little some more time to identify the gaps in OIR if they if they exist um, and where they exist and and then how to address those before I would be willing to to formally establish a civilian oversight. And I have, you know, no problem with the mayor's recommendation. I just have a, I, my question is why today um, and not give OIR a little more time than six months to be um, effective and, um, and help us affect change in our police department that appears to be, in my opinion, very open to change. Um, those that are not open to change will not be part of our police department, and I am, have the utmost respect for their for their job, for their very difficult job, and also um, respect for the community's input that we so desperately need um, to do a better job. Sometimes, um, if not all the time, we depend on our on our community's in, input. So I'll leave it at that. All right. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Spedo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's been a great discussion here. So overall, there, there, there's some things that I would like to see. Let's see a little bit um, more information about see how this works, because if you look in Council Member Sawyer mentioned this, uh, it was only November of 2021 where he had the new contract with OIR, 
right? So I don't think there's enough data to say, is this working, is it not working? I've heard some very positive things. I'm very optimistic about this and very appreciative of the amount of information that has been shared with this um, OIR group, the 11 points, their scope of work. We didn't have that with our previous police auditor, so I really appreciate that. Then the other reality is we have a new city manager that just started January of this year. And now we're going to make some changes when we still haven't seen how, how, how this is going to play out. And I really appreciate, Madam City Manager, your comments earlier about who you are and what you're. But all of those comments led to the reason why I was 100% supportive of selecting you as our next city manager. And I know you're going to walk the talk. So I'm anxious to see. Let's see what we do with some of this information. You know, one of the other things that um, was kind of disappointing for the folks uh, who are on the Chiefs Community Ambassador team, some folks that may not know them, I know several of these people, and to think that any of these are either yes men for the Chief of Police or it's just, you know, uh, so they have a title, these are people who care deeply about the community, and it's a feedback mechanism that Chief Navarro established. I'd encourage Chief Cregan to evaluate, is this the community ambassador team that you want, and are they going to serve that same need? Because again, I think that's a key component of this. They are all civilians that have a voice, a very strong voice in this community. My only suggestions would be in future presentations from this, I would appreciate this presentation coming from the city manager's office because I, I, I know the chief of police reports to the city manager. Many members of the community don't. And so when we see the presentation from the chief of police, some might imply, okay, is it really being run by the city manager's office? I'd also like to see for not this year's budget, because I know it's coming up, but next year's, all the funding coming out of the senior uh, city manager's budget and not the police department budget, because I just think there's a conflict. So let's truly make it independent in the city manager's office. Yes, they'll be evaluating uh, the police department, but it's, I think that's in the right place, because the city manager is the boss of the chief of police. She gives that direction based on guidance from the council. So I say let's keep this continued path that we're going on here. I'm really anxious to hear the information um, and the modifications, if any, that we have as we continue to get more feedback from the OIR, OIR group in the city manager's office on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We'll go to Council Member McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so just a few things. One, I love the idea of changing over the budget for the independent auditor into the city managers. I think it, potentially there could be time for us to switch that on this budget if it's not too late, since it's still in draft form. Um, just so that we're certain and we can show to the community that this is an independent auditor. And I think that some of the communication that we're missing right now is who actually is our OIR? Who makes up our independent auditor? And I think that's part of the distrust that we feel from our current citizens is there's not a clarity perhaps on what this independent group does, how they're hired, and what their charge is to work with um, our law enforcement officers. And so I think that's the piece that's missing. And as you go out and do these communications within our community, I think some of that perhaps um, stress and mistrust can be alleviated so that we can continue to, to be ambassadors of what we're currently doing because it is quite progressive and I think we should be commended for that work that was being done in November. Um, like Council Members Sawyer and Schwedhelm, I agree that it's very early. It's only been six months that we've had this in place. Clearly we have not done a good enough job getting information out to our community members that this is in place. And so I'd like to give it time. And in fact, I'd like to wait until that first report comes back to Council in March. I don't think that um, having a a citizen oversight group or somebody that we are doing listening sessions with around the um, need for understanding in our community is a bad idea. I just think it's early on in this current process. So I'd like us to revisit that around the same time that we get the report perhaps in March so that we get a whole year for this process to be in place. And then of course having um, everyone at the table. So they talked a lot about having all the stakeholders um, buy it and that includes our law enforcement that includes city councils and in course it includes our community members and so that was a lot of what I heard was that there's still a um, mistrust and I think that's why hybrid models tend to work so well because everybody feels heard and so what I'd like us to be able to do is by listening um, as we go out and and talk about what we're doing now is to see how we're, we can 
maybe meld those two things together. And and um, I think the other thing is, if council could know the response time when somebody does send in a concern, a community concern, that would be important for us to know as well. If somebody is sending something in that was perhaps a complaint about an officer or um, a procedure not being followed properly, if we're not responding back in a quick amount of time, that also creates this distrust. And so making sure that that's done, and I understand that everyone is very overworked and overwhelmed. Um, so I really appreciate the, um, the work that's going into racial identity profiling and using that app, and, and that we are ahead of that curve, that we implemented that six months ahead of time, and I think that that data is critical for us to know as well. And uh, I really appreciate putting money into professional development. And in any industry, you're going to have those bad apples, but it certainly is one that we can remove and so that it doesn't ruin the entire barrel, and I wanna make sure that our community knows that that won't be tolerated and stood for, not by our city manager, certainly not by our police officers. They hold each other, um, you know, responsible as well, and certainly not by the city, city council. So uh, I, I just want to say thank you for the presentation. It was quite um, informative, and I appreciate the data that's also in the presentation on how citizens can get a hold of people if they do have a concern and um, that the forms are both in English and in Spanish. Thanks. All right, thank you, council member. So does Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I, I do have a set of questions, if I could, before I make my comment. Uh, the OIR, how, what's the cost of the OIR to the city of Santa Rosa uh, for the year of 2021? Or 2022 since we implemented so, so late in the year? I don't have the cost of the contract, but I can get back with very, that very information. Well. Uh, what was the cost of litigation due to uh, law enforcement lawsuits? That would be the second part of my question. And I understand if you don't have the numbers handy. Uh, w w my point is I'm pretty sure that the amount that we paid in litigation far exceeds the amount that OIR is costing the city of Santa Rosa. And I'm making the point to some of the callers that, that, that uh, weighed in today. Um, now, in, in regards to, the, to a, another question, is it possible to file a complaint online anonymously? T Teresa, would you like to handle that question and walk them through the process? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, it's it's nice to have the opportunity to present to you all. Um, so if someone is wanting to contact our group, um, you have the email addresses um, so that you can do so um, using either the email directly or if you wish to contact us anonymously, we do have a form available online. Um, and so if you go to our website, which is oirgroup.com, you can file a complaint um, on behalf uh, uh, on behalf of yourself or of someone else, um, and you can do so anonymously. So that is submitted through our website. Um, and again, that website is oirgroup.com. You'll see the contact us there, and you can submit directly to our group. We will receive that complaint, um, and that complaint then can be forwarded to uh, the police department for their internal review. Um, and again, as we've said um, several times here, um, the OIR group is doing the review um, of complaints in real time um, alongside the police department. And so um, I would like to assure people from the community that we have uh, hands-on uh, in that particular process. And so that would be one method that you could um, submit a complaint anonymously online. Thank you. And the reason I ask is because we did, we did hear the comment of not being able to access the forms as they were behind the window. So I just want to let the public know that there are alternative means to file a complaint should you have one. Uh, as council members, I believe we're on the front line when it comes to complaints from our constituents. So when there is an issue in our community, I'm pretty sure I can speak for all of us that we get to hear it first. Uh, it's why I feel that it's important for a community to be at the table, or as the saying says, if you're not at the table, you're what's for dinner, right? Um, and, and in following that model, 
the model, if you ask me what, what would be the, the model that I envision, it would definitely be OIR reporting to our city manager, and I'd love the idea of the cost coming out of the city manager opposed to the police department to show transparency and independence. Uh, what I would like to see reporting to the OIR is the POA, is the, the, the community, and it is the police department. And I would see that happening through one appointee from each each individual, each council member, and as well as the POA and the PD. Uh, I, I fear that that's the model that is all inclusive. And if we are serious about being inclusive uh, and bringing the community to the table. Um, other than that, I have nothing else to add. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, so, Madam City Manager, I did not hear four council members interested in bringing this back at the time. What I did hear was an interest in as we get to our um, community meetings later in the year into the, the first full report out from OIR, uh, that that might be a good opportunity for us to, to continue to talk about where we're doing things well and where we might need some additional supplementation down the road. Uh, so with that, I want to just thank everybody from the team for being here. Uh, Chief, Mr. Kaur, Mr. Woods, uh, I appreciate the whole team for being here and for the presentation. It really was eye-opening for a lot of folks and, and I think it was a, a good step. Uh, with that, council is going to take a dinner break. We'll resume council at seven o'clock with our first public hearing, item 15.1. As a reminder, we pulled item 15.2, uh, but we'll come back with 15.1 and then finish out our, our items. Thank you, everybody.
All right, Madam Clerk, let's call the roll and reestablish our quorum. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Here. Council Member Sawyer? Here. Council Member Rogers is absent from the meeting today. Council Member McDonald? Here. Council Member Fleming is absent from the meeting this afternoon. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Present. Mayor Rogers? Yep. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council members Fleming and R Rogers. All right. So before we go to item 15.1, let's go ahead and take care of our two resolutions. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with uh, item 6.1. That's our proclamation for affordable housing month. Mr. Vice Mayor, I believe you are going to read the resolution. Yes, sir, with your permission. Yep. This is the City of Santa Rosa Proclamation for Affordable Housing. Whereas affordable housing is good for business, people, and the quality of life in the City of Santa Rosa. And whereas our community thrives when all families have a place to call home. And whereas the City of Santa Rosa and Housing Authority of the City of Santa Rosa have made affordable housing an important goal to be achieved by providing annual funding for the development of new units and are decreasing barriers to the construction and rehabilitation, rehabilitation uh, process and whereas an adequate supply of housing types is necessary throughout the city in order to meet the needs of all economic segments of the city's population as well as all demographic segments of the residents in the city and whereas Santa Rosa City Council supports citywide efforts in developing and sustaining affordable housing for the residents of Santa Rosa and is committed to safe, stable, and affordable housing for all its residents. And whereas, Affordable Housing Month is a time to recommit to our mission to promote awareness, fairness, inclusion, and justice in housing. And whereas, our thriving community is encouraged to build local support and recognize Affordable Housing Month which supports the sharing of best practices, opportunities, and solutions to provide affordable housing that is the right of all individuals. Now, therefore, be it resolved that our Mayor, Chris Rogers, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby proclaim, proclaim May as Affordable Housing Month. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. I do see we have uh, Director Basinger who had her hand up. Good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of council. On behalf of the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Rosa and the City's Department of Housing and Community Services, I would just like to acknowledge all the efforts that the Housing Authority Commissioners, our staff and the community have made um, on a daily basis to advance affordable housing within the City of Santa Rosa. So thank you for taking the time to recognize May as Affordable Housing Month. And I can assure you that our staff will continue their efforts to provide affordable housing to the residents of Santa Rosa. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Council Member McDonald, do you wanna read the second proclamation? Yes, thank you, Mayor. The City of Santa Rosa has a proclamation for National Wildfire Awareness Month. Whereas since 2017, the City of Santa Rosa was threatened and directly impacted by the Tubbs, Nuns, Kincaid and Glass fires. And whereas the Tubbs fire was one of the most destructive wildfires in the state history. And whereas according to the National Interagency Fire Center, humans cause an average of 68% of fires per year in the United States. And whereas in 2021, 8,835 fires burned 2,568,984 acres across California, and whereas prevention campaigns and public outreach through collaborative efforts is fundamental in reducing the threat of wildfires, and whereas wildfire preparedness is year-round and takes all of us to safeguard our lands, our communities, and our livelihoods by reducing hazardous fuels, creating defensible space, home hardening, and taking personal responsibility for our actions. Now, th now therefore, be it resolved that Chris Rogers, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby proclaim May as National Wildfire Awareness Month. 
Thank you, Council Member. And I think, do we still have Paul here? Yes, Paul's here. Yes. <laughs> go, go for it, Paul. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor Alvarez, and members of the Council. My name is Paul Lowenthal, Division Chief Fire Marshal with the Fire Department. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to bring wildfire awareness to our community through this proclamation. Also, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, our community, departments, agencies, uh, and other cooperating partners that came together last weekend for the Ready Santa Rosa event. It was another successful opportunity uh, for us to engage with our community to help prepare for what seems to be, unfortunately, the new normal around here as we head into another drought season. Uh, with that, wildfire season will be declared here locally uh, on June 6th, and we encourage our residents and community to use our resources at srcity.org forward slash wildfire ready and srcity.org forward slash ready SR to continue to be prepared. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Council members, any comments on the proclamations before I go to public comment? All right, let's see if we have any public comment on these two items. Um, uh, oh, we have, um, we have a member of the public, Mr. Harder. No? Okay. Public comment, okay. No, um, there are no raised hands and nobody in the chamber. Thank you. Okay, and no pre-recorded voicemail? No pre-recorded voicemails. Perfect. All right, thank you everybody. We'll move on to item 15.1. It's our public hearing. And again, for the for the public, it's the only public hearing we'll be doing tonight. Item 15.2 has been pulled and will be heard at a later date. Mayor? Yes, sir. Uh, is there someone here on behalf of the affordable housing community that is accepting the proclamation? Vice Mayor Alvarez, there is not. Um, she had to leave the meeting, so we can give it to Megan to um, for to pass on to the Housing Authority. Thank you. All right, Madam City Manager. Item 15.1 is a resolution of necessity for the acquisition by eminent domain of easement interest in portions of real property property commonly known as 4912 and 4914 Highway 12, APNS 031-240-006 and 031-240-067 for the Los Alamos Trunk Sewer Replacement Project. Um, a, a real property agent, Stephanie Valkovic, will pres uh, give the presentation. And before we jump into the presentation, Madam City Clerk, uh, I believe you have to ascertain whether or not a record uh, has been sent to the property owner. Yes, um, this is to confirm that I did receive a record of the proof of mailing of the notice of hearing that invited the owner to appear and be heard on the matters of this public hearing. The hearing was noticed. The hearing notice was provided to the property owner by first class mail 15 calendar days before the hearing in accordance with the statute. The property owner has responded and will be speaking at tonight's hearing. Okay. All right, Jill, it's all yours. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Jill Scott, the real estate manager. In this portion of the hearing, um, I'm glad to introduce to you Mark Easter from Best Best and Krieger Law Firm. He's our outside counsel that is helping us with this resolution of necessity. And Mark is going to go through the purpose of the Ron hearing. Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. So <clears throat> uh, members of the city council and mayor, this is a hearing for the city of Santa Rosa to consider adopting a resolution of necessity to use its eminent domain power to acquire both temporary and permanent easement interests for this Los Alamos trunk, trunk sewer replacement project. To adopt the resolution necessity, the city council has to, by two thirds vote, or tonight would be uh, two thirds vote of all of its voting members, which tonight would be 5-0 uh, since there's two absent, the following findings. First, that <clears throat> the public interest in necessity requires the project. Second, that the project can plan in a manner that's most beneficial to the public with the least private injury, and third, that the property interests to be acquired are necessary for the project, 
And finally, that the offer of just compensation that's required by the government code has been made. Uh, the way the, the hearing will proceed is uh, staff's going to make a presentation on these findings, and then any interested property owners will be given an opportunity to speak, and they're not limited to the, um, th three minutes. And then any members of the public who are interested in speaking will be given an opportunity to speak. And then after any questions, the hearing is closed and put to a vote. Oh, and I should mention a couple other things. The issue of, of value and appraised value is not really on the table tonight. It's the findings that I mentioned. Uh, the property owner will have an opportunity to make a claim for greater compensation in the proceedings if the uh, council adopts a resolution. And adopting the resolution doesn't close off uh, further negotiations with the property owner. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Um, next, Stephanie Valkovic, is <clears throat> associate real property agent, is going to give the presentation on the project necessity. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. To recap, we are here this evening to discuss easements needed in connection with the Los Alamos trunk sewer replacement project and specifically those easements which affect a portion of Miss Samantha Zappelli's property located at 4912 and 4914 Sonoma Highway. Next slide, please. The project is designed to provide upgrades to the 60-year-old existing Los Alamos trunk sewer located in eastern Santa Rosa and was identified by the 2014 Sanitary Sewer System Master Plan Update as the number one high priority project for maintaining desired service levels within the city's sewage collection system. Next slide, please. Segment one of the project begins at Streamside Drive and runs easterly, terminating at Elaine Drive. This alignment was selected in order to effectively collect all flows currently flowing into the existing trunk sewer, as well as it was excuse me, as well as it was designed in an effort to minimize the amount of bypass pumping operations that will be necessary during the construction period, uh, minimize potential impact on future development of private properties impacted by the easements, and minimize the impact on heritage trees. Next slide, please. Ms. Sapelli's property, the subject property, is located south of Highway 12 and west of Elaine Drive towards the end of segment one. The existing trunk sewer crosses a portion of the property as noted in red on this exhibit. And the proposed easements for the realigned trunk are identified in teal. Next slide, please. The city and its right-of-way consultant have actively negotiated with Ms. Apelli over the course of the past 16 months with dozens of phone calls several site visits, including a site visit where the easements were staked at the property owner's request, and well over 75 emails exchanged over the course of those months um, in an effort to negotiate an agreement. However, the parties have been unable at this time to reach a mutual agreement on fair market value of the easements. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The city first extended a formal offer to Ms. Zappelli in January 2021 in the amount of the appraised value provided by the city's appraiser. Ms. Zappelli then had the opportunity to hire an independent appraiser at city expense to value the easements. Next slide, please. The independent appraisal came back significantly higher than the city's original appraised value. However, in an effort to reach an agreement, the city made a revised offer to Ms. Sapelli in September 2021 on the basis of that independent appraisal. And in November 2021, the city made one last revised and final offer providing additional compensation above that already provided for the replacement of some fruit trees that will be impacted by the project. In spite of these good faith efforts, the parties have yet to reach an agreement on price and terms. Next slide, please. Therefore, it is recommended by the Water and Transportation and Public Works Departments 
and real estate services that the council, city council adopt, or excuse me, conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution of necessity by a two thirds vote declaring the necessity of acquisition by eminent domain of two permanent easement interests and two temporary construction easement interests in portions of certain real property, more particularly described as Sonoma County Assessor Parcel Numbers 031-240-006 and 031-240-067 for the Los Alamos Trunk Sewer Replacement Project. Um, and that concludes this portion of the presentation and I'll turn it back over to the city's real estate manager, Joel Scott. Thank you, Stephanie, um, council member, um, council members and mayor. Um, Stephanie and I and Mark are here throughout the um, public hearing to answer any additional questions that council may have. Um, we also have um, supporting staff, the project team, representatives from the water department um, and city consultants that have worked on this available if they're needed. All right, thank you so much, Jill and Stephanie, really appreciate it. Council, do we have any questions? All right, seeing none, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Do we have Ms. Zappelli or her representative here to speak? Hi, my name is Samantha Zappelli. And I'm not opposed to the project or fighting that issue of allowing the project to go through. I've just had some questions and concerns because the addresses are wrong on the project, like the one AP number is for 4916 Sonoma Highway. And I've asked them to um, split the project up per AP number. Um, but we've been going back and forth with different things. That's why there's been so many emails. Um, and also with pricing and um, appraisals that were added to, um, I'm sorry, the comps that were added to the appraisals are not correct and the square footage is different on many different things. But my main concern is separating the two parcel numbers and how much square foot is on each one, um, how they're going to um, remove the old project because it's all zoned for apartments. So it's going to limit us if we want to, in the future, um, build and expand apartments because there's four parcels that are grouped together. So it kind of goes in the middle. It's not just like it's at the end of one parcel. So those are my concerns. And I've asked, because um, I'm not knowledgeable, I've asked them to go over it with me. And Stephanie has said that, you know, they don't have a legal department to do that. It's up to me to understand and do it, but I want to know what I'm signing because I don't have the knowledge um, so yeah, and not that I'm fighting the project. I just want some things clarified and understand what I am signing. So. Great, thank you for, for being here. Do we have anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? Um, Mayor, I don't see anybody going towards the podium and we don't have any raised hands or voicemail public comment. All right, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing then and I'll bring it back. And Jill, could you uh, respond a little bit around the question about splitting the APM numbers and about potential discrepancies in, in uh, some of the numbers? Sure, I would be happy to, Mayor. Um, so as we've tried to explain to Ms. Sopelli on um, numerous occasions and several different staff members, um, the APNs are correct. Um, we've staked the easement area where the easement is going so she can see exactly where it is. Um, we've explained to her that the once the new one is built, the old easement um, will be vacated. Um, and we have not found any discrepancies in um, in anything in either in the city's appraisal or the other appraisal, um, which we have had reviewed and gone through several times. Um, we've made, staff has made um, numerous, numerous attempts to um, try to explain this. Um, at this point, we think it's probably best and we've um, told Ms. Sapelli this, that she retain her own counsel. Um, we did uh, pay for her to get her own appraisal 
um, and her appraiser has also tried to explain um, the complicated appraisal to her. Um, and she's still not feeling um, comfortable with it. And so that's why we recommend that she retain her own counsel um, and even potentially find another appraisal uh, appraiser to appraise the property for her. Um, we feel like we have, as staff, we've tried very hard to um, come to an agreement to explain the process. Um, I've tried myself, Stephanie's tried, and also our consultant. Um, and there just seems to be a communication gap. Um, so at this point, um, we are recommending moving forward with the hearing process. If okay, I, thank you. If, if I may, Mr. Mayor, I also want to um, emphasize again, as Mr. Easter did, um, that the scope of this hearing is very limited. Uh, it's really about the necessity of the project, the necessity of this project, and not about the appraisals or the price. Thanks. Great, thank you. So bring it back. Any other questions from council members? Mr. Vice Mayor, do you have your hand up? Yes, I do, Mayor. Go for it. Will any changes with this easement impede any future use of the property, such as a more denser conditional use permit or anything of that nature? Um, that's a difficult question to answer, Vice Mayor, but I'll do my best. Um, if she were to, the new, um, the new easements are very, are, um, were specifically designed to go to the very end of her property, um, on the other side of her business. So, um, she could potentially, you know, completely um, redevelop the whole property, getting rid of the um, business and the house she has now. And so if that were the case, yes, I guess it could um, slightly, but it is to the edge of the of the property as much as we could get it um, where the alignment would work. But where it is now, um, you know, any sort of um, damages, I guess you could use the word, um, are awarded to her within um, the appraisals. Does that answer your question? Any, any damage caused by the city would be awarded to her? Is, did I is, a, is, is contemplated within the appraisals and awarded to her. Within the appraisal, the current appraisal? Yes. Correct. Thank you. And you did answer my question. Okay, seeing no other questions, Councilmember Sawyer, can you please put a motion on the table for discussion? Thank you, Mayor. I'll introduce a resolution of the Council of the City Santa Rosa adopting a resolution of necessity for the acquisition by eminent, eminent domain of easement interests in portions of certain real property commonly known as 4912 and 4914 Highway 12, and more particularly, described as assessor's parcel number 031-240-006 and 031-240-067 for the Los Alamos Trunk Sewer Replacement Project and wait for the reading of the text. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Sawyer and a second from Council Member Schwedhelm. Is there any additional discussion from Council? Okay, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the vote. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member McDonald? No. Council Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? No. Okay, that motion fails by a two thirds All vote. Right. All right, Madam City Attorney, I would ask for reconsideration at our next meeting. That will be fine. We can bring it back for reconsideration at the next meeting. Great. Thank you. All right, Council, I appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. We're going to go ahead and move back to the beginning of our agenda. Uh, so we've done our study sessions. We've done our proclamation. Let's go to our staff briefings, item number seven. Item 7.1 is a COVID-19 update. Sonoma County Public Health reported last week that the Bay Area now has California's highest COVID infection rates due to the prevalence of the highly contagious Omicron subvariants. 
to, pre to prevent the spread, Bay Area public health officials are urging individuals to mask up indoors, <coughs> keep tests handy, stay home if you are sick, and get your booster shots when eligible. Last week, the White House announced that Americans are now eligible for a third order of free at-home COVID test. COVID tests can be ordered at covidtest.gov. This week, the FDA authorized Pfizer COVID booster for children ages 5 to 11. For more information about the status of COVID in our community, testing locations, and vaccine information for all ages, please go to socoemergency.org. Council, do we have any questions for the city manager on today's COVID-19 response update? All right, let's see if there's any public comments on the item. Um, Mayor, I don't see any raised hands and nobody is walking towards the podium and there are no public comment, voicemail public comments. All right, let's roll right into our city manager and city attorney updates then. Uh, Madam city manager, do you want to kick us off? Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, Jason, that assistant city manager. On behalf of the city manager uh, and the planning and economic development part department, we want to congratulate Jessica Jones, the city of Santa Rosa's newest deputy director of planning. Jessica has almost 22 years of urban planning experience, 14 of which were with the city of Santa Rosa and progressing from city planner to, from si city planner to senior planner to supervising planner and now as deputy director. Jessica over will oversee both development review and advanced planning sections in the planning and economic development department and congratulations to jessica uh, in addition the city has just received the award of excellence for a comprehensive plan in a large jurisdiction category for the downtown station area specific plan this plan was provided by the northern california chapter of the apa which is the american planning association and has also been submitted for consideration at the state level the downtown station area specific plan was a grant funded effort that was adopted in October 2020. The major move includes eliminating parking requirements for the entire plan area, eliminating residential densities, and moving to floor area ratio and expressing maximum flexibility on land use while establishing design guidelines. It has catalyzed new development with over 750 housing units approved or in the pipeline in the last 18 months or in the, in the months since it was adopted. So a great day and fantastic news for the Planning and Economic Development Department and congratulations. Thank you, Jason. Madam City Attorney, do you have a report? Nothing to report this evening, thanks. All right, Council, do we have any questions for uh, Assistant City Manager Jason Nett? Let's go to public comment on the City Manager and City Attorney update. Um, Mayor, I don't see any raised hands. There's no voicemail public comment and nobody is walking towards the podium. All right, let's go on to statements of abstention from Council members. We have anybody who needs to abstain from any of the items on tonight's agenda. Okay, seeing none, let's go into our mayor and council member report. Who wants to start? Council member McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Climate Action Committee met um, recently and we had a great a presentation by the Sonoma County um, Climate Action Group and what they're doing. And a couple things that stood out to me was their ability to telecommute through the county and how they have an app that shows a reduction in um, carbon, uh, carbon footprint and they can track that as uh, employees. So I thought that was one of the great things that they're doing at the county level and their ability to partner with the city on some of the things that they're doing. And the presentation that they did is actually all on that agenda. So I would just recommend that those interested in what the county is doing for 
uh, climate resiliency and making sure that we're doing our part for climate action uh, to take a look at that. Um, we also had a report at that same meeting on our bicycle and pedestrian master plan for 2018 and much of that plan is really focused on what we're doing within the city to create more safe um, bicycle and pedestrian pathways so that we can really commit to ensuring safety and um, use of bicycles throughout the community. I met with Creative Sonoma County and the Social Advocates for Youth, or Social, yes, yeah, Social Advocates for Youth, sorry my dyslexia played a moment there on me, um, and we did a, I did a tour of their property and, uh, you know, one of the really extremely concerning issues that they brought up specifically at this time was around the increase in sex trafficking um, and that's due to the increase in our tourism in Sonoma County and so I think it's something that we need to take a look at, not only as city council, but what we're doing in the county to combat this. And so I just want to say thank you to SAY for the work that they do to protect children and youth and give them an opportunity for a safe space to be. Um, Lo Cien held their awards uh, ceremony last week and I was able to attend that and see some very well-deserved recipients of awards for doing great things um, in our community, specifically for our um, <coughs> Spanish-speaking population. Tomorrow, I'm scheduled to go to the Firefighters 101 training. I, it should be interesting. I have warned them most of my strength is in my brain, and so to go easy on me. And I'm very excited to announce that I have somebody that I'll be appointing to the Community Advisory Board. Her name is Iris Harrell. She lives in the Oakmont um, neighborhood, and she is a member of the Oakmont Village um, Association. She's a general contractor and owns her own builder and design company with 40 employees and has um, had an extensive career in contracting. She's managed design permits and constructions uh, projects through the Oakmont community, such as their pickleball court. and. Um, renovations and so I believe she will be a fantastic um, liaison for the community advisory board and I look forward to seeing that appointment through at the end of this week to be official. So I want to thank her for her willingness to serve her community in the current role that she has in Oakmont but then also to serve her greater community in Santa Rosa as one of my appointees. Thank you. Thank you council member. Let's go to council member Sweno. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, report out on two things. Uh, on May 12th, we had our most recent Groundwater Sustainability Agency meeting, which we discussed the rate and fee study, which will be before this council later on in this agenda. Additionally, we appointed Marcus Trotta as a new plan manager. The reason we uh, got to appoint Marcus is that Jay Jasper, who has been our only plan manager since 2017, is retiring July 1st. So I want to uh, compliment Jay for the excellent job he's done as the plan manager and really looking forward to Marcus, who has been an integral part of that groundwater sustainability plan. We also approved the new administrative services team, uh, the West Yost Associates. Uh, I participated in an interview of this team along with the chair of the Petaluma Basin, which was David Rabbit, Supervisor Rabbit, also the Sonoma Valley Basin uh, Chairwoman Susan Gorn, and we unanimously selected West Yo. So they'll be the administrative and grant uh, provider or grant, grant administrative services providers for all three GSAs. And the second item was uh, on May 15th, I attended the first virtual in response team community meeting. Uh, it was a great job by um, both our public safety chiefs as well as uh, Buckaloo, Catholic Charities, everyone else who was involved there. And it was really encouraging all the positive comments, but there were over 100 virtual participants in that meeting. So it's a great way to try to educate the community about what that team is doing and also affords the opportunity to provide some feedback. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much, council members. Uh, I've got a couple of quick updates uh, for tonight. First, I want to start with a big congratulations to Deputy Director Megali Teas, who was chosen as LifeWorks Champion for Change this year, uh, and I had a chance uh, to get recognized for that over the weekend. So I want to just applaud her for that. Uh, we love the work that she's doing here at the city, and it's a well-deserved recognition. I uh, wanted to say a big congratulations to our team who have been working hard for nearly 20 years on the Lower Colgan Creek uh, project. We did have an opportunity to do a ribbon cutting for this uh, this last Thursday, 
uh, for phase two of the project. Uh, when it's completed, it'll be a 1.3 mile walkway uh, from L.C. Allen High School to Victoria Drive that should be well utilized by our youth and an opportunity for them to see uh, some, some good natural habitat, natural plants, as well as a very healthy creek and stream uh, for us here. Uh, I'll also uh, just mention our team was very excited and I saw many folks out there uh, with our um, Wednesday night market starting back up last week. Uh, and our, our crews were out there with some of the, the big materials, some of the big uh, equipment for folks to, to take a look at to hopefully spur some interest in, in uh, children going into those fields as well. So well done to our team on that all around. And last thing, I wanted to remind council members and the public, uh, this Thursday is uh, the first the first game uh, for the Santa Rosa Scuba Divers at Doyle Park. So hope to see folks out there really excited. And I know our park team is really excited to be out there as well. With that, we'll go ahead and see if there's any public comment for council member report. Mayor, there's no, um, I see no raised hands. There's no voicemail public comment and uh, nobody but staff in the chamber. <laughs> All right, we'll keep moving then. Uh, Mr. Mayor, go on. Mr. Yes. Mayor, if I may, um, I'd like to loop back to the request for reconsideration. Um, and it was pointed out, and I realized I did err, I have an error there. Um, it needs to be someone from the majority vote uh, to request the reconsideration. That can be done at the next council meeting. Um, I need to confirm that, um, but that's, uh, that's the, where we are. At the, risk of arguing, at the risk of arguing with an attorney, uh, Madam City Attorney, I believe it's actually from the side that prevails, not from the majority side. So I think we've run into this a time or two before, but it has to be somebody who, who sided with the winning position. Let me look at what the what the um, manual says, and then I will step back in. Um, but you're right. I know we've had that issue where we've had a tie vote, and what we've done is treated the uh, treated the no's as the prevailing because the in a tie it doesn't pass. So what you're arguing or what you're suggesting was is that the same rule would apply here, although it was a minority of the vote. So let me confirm in the in the section. I have it up on my computer and I'm just going to find that particular section. So, we, I appreciate that. We also can ask uh, one of the other council members who voted the opposite direction if they would also be okay with reconsideration just to cover our bases while the public is watching and while we figure this out. Okay. It in, is in the short. I was going to say it's Go ahead, um, any member uh, who voted with the majority may move to reconsider or rescind any action at the time. So the issue when we have a tie vote is that there is no majority. Um, uh, so, so if a member of the majority vote here. Um, wants to request reconsideration, we can do that, uh, or it can be done at the next uh, available meeting. Okay, I appreciate that. And I see Councilmember Sawyer's hand come up. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Um, I would request a, a reconsideration on the prior item. Thank you. Okay, and I think our, our bases are covered, right, Sue? Pardon? I, I believe our bases are covered now. Bases are covered. That's the motion. And do we have a second? I will second that. Very good. Seconder doesn't is not required to have voted with the majority. And we will then list um, the item on the agenda for the next uh, council meeting. Thank you. Madam City Attorney, okay. is it necessary to take a vote on the reconsideration? Um, let's go ahead and take a vote. Uh, it's unclear in the procedures. You know, there's some of our procedures that just require when we're when we're scheduling something on the council agenda. Uh, it's a little unclear in this particular instance, but 
uh, having a full vote would cover the basis. So thank you. Okay, just one moment, please. Madam City Attorney, that's just uh, to, for clarification. That's just to reconsider the vote. We're not voting on the item again. We're not. We're not Very reporting well. on the item again. Um, we're voting to whether to reconsider uh, the motion and whether to we'll schedule if the motion passes. We'll schedule it for the next uh, available council meeting. Well, thank you for the clarification. And I see Councilmember Schmidhelm with his hand raised as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just so we don't have to do this again, since we are no longer on that item, can we be even having a vote that's not on this agenda? Since that item closed, might we want to bring it up when it's actually on the agenda? So there's no members of the public here, and it just seems like this is out of context. We just can't put things not on the agenda to reconsider but I'm open to your thoughts or suggestions. Um, it actually says uh, a member who voted with the majority may move to reconsider or rescind any action at the same or next following meeting, providing no legal rights have intervened to create an estoppel. Um, if we want to wait until the next meeting, I don't think that we need to, but if, um, if that feels more transparent to the community, um, I would suggest that that motion then be made um, at the, in, in the council reports. Um, we don't normally agendize the, the request for recommend for reconsideration. Um, so that would be the other option. I'm not sure it's a lot more transparent, but um, it would, it would, it's another option if you're more comfortable with that. So if I'm hearing you say doing it this way, you believe would be procedurally correct. I, I do. Okay. That's all. I just want to make yeah. sure. And, Thank you. And the, the, the reconsideration itself will be agendized. Um, and uh, the property owner will receive a new notice of that reconsideration. I should say notice of the reconsideration since it's not a re-noticing of the reconsideration. So. Okay. So what I heard, Sue, and uh, for the public is that we have a motion and a second for reconsideration that uh, will appear on the next agenda where the council will have to vote whether to reconsider the item and if the council chooses to reconsider the item, then we will actually rehear the item as well and vote on it. I thought you were going to take a vote tonight to reconsider. If your preference is to wait and reconsider it, this is this is different than the um, when you're moving to put something on the agenda. You move and second, and then have another meeting. Um, if, if the council is more comfortable uh, with waiting and having that vote next week, we can, or next at your next meeting, we can do that. Um, but from my perspective, according to the policy, um, you, ca you can vote uh, at this meeting if you so desire. Yeah, for the, for the sake of transparency and with the confusion and the, the questions around it, uh, let's agendize it for the vote for reconsideration at the next meeting as well as than to actually hear it, let's list both on the agenda so that people know that, that both are an offer, uh, are a possibility. So in that case, I would be re withdrawing my motion. Um, to await. If we're, if we're gonna agendize it, in order to, for us yeah. to agendize it, I think it would be helpful oh, true. to have your motion in the second on the table. Yes. We will then agendize it for a vote at your next meeting. I will withdraw my withdrawal. And I will, I will note a little bit off, off agenda, but um, perhaps this is a section of our procedure of, on our, our manual on procedures and protocols. This section might be due for uh, clarification. I think the last time I was involved with the reconsideration was probably about 12 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> May I ask a okay. clarifying question, Mayor? Just yeah. a point, point of clarification. So right now we're going to be voting on the request for consideration and that's been moved and seconded and that motion's on the table. And then would it be in order for procedure to then put a secondary motion on the table for a time certain on the public comment on uh, that specific item? Uh, the, so what I, would, what I would say, council member, is what has been tradition, how we have done things to add things to the agenda is once you have a motion and a second debate stops because we haven't agendized or given public notice of that vote that we are going to take, even if it's adding something to the agenda. So we have the motion in the second. We will put it on the next agenda where next time we will vote on whether or not to formally reconsider the, the item. 
So the, the individual will also uh, receive notice of both of those so that they can weigh in on both the reconsideration if they want, as well as if we do end up rehearing the item. Um, and, and so we'll go with that. And public hearings technically are uh, as close to time certain as we can get. We try to start them around five o'clock. We just happen to go exceptionally long today on our study sessions, uh, but it'll be uh, agendized, uh, and I still can speak to this, it'll be agendized with the same language, which is that we'll try to take it as close to five o'clock as possible. Mayor, if I could, if I could ask a quick question, um, Madam City Attorney, is there a re-noticing requirement for the Ron hearing, and would that then dictate timelines? Uh, there will be a noticing requirement for the new Ron hearing. What will take place at the next uh, agenda, the next uh, council meeting, will be the vote on the reconsideration. The timing of the reconsideration vote, yes, we'll have to allow enough time to notice the property owner. Um, in accordance with the statute. And that noticing requirement, uh, as I recall, is 15 calendar days before the uh, RON hearing, so. Yep. Is everybody clear? Are Excellent. We, we'll move on to uh, item 11 then. Are, are we taking a vote on this or no? No, we. No, we are adding this to the agenda for a, a vote at our next meeting. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go to item 11. We have 11.1 .1 and 11.2. They're our regular minute meeting, meeting minutes from March 15th of March 29th. Does anybody have any questions or additions to those two sets of minutes? Councilmember Sawyer, I'm assuming your hand is still up. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's go to public comment and see if anybody has any amendments uh, that they'd like to offer to those two minutes. Uh, Mayor, there's no voicemail, public comment, no hands raised, and uh, no members of the public in the chamber. Okay, but if there's no objection from council members, we'll show those adopted as presented. And I'm seeing no objection. Madam City Manager, if you'd like to go to the consent calendar. Item 12.1 is a resolution award five year extension to F001438 general service agreement with Ad Myers Inc. for citywide janitorial services. Item 12.2 is a resolution approval of a purchase order for two Caterpillar diesel forklifts to Holt of California, Sacramento to replace existing assets in Santa Rosa Water Department. Item 12.3 is a resolution approval of additional funds to contingency for general services agreement F002071 HVAC maintenance and repair services. Item 12.4 is a resolution, professional service agreement approval for Biggs Cardoza, Cardoza Associates, Inc. associated with the 2021 Bridge Repair Planning Program. <laughs> Item 12.5 is a resolution, extension of proclamation of existence of local emergency related to the threat to community health posed by COVID-19. Item 12.6 is a resolution, <laughs> Extension of proclamation of local homeless emergency. Item 12.7 is a resolution making required monthly findings and authorizing the continued use of teleconferencing for public meetings of the city council and all city boards, commissions, and, com and committees pursuant to Assembly Bill 361. That's it, thank you. All right, Council, do you have any questions? Council Member Sweatown. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I do have a question on uh, item 12.4. Mr. S or the person who is answering is present. Yes, the person who is answering, I, I'll, I'll ask Lisa Welsh to be brought up. She's Associate Civil Engineer with the Transportation and Public Works, and this is her item. Great, so my question on this regarding the bridges, <clears throat> um, it stems from the report that 
this body received a couple months ago regarding bridges and Ben Valley Golf Course city property. So I know this talks about the Caltrans is for <clears throat> spans greater than 20 feet in vehicle bridges, but then also other waterway crossings such as vehicle and pedestrian bridges and culverts less than 20 feet are assessed by city personnel every four years. So my question is, because I'm guessing some of the bridges on Ben Valley Golf Course city property are longer than 20 feet. So who would inspect them? And is this part of that? Because I didn't notice any of the 46 bridges being any on Ben Valley property. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I would, I can answer that question. Um, the golf courses are pedestrian bridges. Um, they are not included in the anticipated list of this uh, PSA, but uh, there is a contingency in the contract. So, and it allows for con uh, consideration of up to five additional bridges to be evaluated. Um, the pedestrian bridges doesn't matter the length of them. Um, if it's even exceeding 20 foot, if it's a pedestrian bridge, not a vehicle bridge, it's not evaluated by Caltrans. It would be to the city staff. So again, I guess I heard that could be, my question to city staff, are they gonna be observing those after what we had the uh, consultants say that there were some were dangerous, which I asked a lot of questions about that. I'm hoping some steps are being taken to evaluate the safety of all those bridges on that city property. Is that gonna be the oh. case, whether it's this item or somewhere else? Yes, that'll be within the city. It's, a, it's within the city staff, uh, current like evaluations for the annual evaluations. So it's not part of this. It's city staff is going to be doing it. There hasn't been any found. All the things within all of the bridges under this have been found to have some deficiency that needed to be looked at by a professional bridge expert. And, and Council Member Schwethelm, if I could just add, um, in regard to the Bennett Valley Golf Course, we will be doing comprehensive evaluations of all of the facilities, including the pedestrian pathways, the bridges, and other structures. Uh, it may not be as part of this uh, PSA, but, but it will be coming forward, and there'll be more discussion about that uh, in the upcoming year. Great. Thank you very much for that. Any other questions from Council? Council Member McDonald? It was on that same item, and just so I'm clear, under this particular item, we're just approving that we have somebody that's going to go out and evaluate the 46 bridges that are listed on there. Then at a later time, those bridges will be brought back to council. There's no budget for those bridges to be repaired right now, but it would be part of a work plan that could be brought back later for consideration. And then at that time, we would know what would be done with those bridges, whether they'd be expanded, moved into something else, or what the recommendations are from an engineer. Is that correct? Yes, it would be right. building a, a list of, of things that they could we could then bring to you in future projects. Thank you so much. And, and if I could just add, Council Member McDonald, that uh, this is uh, the that this is not an expansion evaluation. This is purely structural and stability for the bridges uh, in, in response to reports that we, we receive annually from Caltrans. So if there was a desire at that time, we would bring that back if there was a consideration to then expand one of those bridges to be used for something else, or wouldn't hey, that be? Hey, Expansion is not part of this. is not a capacity not issue. This is this is a maintenance issue, and that's what Miss okay. uh, um, Welsh is doing in hiring a consultant to come out that has expertise in dealing with the specific conditions uh, that Caltrans has identified in their preliminary evaluations. Great, thank you so much for the clarification. All right, let's go to public comment and see if anybody has remarks for the consent calendar today. Um, Mayor, I see no raised hands. We have no voicemail public comment and uh, no members of the public. All right, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move items 12.1 through 12.7 and wait further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion from the Vice Mayor and a second from Council Member Sawyer. Let's go ahead and call the vote. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with five ayes with Council Members Fleming and Rogers absent. All right. We've reached our public comment for non-agenda items portion of the agenda. If you have a comment that is on something within the city's subject 
uh, area, but is not on tonight's menu. Go ahead and hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. Mayor, I see no raised hands. We have no voicemail, public comment, and no members of the public present. Okay, let's keep moving and go to item 14.1. Item 14.1 is a report, Fourth Amendment to the Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement with Recology Sonoma Marin, doing business as Recology Santa Rosa, an omnibus, am omnibus amendment to waste delivery agreement with Republic Services of Sonoma County and Franchise Hauler Agreement between Republic Services of Sonoma County and Recology Sonoma Marin. I'd like to introduce Zero Waste Coordinator, Joey Henowitz. Um, good job, you got it. <laughs> Very good job. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were gonna butcher it there for a second. Good job, City Manager. Um, so my name is Joey Henowitz. I am the Zero Waste Coordinator for, for the City of Santa Rosa. Um, and I'm here for you before you tonight um, for a Fourth Amendment to our Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement, as well as an omnibus amendment to our uh, Waste Delivery Agreement and Franchise Hauler Agreement. Um, just kind of catch up to date, this, this is gonna be one of our final administrative tasks um, to incorporate uh, Senate Bill uh, SB 1383, which was organic waste reductions of the short-lived climate pollutants. So we can go ahead and move to the, to the next slide, please. Uh, so as we're all pretty familiar, especially here in Santa Rosa and Sonoma County, California is experiencing um, the effects of the climate crisis. Um, with extreme droughts, which we're currently in, we have devastating fire seasons. Uh, hotter summers with record-breaking temperatures, as evidenced today, and rising sea level that are eroding our coastlines. So we do know that uh, climate change is, is here, and we do need to take some action. Uh, scientists do tell us that uh, releasing greenhouse gases by human activities, um, like landfilling food and yard waste, do cause climate change. Uh, organic waste in landfills emits 20% uh, of California's methane, which is a super uh, pollutant. 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And really what the basis of SB 1383 is here to do is to try to get folks to not only throw their, their yard waste, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, um, but throwing that, that green waste, you know, any organic matter, your leftover food, your leftover food scraps, paper, cardboard, et cetera, into that green bin, uh, because currently that makes up nearly half of what Californians dump in landfills. Here in Santa Rosa, we're at just about 40% of what goes to our, our local landfill is considered organic or compostable material. Um, if we're able to divert that organic material from the landfill, we're actually able to reduce the methane emissions uh, because what happens is that material, organic material is gonna decompose at some point and it is going to emit some carbon dioxide. Um, but what happens when you put it in the landfill, each time at the landfill, they do a cover onto the landfill for various reasons and it basically traps in any air. So it anaerobically digests and it emits that methane, which is really what SB 1383 is designed to try to prevent. Next slide. So a little bit of background information. Many of you are pretty familiar with this. You've heard from me a few times, but for some of the new council members, in, in 2016, Governor Brown uh, set methane's emissions targets. Uh, through SB 1383 in an effort to reduce those short-lived climate pollutants I mentioned to you earlier, specifically methane. Uh, these statewide targets are, are enacted to, um, to reduce organic waste disposal 75% by 2025 and rescue for people to eat at least 20% of currently dispo disposed uh, surplus food by 2025. So these are some aggressive targets, but we do know that we are in the middle of that climate crisis, so we do need to act aggressively. Next slide. So when did SB 1383 become effective? It became effective at the beginning of this year, January 1st, 2022. Santa Rosa, along with all other California jurisdictions, is responsible for complying and implementing SB 1383 regulations. Um, Santa Rosa prefers to partner with Recology on certain implementation matters by uh, amending our Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement. Um, we also are going to be partnering with our, our local uh, JPA Zero Waste Sonoma and um, we do need to have a fourth amendment to the Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement with Recology um, to memorialize this partnership. Next slide. So what are we asking to adjust to or amend into the fourth amendment to the franchise agreement? 
So we are asking Recology to take on some of the responsibilities for the implementation of SB 1383. They do have the boots on the ground presence. They are, uh, they do have expertise in these matters. And so we will be asking them to increase citywide collection routes to provide mandatory organic collection service across all customer segments. No longer are we asking you to, you know, please have organic service. Um, it, it is a state law. It is, it is contained within our, our city code. We codified that uh, late last year in the fall. Uh, we are asking for Recology, since they do have that boots on the ground presence and the expertise already in the field, is to perform route review inspections for prohibited container contaminants for each Santa Rosa hauler route annually. So what this means is that we have, I have asked um, Recology to dedicate one of their zero waste specialists to a full-time waste diversion auditor. And um, his full-time job is to basically go and flip lids and to check what's going on in, in those cans. And so for businesses as well as single family homes, um, you, you will be having random inspections occurring to make sure that you are properly diverting the materials in each of the bins and that you are uh, diverting those compostable materials into the, to that green organic spin. Um, additionally, they're going to continue to provide their education um, and specifically education pursuant to SB 1383's requirements. And for any account that might have be found to have container contamination, they will be providing um, additional follow-up to those specific accounts, letting them know how to properly divert what they need to be doing and what kind of issues were found to be presented in that inspection. Next slide. Um, additionally, Recology will be performing commercial and multifamily account compliance reviews on an annual basis to determine that they have adequate organic subscription levels um, to make sure that they are right sizing with those accounts, that they have the proper can sizes to be able to accommodate for um, each, of the, uh, each of the three size bins, which is the garbage, recycling, and organics. Um, they are going to continue to provide that education and outreach, as I mentioned to you before. And um, they will be providing the city with our required reporting figures that we do need to report to Cal Recycle on an annual basis. Um, and our first report is going to be due in on October 1st of this year. Next slide. So um, not a surprise, but what, what SB 1383 effectively is, is it's an unfunded mandate from the California State Legislature. And, but with the, within this unfunded mandate, um, it does authorize local jurisdictions to be able to charge fees to fund uh, implementation of SB 1383. Cal Recycle's direction has effectively been uh, to jurisdictions, you guys are responsible for funding SB 1383 implementation, you need to figure it out. So whether it's through increasing franchise fees, whether it's through increasing solid waste collection rates or some other form, uh, fund mechanism, that jurisdictions are responsible for this. Uh, I will note that Cal Recycle through the last budget cycle did appropriate 60 million um, through a grant program for SB 1383 implementation for local jurisdictions. We did just recently receive notice from Cal Recycle on our funding request. So Santa Rosa will be receiving just under $200,000 as a one-time funding request for SB 1383 implementation. Uh, specific plans are yet to be developed on how those funds will be distributed, but uh, we will be focusing mostly exclusively on um, outreach and education and some targeted technical outreach out in the community to get out there and get some boots on the ground and some people talking face-to-face uh, -face with um, definitely our largest generators in Santa Rosa. Um, and we'll, I'll just mention real quick as well, um, the California League of Cities, through some of the solid waste roundtables that I've been a part of on some of the um, phone calls and uh, virtual calls, is going is actually pushing the uh, legislature this funding cycle this budget cycle to appropriate 180 million and recently i was able to get through our um through the, the mayor to sign a uh, petition request to, uh, for that so the city of santa rosa is um, supporting that fund request we definitely could use the funds here we still do not have a local compost facility in sonoma county so those funds can definitely be used um, and they could be used uh, very very fruitfully there um, so Santa Rosa will be funding SB 1383 through increases to our franchise taller rates, which is going to be through the monthly bills, uh, the quarterly bills through Ecology, and as well as through the other partnership that we have with Zero Waste Sonoma to, to do some of their functions, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. They'll be um, minimally increasing their agency surcharge, which is um, a, a surcharge, which is charged at the tipping fee through each, uh, you know, uh, through each uh, every uh, single pound of waste that goes through the Sonoma County Waste Management System, or ton, I should say, not pound. Next next slide, please. So with this is going to obviously come with some price increases. 
Um, I did mention that uh, Santa Rosa, we have signed a memorandum of understanding with Zero Waste Sonoma. Zero Waste Sonoma will be handling a significant amount of SB 1383 for not just Santa Rosa, but for all the Sonoma County jurisdictions. Um, just to give you an idea of what they will, the services that they will be providing, they will be providing the overall education and outreach. Uh, they will be doing the organic waste procurement, which at this point we're gonna be doing a direct service provider, provider model. Uh, they will be doing the majority of the reporting and record keeping. Uh, they will be providing the organic waste processing and diversion capacity planning. Uh, they will be the initial follow-up on complaints and um, potential violations. They will be inspecting the commercial edible food recovery uh, components and the generators that are required within SB 1383. They also will be running the edible food recovery program and they will be providing the initial review of uh, waiver applications. So. Uh, through the MOU with initial price increases for Zero Waste Sonoma, do forecast uh, about a 2 to 3% price increase to the Santa Rosa uh, solid waste rates for those services that they will be providing on behalf of the city of Santa Rosa. Next slide. So what you see in front of you right now on this slide is the projected price increases from Recology. Uh, Recology does... Um, anticipate about a 2% price increase. Now this is over and above any other adjustment applicable under the Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement, but this just kind of gives you an idea exactly what, what Recology has forecasted. Um, so they will need two new drivers for, for the additional routes that Santa Rosa will have. Uh, we have contamination mailers, contamination tags, uh, the compost fees, um, as well as the additional um, capital resources that'll be needed, which includes you know two yard compost bins, collection trucks, um, front loader trucks, side loader trucks. So you do see there that you do have about a 2% increase um, over and above just specifically for SB 1383 um, coming from Recology for, for their um, participation and partnership within SB 1383 implementation for Santa Rosa. Next slide. Okay, so now to get to the kind of second part of the presentation is this, this omnibus amendment. Uh, with the waste delivery agreement and franchise haul agreement to, to try to simple it down. These, these agreements can get pretty confusing and there's a lot with, uh, between them, but um, the omnibus amendment is between the city of Santa Rosa, Republic Services, who is the landfill operator, the central landfill operator, and Recology Snow Marin, who obviously is our, our solid waste hauler. Uh, the master operations agreement, commonly referred to as the MOA, is what you would consider the kind of mother master agreement that is the master agreement that was um, signed between the jurisdictions in Sonoma County and the County of Sonoma um, for uh, Republic Services to operate the landfill and also for the jurisdictions to agree to send our committed waste, our franchise waste, to the Republic facilities for at least a term of 25 years. Um, the waste delivery agreement is essentially that, is a, a subcontract of the master operations agreement which basically says that we commit in Santa Rosa to send our waste to Republic Services facilities for the next 25 years. Republic Services operates the landfill. They take on the liability for the landfill operations and, and for them to be able to uh, get a return on their investment, they need to at least have that waste sent to them for 25 years. That's the MOA and the waste delivery agreement. Uh, the franchise hauler agreement is going to be between uh, the city of Santa Rosa, Republic Services and Recology. And the franchise hauler agreement essentially um, designates that Recology as our franchise caller will send the committed waste, which is the franchise waste that, that Santa Rosa has here within our jurisdiction to Republic Services. Next slide. So currently um, under the programs required by the Master Operations Agreement and the Franchise Hall Agreement, they do not require Recology to perform all the duties required by SB 1383. Uh, currently within the, the uh, WDA and, and Franchise Hall Agreement, the MOA there, there is a specific section that does designate Republic Services to provide for a commercial food waste program um, within the urban areas, typically right along the 101 corridor for um, specifically for businesses that have commercial food waste. Um, that's going to be a clean waste. It's generally coming from restaurants, food providers, food, food companies. And uh, that actually goes down to a facility down in uh, Richmond where it goes into an anaerobic digester. Um, what we are asking with this amendment, uh, because 
SB 1383 has essentially expanded the scope of, of what was currently provided with under that agreement. Um, we're asking to retire that um, portion um, within the WDA and FHA to retire that from the commercial food waste program, uh, eliminate the four the four dollar and twenty two cent uh, gate rate fee that used to fund that program, and we're asking to use that transfer that over exclusively to each jurisdiction under their franchise agreement. Um, Santa Rosa would do this as well as all the other jurisdictions within Sonoma County. Uh, next slide. So I'll just go ahead and skip down to that second bullet point there. So with that transfer, there's gonna be no additional impact placed on solid waste rates. Essentially, we're taking it from uh, what used to be uh, the WDA waste delivery agreement and we're moving it over into now the solid waste collection services agreement, which is gonna be exclusively managed by Santa Rosa. So that does allow us to manage our SB 1383 responsibilities directly with the haulers. Um, this solution was, was brought to fruition through a combination of the County of Sonoma, Republic Services, Ecology, and all the jurisdictions getting together and meeting together to figure out what would be the most uh, efficient way to manage this kind of SB 1383 issue along with the commercial food waste program that we previously had. And this solution avoids working through a patchwork of those existing agreements um, that would need to be supplemented by yet created agreements and allows each jurisdiction to manage their SB 1383 responsibilities uh, exclusively through their franchise agreement. So it's, it's a lot easier to manage and a lot more effective to manage there. Next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, I know with, with some of the questions that are gonna come is what's gonna be the impact for, for this uh, omnibus amendment. So ultimately, Actually, I'm, I apologize. Can we go back one slide? I think I skipped one. So uh, lastly, on this omnibus amendment, there are, there are some additional amendments that are being proposed to the, the franchise hauler agreement. Um, this is to allow Recology to provide commingled food waste routing. Um, now, this was brought forth by Recology. Um, and and where, where this kind of boils down to is, is there's, there's two kind of trucks that Recology provides. There's, there's the side loader which loads from the side, which is typically gonna uh, service your single family homes, um, which is gonna be you know anywhere from a 20 gallon container to a 96 gallon container that you see in a single family dwelling unit. And then you have your front loader, which is gonna typically service anywhere from a two yard bin to a four yard bin. And those are generally gonna be commercial accounts. Um, there are a number of accounts, especially as we implement SB 1383, where they do have some organic service requirements but it's not up to the level of needing a front loader to front load it from the front. So there are some commercial accounts that do have a 96 gallon or a 64 gallon green compost bin. And in order to service these accounts, Recology is asking if we can uh, amend the franchise hauler agreement to allow those trucks when they're in those areas. So if they're in a residential area, it's near, it's nearby a business to allow them to go ahead and pick up the, that commercial food waste. Uh, the reason why we do need to bring this forward is commercial food waste is a committed waste under the MOA. It is a committed waste that does need to go to a Republic facility. And so the agreement that we've come up with is that we will allow Recology to be allowed to collect up to 15% of the total tonnage countywide of commercial food waste um, in residential organic service routes. Now this is being done for efficiency. This is being done for cost savings. And I'll get into a little bit more of that in the next slide. Um, but Recology will be compensating Republic Services for the difference in tipping fees for the specific amount of uh, commingled organic waste generated on a, on a quarterly basis. Next slide. So as I mentioned, this is being done for efficiency purposes. This is gonna uh, provide a bottom line cost savings. Um, ultimately, the, the two options that we have is to allow uh, Recology uh, to collect these commercial food waste um, in their, in their commingled accounts. Um, or we would have to basically have separate and, uh, separate and fully functional, uh, commercial food waste routes set up that are not currently, that are not currently set up in the current system. Uh, what we are anticipating at this point from, from early, uh, from early figures is to do the commingled food waste routes. We're looking at probably under about $20,000 a year. That's going to be paid to Republic. If Recology was to operate at least one or probably two uh, dedicated food waste routes, you're looking at probably upwards up to $100,000 um, for at least one specific food waste route when you count in 
the staff time, the, the need to purchase a brand new truck, um, and everything involved with that. And so there is going to be significant cost savings to, for this approach. If and when the compensation that's payable to Republic Services under this agreement were to exceed the cost of a, a dedicated commercial food waste route, uh, the city and recology could opt out to create such routes. So we do have flexibility to adjust there if we do realize that the cost savings aren't, um, you know, aren't benefiting the community, aren't benefiting our rate payers. Next slide. So approval of this action does not have a fiscal impact on the general fund, um, but I will just reiterate again that SB 1383 is going to come with increased costs. And we do anticipate SB 1383 specific implementation costs between our two partners, which are Republic and Zero Waste Sonoma, to be approximately 5%. Uh, I will say that through my discussions with the California League of Cities calls and listening to other jurisdictions, is we're, we're pretty far ahead of the game in, in regards to you know, California as a whole. And there are many other jurisdictions that have much higher um, uh, implementation costs, upwards up to 15, 20, 25%. Um, I think that Recology has, has done a good job of getting us to this point, um, especially when you consider jurisdictions that, that some of them don't even have green waste cans right now and they need to fully implement that. And so um, when you consider this 5% increase, I think it's at the lower end of the scale when you look at some of the other jurisdictions in California. Next slide. So with that, um, it is recommended by the Transportation and Public Works Department that the Council, by two resolutions, one, approve the Fourth Amendment to the Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement between the City of Santa Rosa and Recology Sonoma Marin, uh, DDA Recology Santa Rosa, adding requirements or adding Recology's requirements assisting the City comply with SB 1383 regulations, and two, approve the Omnibus Amendment to the Waste Delivery Agreement with the Public Services of Sonoma County and Franchise Hauler Agreement between the Public Services of Sonoma County and Recology Marin, Sonoma Marin, transferring fees for the Commercial Food Waste Dry Mixed Waste Program to the Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement in a revenue, revenue neutral manner. And I will open it up to you, Mayor, for any questions from yourself or from that members of the City Council. Great, thank you so much, Joey. <clears throat> and I wanna emphasize what you said earlier uh, when you talked about how many phone calls that you're on to the League of Cities, and uh, we see that, and we know that you are one of the experts, and so I want to thank you for your time and attention on this issue. Council, do we have any questions for the team? Not seeing any questions. Let's go to public comment on the item. Um, Mayor, I see no raised hands. There's no voicemail public comment and no members of the public in the chamber. Okay. Councilmember Sawyer, would you like to put a motion on the table? I will, thank you, Mayor. And before I make the motion, I'd just like to mention, um, I don't know how the other cities in this county are dealing with 1383, those cities that do not have a, a Joey Henowitz. Um, his expertise is, um, I think, precedes him. I mean, he, there's no one that knows more about 1383 than this gentleman, and we are very lucky to have him sitting where he is sitting. This is a game-changing um, legislation. Don't tell them, John. It's, don't tell them that. <laughs> yeah, we do lose people that way, don't we? Um, no, he's not going anywhere. Um, it's ever-evolving and very complicated legislation that, that uh, Mr. Hanowitz uh, is very, very familiar with and incredibly um, knowledgeable about. So we're very lucky to have him. Um, and I will introduce a resolution to, I have two resolutions actually. Uh, a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the Fourth Amendment to the Solid Waste Collection Services Agreement between the City of Santa Rosa and Recology Sonoma Marin, DBA Recology Santa Rosa and way further reading. I'll second not only the motion, but the comments about Joey. <laughs> <laughs> Council members, any discussion on the uh, motion? All right, Madam City Clerk, if you could call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member McDonald? Aye. Vice Mayor Alvarez? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. That motion passes with five ayes with Council Members Fleming and Rogers absent. 
Thank you. And secondly, I will introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the omnibus uh, amendment to waste delivery agreement with Republic Services of Sonoma County and franchise taller agreement between Recology Sonoma Marin and Republic Services of Sonoma County and wait for the reading. Second. Let's call the vote. Council Member Schwedham. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member McDonald. Aye. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Alvarez. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. That motion passes with five ayes with Council Members Fleming and Rogers absent. All right, thank you so much, Joey. Thank you, Council Members. Let's move on to item 14.2. Item 14.2 is Council Direction to Santa Rosa. Let me start over. Item 14.2 is Council Direction to Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency Board Member regarding adoption of groundwater sustainability user fees. I would like to introduce Deputy Director Martin. Thank you. Great. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers and members of the Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to round out your agenda today uh, with the timely update on groundwater sustainability agency fees. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Just uh, wanted to orient you on what I plan to present on today. Uh, I will give a groundwater sustainability agency overview and talk a little bit about what the groundwater sustainability agency is tasked with. I'll give an update on the history of the groundwater sustainability fee in this basin. I'll talk a little bit about the current rate and fee study that is being undertaken by the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the proposed revised fee that came out of that study and talk about the public input process. And ultimately, uh, we'll be seeking a recommendation from the council today. Next slide. I uh, just wanna orient you, uh, maybe a quick reorientation of what the GSA, uh, the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency is being asked to do as a result of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, also known as SIGMA. Uh, SIGMA ultimately tasks local agencies and authorities with managing their groundwater uh, resources in a sustainable manner on a 20 to 50 year planning horizon. Um, First, it must be required that all uh, these local agencies form what are called groundwater sustainability agencies in all high and medium priority designated groundwater basins throughout the state. Uh, back in 2017, Santa Rosa Water and other agencies in the region with jurisdictional boundaries and authorities formed a joint powers authority to act as the groundwater sustainability agency for the Santa Rosa Plain groundwater subbasin. This is now known as the Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Uh, the legislation also required what are called groundwater sustainability plans or GSPs uh, and required that they be created in a transparent public process and also impose timelines on the adoption of these plans. Uh, basins that were critically overdrafted had a deadline of January 2020 and the remaining high and medium priority basins uh, we're set to be uh, have plans in place by January of 2022. The Santa Rosa Plain Groundwater Subbasin is a medium priority subbasin. Uh, and then finally, uh, I've underlined this particular point, but um, groundwater sustainability plans were not only required to be uh, generated and adopted, uh, but they included. Uh, the requirement for measurable objectives and milestones in five-year implementation increments uh, for which uh, the, the basins must achieve with a term sustainability within 20 years of adopting a groundwater sustainability plan. Uh, the reason why I've highlighted this here today is uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that implementation time frame and the fees to uh, support that. Next slide. And just a reminder, uh, as far as the makeup of the Joint Powers Authority, it's comprised of representative cities and towns within the basin, uh, the County of Sonoma, Sonoma Water, uh, two resource conservation districts, and a representative from several independently owned water systems that also utilize groundwater in the basin. Uh, the 
Groundwater Sustainability Agency also has an advisory committee uh, that's comprised of representatives from those same members of that Joint Powers Authority Board. But it also additionally has community members with diverse perspectives on beneficial groundwater use. And that includes representatives from agriculture, the environmental community, the business community, rural and residential well users, and public water districts. Um, so the GSA itself also has several staff and technical consultants that administer various activities of the GSA, uh, including creating the Groundwater Sustainability Agency plan itself over the last few years and carrying out the directives of the board and various public processes. Your representatives for the city of Santa Rosa on the board of directors are Councilmember Tom Schwedhelm, who also happens to serve as the chair of board of directors and Councilmember John Sawyer as the alternate. Next slide. The boundary of this groundwater basin is determined by the State of California Department of Water Resources and is published in the document known as Bulletin 118. You can see with that black line around, that is the boundary of the Santa Rosa Plain groundwater subbasin. Uh, within this boundary, there are an estimated 7,000 wells. Uh, and those include rural domestic, mutual water companies, agricultural and municipal wells. Uh, as you can see from that pie chart, in the bottom uh, right, overall about 50% of demand by sector in this basin is attributed to rural domestic wells with the remainder being split amongst agricultural and municipal users. Next slide. So uh, just wanted to highlight uh, the existing groundwater sustainability fee that was enacted in 2019 over the past three years, the GSA has been funded by an existing fee that was adopted by ordinance of the Board of Directors in 2019. That fee is a per acre foot assessment of water use, uh, groundwater use on an annual basis. Uh, that fee amount was consistent with funding what was necessary to complete the groundwater sustainability plan that was due in uh, July of, or excuse me, January of 2022, uh, per the requirements of Sigma. The fee as structured is to be assessed on all groundwater users in the basin. This means all registered well owners. Um, and that, that fee has been $19.90 per acre foot of groundwater pumped annually. Uh, as you can imagine, most wells in the county don't have metered use. Uh, therefore, rural homeowners were assessed a flat fee of $9.95 per year, equivalent to a half acre foot of water per year. This was based on a fee study done a while ago, uh, back a few years ago, that determined average use of rural, what, uh, rural domestic well owners. Uh, it should be noted that ultimately the County of Sonoma and Sonoma Water agreed to cover the costs for private wells from 2019 through uh, the remainder of this fiscal year, uh, June 30th, 2022. Uh, municipal well owners like City of Santa Rosa did pay the fee during this time frame. Next slide. I uh, just want to take a moment uh, to talk about the adoption of that plan. Uh, the fees over the past few years did support the development of a groundwater sustainability plan, uh, which took several years to complete. Uh, if you'll recall, the council was provided with a staff presentation on that final plan and passed a motion supporting the adoption of that plan at their November 30th meeting last year. Uh, that final GSP was unanimously adopted by the Santa Rosa Plain Board of Directors at their December 9th uh, meeting of last year. You know, after that, the plan was submitted to the California Department of Water Resources uh, on January 26th of 2022. Uh, now that agency is on the clock. Uh, it has two years to review and assess that plan for compliance with the directives in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, this is a significant milestone for the GSA, however, uh, there remains significant work to be done uh, now to implement that plan. By law, the GSA must start implementing the plan immediately after adoption, even before that final approval of the plan in two years. Next slide. So at the beginning of this year, the three basins within Sonoma County uh, sought professional services to complete a rate and fee study to determine what will be necessary to support that implementation of the plans over the next five years. Uh, the consultant selected to complete the studies was SCI Consulting Group with Larry Walker and Associates acting as a technical sub-consultant. Uh, 
I just want to clarify that, um, you know, while the Santa Rosa Plain GSA did pass an ordinance in 2019 uh, establishing that $19.98 per acre foot of water extracted, uh, that fee does remain in effect today unless the board does remove, act to remove that fee. Over the past few months, uh, the consultant has worked and developed a forecasted budget for five years. Uh, in addition to that, evaluated multiple fee options that could sustain that budget for the three basins within Sonoma County. Next slide. The fee and study and adoption schedule was laid out by the GSA board at the end of last year, uh, recognizing, of course, that much there's a, a lot of significant work would have to be done to complete this work uh, in a very transparent manner while giving plenty of opportunity for public and stakeholder input. Uh, beginning this early this year, several meetings have been held by the board of directors and the advisory committee to the, to the board as well. Uh, and they discussed and evaluated fee options with the consultant uh, for a proposed adoption at a public hearing in June. Uh, the goal was to have a fee study finalized and potentially a revised fee for adoption before August. That date is important because it is a firm deadline for attaching fees for inclusion in annual tax assessments. Next slide. Talk a little bit about some of the potential funding sources that were evaluated by the consultant. Um, there were a few funding sources that were evaluated, uh, those being, of course, the member agencies of the GSA, uh, outside grant funding. Uh, to date, this basin has obtained more than $2 million in grant funding to support the development of the plan. Uh, the groundwater users and beneficiaries of the basin, uh, there's private well owners, public water systems and public well owners and other water users as well that are included in these groundwater users and uh, beneficiaries. Uh, any combination of these potential funding sources was also evaluated as part of the study. They weren't taken uh, individually necessarily. Next slide. Through this effort, a projected average annual budget of more than $1 million was projected to meet the needs of the groundwater sustainability agency over the next five years. Uh, the budget includes considerations for meeting the administrative, technical, and legal and outreach needs for the GSA uh, to ultimately implement the groundwater sustainability plan that was adopted last year. Uh, the projects and technical needs of the GSA that were outlined in the adopted plan were contemplated when developing this budget, of course. Next slide. Um, April was an interest, uh, an important uh, milestone for the board of directors. Uh, the board of directors gave uh, very explicit direction to the rate and fee consultant to do the following. Uh, they asked them to retain the existing rate structure, uh, that being a groundwater fee assessed per acre foot of groundwater used in the basin. Um, and then they also instructed them to revisit that fee amount and make sure it achieved the level necessary to support the work of the groundwater sustainability sustainability agency over the next phase of their work. Uh, the board did not support the following fee options, that being wellhead fees uh, assessed on each wellhead, parcel taxes, and benefit assessments. Um, ultimately, those uh, did not went out for a variety of reasons for implementation uh, challenges um, and also timeliness of being able to get a fee structure in place. Uh, and also some of these did not likely have a good chance of success, including the appetite for parcel taxes at this point. The board also instructed its consultant to assume a 25% of the five-year budget could be met with grants ultimately. Um, there is today a significant amount of funding that's available from Proposition 68 for the explicit purpose of implementation of groundwater sustainability plans. Uh, those can be obtained through by way of grants from the State uh, Department of Water Resources. Uh, the chance of obtaining funding is very good, but the board did conservatively estimate 25% of necessary revenues could be met uh, with these potential grant opportunities. They also constructed instructed the consultant to complete their analysis in time for it to be implemented by June of 2022 uh, so that it could be placed on next year's tax rolls. Next slide. So uh, the initial fee draft fee under consideration 
at this time is $38.28 per acre foot of groundwater pumped annually. Um, this fee is still very much an initial draft, but I have been told very clearly it will not exceed uh, $40 per acre foot. Um, in your staff report tonight, uh, at the time, all that was available uh, was a range of fees. Uh, this is uh, obviously being uh, winnowed down and is nearly final and complete based upon their final fee study that's expected to be delivered very soon. Uh, this is equivalent to $19 to $20 a year for rural homeowners. Um, and the math is uh, fairly simple. Um, it is uh, taking out uh, that 25% uh, uh, um, estimate for grant funding from the total annual uh, budget and dividing it by the amount of acre feet that will be extracted from the basin. Um, and that is how they ultimately came up with the $38.28 per acre foot uh, proposed fee. Um, it should be noted and in your staff report for the Petaluma Valley and Sonoma Valley GSAs, the fees have been proposed to be anywhere from $230 to $400 per acre foot and $95 and $160 range per acre foot in the Sonoma Valley uh, Basin. Uh, the real reason is ultimately uh, due to the population and number of wells in the basin. Um, so that denominator, um, you know, it, 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 it really makes a difference in terms of, of how this is divided up. Uh, next slide. And then, uh, you know, in terms of the historical fee contributions over the past few years, as I mentioned, Santa Rosa Water has paid those fees. They are equivalent to about $31,800 per year. Um, based upon the proposed draft fee being considered, uh, that would increase to $61,000 and $61,300 uh, per year. Um, this fee has been forecasted in the fiscal year, upcoming fiscal year budget. Uh, so it could be accounted for uh, by Santa Rosa Water uh, in this upcoming fiscal year. Next slide. And uh, finally, I just wanted to round out with uh, identifying uh, the community outreach that has occurred over the past few months regarding this fee. Uh, the Santa Rosa Plain GSA board has hosted four community meetings. Uh, they were publicly noticed and advertised to discuss the rate and fee study approach and the proposed revised fee. Uh, two of those meetings were held virtually by Zoom in March, and then two were in person uh, in the town of Windsor and the city of Santa Rosa at the Veterans Hall. Uh, the four meetings did collectively log close to 300 questions and comments from the public. Those are available on the uh, Santa Rosa Plain uh, Groundwater Subbasin uh, webpage, which is uh, santarosaplaingroundwater.org. Um, in addition, several public uh, board of directors and advisory committees meetings were also held uh, over the past few months by that schedule laid out in an earlier slide uh, where the development of the fee were discussed. And then finally, uh, the city of Santa Rosa, uh, so Santa Rosa's board of public utilities did receive a report item at their meeting last week and passed a motion of support for the draft proposed fee. Uh, next slide. So finally, um, the recommendation uh, we're asking for tonight is uh, that it, the, it's recommended by the Board of Public Utilities and Santa Rosa Water that council by motion recommend that the city's Santa Rosa's uh, Plains Groundwater Sustainable Agency Board of Directors representative, uh, Councilmember Tom Schwedhelm, support adoption of the revised groundwater sustainability user fee at the upcoming June 9th, 2022 public hearing. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I'll start with Council Member Schwedhelm to see if he has anything to add, and then I'll go to comments from Council Members. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have nothing to add. Peter did a very thorough job recreating the history since 2017 of our GSA. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for your service on that board. Uh, we really appreciate having such a strong voice in the room. I know it's been a challenge getting this up and running, but I think you see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, council members, do we have any questions? Council member McDonald. 
I just have one question for clarification. This is basically doubling the cost of what we've been charging for, for how long, and then how long will this fee be put in place? Do you have that information? Yes, um, thank you, Councilmember McDonald. Um, to, to answer your question, um, this proposal is for a five-year uh, fee structure. Um, over the past few years, uh, the work has been mainly focused on developing the groundwater sustainability plan, which was adopted last year. Uh, that effort was heavily funded by uh, uh, two things, uh, user fees, um, and then also Sonoma County also paid for all the private users over that time frame as well. And then uh, uh, quite a bit of, of money coming from grants. So. Um, you know, it is it is proposing uh, doubling, um, and that that budget has been uh, evaluated by this board uh, to make sure that it was consistent with the level of activity necessary to implement what it's been called for in the plan over the next five years. Um, and so, yeah, yes, it does represent uh, a, a doubling of that fee, uh, but it it uh, also takes some conservative approaches to the potential for additional grant funds coming in in the future. Any additional questions, council member? Okay, any other questions? Council member? Sorry about that. So can you tell me the impact on ag um, properties versus the impact on residential properties when it comes to fee assessments? Yes, um, so for the residential properties, uh, based upon a groundwater model uh, of extraction and a fee study that was done previously, which was also revisited recently, um, a amount of a half acre foot has been assessed on all rural residential well users. Uh, those are folks that have their own wells and rural properties. Uh, for the others, uh, agricultural users, uh, they use crop types and aerial photos to determine uh, application rates, and those will be assessed on individual users. I should mention during this time, they did a substantial effort um, using a GIS uh, related tool to allow all registered well owner users to uh, provide more information regarding their use of water, including whether or not they have alternative supplies uh, or other things as well. And that was done in a public process over the last few years. It's called the GUIDE program. Uh, don't ask me to remember what that acronym means. Um, I, I, I've forgotten. Um, but, it, but it was a, uh, a program where there was a lot of noticing that went out to individual well owners, you know, well owners uh, to provide more information on their use as well. So that was how that was determined. Um, and so those folks will be charged a per acre foot charge based upon uh, those aerial assessments and crop types. Thank you. I was just doing some quick calculations, so I just wanted to see about how much we might be talking about for property owners to use their own water. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I, I guess I should mention um, the alternative uh, for those that, that haven't been uh, familiar with this for several years uh, is to have the state come in and intervene um, uh, the idea of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and why it was so novel at the time was that it gave agencies local control over their water resources and management. Those fees would be substantially higher if the state were to come in and intervene on behalf of all of the groundwater users in the basin. Uh, so this approach is much better. Um, and I should mention that if the state were to inter intervene uh, they would not execute any projects. Uh, they would only um, really work as a curtailment opportunity, and they would start to monitor well water use and see uh, if there was progress or, or declines in the basin, and then eventually uh, would start having groundwater users curtail if things were not progressing uh, appropriately. So um, the opportunity here to have a local agency controlling our groundwater resources it is a great opportunity. Thank you, that's very helpful. All right, Council, let's go to public comment on this item. If you're interested, hit the raise hand feature on your Zoom. 
Mayor, I see no raised hands. We have no voicemail public comment and no members of the public present in the chamber. All right, I'll bring it back to council members. Uh, to save us the awkward moment of having council member Sweathelm make a motion about how to direct council member Sweathelm to vote, uh, I will make a motion uh, asking our designee to support the proposal when it comes before the GSA. I will second that. All right, so a motion from myself and a second from the vice mayor. Is there any additional discussion from council members? All right, please call the vote. Council member Schwedhelm. Aye. Council member Sawyer. Aye. Council member McDonald. Aye. Vice mayor Alvarez. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. That motion passes with five ayes with council members Fleming and Rogers absent. All right. Thank you to staff. Thank you, Peter. We appreciate the presentation. Uh, and Council Member Schwedhelm, I know that you will be updating us on how that vote turns out. Keep moving through our agenda. We have item 16.1. It's a written communication uh, regarding AB 2247 and the support letter. Let's go ahead and go to public comment and see if there's any public comment on that written communication. Mayor, I see no raised hands. We have no voicemail public comment and no members of the public in the chamber. All right. We'll also then go to our public comment for non-agenda items. It's our last comment period of the night. Let's see if anybody is interested in providing public comment. Mayor, I see no raised hands. We have no voicemail public comment and no members of the public in the chamber. All right, uh, Madam City Manager, anything additional? Or are we ready to adjourn? We're ready to go. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time today, and we will adjourn.